Zaffer presents Cold Red, written by Chris Ryan and read by Elliot Fitzpatrick. Chapter 1 Balanivka, Kharkiv Oblast, Ukraine, Autumn 2022 Ruslan Masutov sat in the gloom of the underground shelter, a pair of bulky headphones clamped over his ears, watching the live feed on the laptop screen. Nearby, the other three guys on the team checked their weapons one more time. They had spent the past four days living in the cramped space below ground, eating cold rations and taking turns to monitor the radio channel, waiting for the signal. They were ready. Masutov was the commander. He was a big bear of a guy, with a thick beard and a nose that looked as if someone had taken a sledgehammer to it. A tattered bush hat stained with dirt and sweat crowned his slab-like head. The hat had once belonged to an Australian, a volunteer in the Ukrainian Foreign Legion. Masutov and his colleagues had captured the man during a raid on a village a few miles outside Kharkiv. They had dragged the prisoner into an abandoned shack, stripped him naked, and bound his hands and feet with rope. Then they had taken out their rage on him. For two sickening days... The Australian had held out against his torturers. Eventually, even Masutov found himself revolted by the injuries they had inflicted on the man. When another soldier had produced a pair of box cutters, Masutov had drawn his pistol and shot the Australian in the head. What he guessed they called a mercy killing. Later, they had burned the corpse in the yard. Masutov had orders to destroy any evidence of their crime, but he'd kept hold of the bush hat, like a souvenir. A reminder. He had worn it ever since. Like Masutov, the other soldiers in his team were ethnic Chechens. Sungayev and Arsanov had served under Masutov in Syria, and before that in Crimea. Both were dependable warriors, level-headed and calm under pressure. At 23, Islamov was the youngest of the four and the newest recruit to the Akhmat Battalion. He was pale-faced and slender with a scraggly joke of a beard and short, buzz-cut hair. All of them were dressed in standard-issue army fatigues, with Chechen flags stitched onto their shoulder patches. On their arms, they wore black and orange striped cloths, the colours of the St. George ribbon, worn by all loyal supporters of the cause. The ribbon symbolised Russian military prowess. Islamov, the youngster, sat apart from the rest of the team and stared vacantly at the wall his left leg hammering rapidly. The guy was shitting bricks, which was understandable, thought Masutov. In less than thirty minutes, if everything went to plan, they would all be dead. Five days ago, as the battle for Balanivka raged in the streets, Masutov and his comrades had been taken to one side by their commanding officer and told they had been chosen for a special mission, one that would earn them great glory among their brothers and lead to the eventual defeat of the fascist enemy. But it would also require them to make the ultimate sacrifice, their CO had added gravely. The men had readily agreed, partly because they were loyal soldiers, but also because they knew they had no choice. They had families back home. The CO had explained in painstaking detail the many terrible things that would happen to them if they refused to carry out their mission. It was a no-brainer. They were all agreed on that point better that they would die so that others might live. As an added incentive, the CO had promised that their loved ones would be looked after once they had completed their mission. Mother Russia always took care of her own. The following day, as the shattered remnants of the Russian forces began pulling back from the town, Masutov and the other guys had covertly taken up their positions in the shelter in a lightly wooded area 20 metres due east of the main square. The shelter itself was essentially a massive hole, four metres deep, excavated by a mechanical digger, buttressed on all sides with an inch-thick steel frame in the shape of a T, and covered with a waterproof membrane. The whole area had then been backfilled to ground level with 18 inches of soil. A layer of fallen leaves on top obscured the patch of disturbed earth. The shelter had everything the Chechens needed to survive for several days. A camouflaged filter system ensured a steady supply of fresh air from above ground. Battery-operated LED lights were set up at points around the shelter, 
A coaxial cable ran from the hatch opening to an aerial in the upper branches of the nearest tree, providing an encrypted comms link with the surveillance team, while a concealed high-resolution camera gave them a live feed of the target location to the west. There was a shitter on the left arm of the T, and a storage area for rations, kit, and bottled water opposite. There was a row of stretcher beds on the longer side of the shelter, a makeshift table and seating area at the back, constructed from ration packs. Masutov and Sungayev were both packing AK-47 assault rifles. Islamov and Arsanov each had an AK-12, which was essentially an upgraded version of the Soviet-era AK-74 rifle, chambered for the same 545 by 39 mm round. Each man had also been issued with a belt of RGN hand grenades, basic hardware, capable of getting the job done, but fundamentally low-grade kit, nothing unnecessarily expensive, nothing their superiors would regret not being able to recover from the attack, which in itself hinted at the doomed nature of their mission. Four days ago, in the pale light of the pre-dawn, a few hours before the last Russians abandoned the town, Masutov and his men had been sealed inside their hideout. Then they had settled down to wait. In the West, they called them stay-behind shelters. NATO troops had built shitloads of them along the border with East Germany during the Cold War, anticipating the day when vast Russian tank columns would sweep across the Fulda Gap. The rationale behind such shelters was simple. While conventional forces were retreating, Special Forces units would crawl into the shelters and wait until the enemy had advanced beyond their position. Then they would carry out stay-behind operations, sabotaging factories, supply lines, and communication systems. Soviet troops had stumbled upon a few of these structures during their regular patrols along the East German border. Moscow had been so impressed with the idea that they had decided to copy it. Kremlin agents had consequently set up an improvised network of shelters across Germany, France, and elsewhere. One guy in Masutov's battalion once claimed he had helped to dig a hideout in a field in Lincolnshire. The Chechens were under strict orders to stick to a hard routine in the shelter, which meant pissing and shitting in plastic bags, eating only cold food, no smoking or raised voices, no phones nothing that would give them away to any clearance patrols that might be lurking in the area. They took turns stagging on, one man monitoring the video feed and the radio channel. After six hours, he stood down, and the next guy took over. Sungayev and Arsanov passed the time reading books, napping, and doing sets of press-ups and stomach crunches, anything to take their minds off the attack. Islamov sat in a corner of the shelter and kept to himself. The kid was scared. Masutov knew the signs. He'd seen it in the faces of other young warriors in the moments before a firefight. Fear of death, partly. But also fear of letting your brothers down. Masutov tried to think of some words of comfort. Something to boost the kid's morale. Nothing came to mind. He gave up and refocused on the laptop. For the past three days, they had watched their comrades' retreat unfolding on the screen. They had seen exhausted men scrambling back from their defensive positions, some badly wounded. Others had ditched their equipment in the desperate rush to escape. For a short while, the streets had been almost deserted. Then there had been a sudden flurry of activity, columns racing in from multiple directions, soldiers riding on top of armoured vehicles, cheering and waving blue and yellow flags. Ukrainians. The fascist infantry had followed close behind, sweeping through the buildings overlooking the square, searching for any hiding enemies. A few men had posed for selfies in front of a wrecked tank. Gradually, civilians emerged from ruined buildings to embrace their liberators or beg for food. Masutov had watched and felt the anger burning in his veins. He was a proud soldier. He had volunteered for the battalion because it paid well, and because killing was all he knew. But the war he found himself in had not been the one he had been hoping to fight. Equipment was faulty or missing. Supplies were constantly scarce. Leadership was non-existent. Masutov's unit had suffered some appalling reverses. The enemy had proved unexpectedly stubborn. Morale had plummeted. A few weeks ago, they had been given a new task, 
shooting conscripted Russian convicts who tried to flee the battlefield. Anyone who refused the order was shot themselves. The situation was a giant clusterfuck. Although he would never admit such a thing to his brothers, Masutov had begun to privately question the wisdom of those making the big decisions in Moscow. At times, he wondered whether they could even win. He figured it would need something extraordinary to change their fortunes. A high-stakes gamble. All or nothing. What the Americans called a Hail Mary pass. For the first seventy hours, he had been sceptical of their chances of success. It seemed like a long shot. How could they be certain that the target would even show up? At best, it had to be a calculated guess. And there was something else to consider. If the target failed to appear, the mission would have to be aborted. No choice. In which case, Masutov and his colleagues wouldn't have to die launching a suicidal attack, which was undeniably a good thing. But which also meant they would be on their own, miles from safe territory, in an area teeming with enemy troops. They would have a decision to make, surrender to the Ukrainian fascists, make a run for it, or remain in the shelter in the hope that their comrades would come to their rescue. Like any good soldier, Masutov had closed his mind to these questions. He kept his attention solely on the mission, watching and waiting. But after 72 hours, he was prepared to accept defeat. The target was nowhere to be seen. He wasn't going to turn up. Someone further up the food chain had fucked up. He resigned himself to aborting the op. And then, thirty minutes ago, everything had changed. Masutov had been on stag when he had seen the movement on the laptop screen. A small crowd gathering on the western side of the square, sixty metres from the shelter, men and women dressed in civvies. Young people, mostly, armed with an array of video cameras and tripods, boom mics and smartphones journalists. Masutov had counted at least thirty of them. They had been shepherded into position by a group of Ukrainian soldiers. Cameramen had checked angles and lighting. Sound guys had tested their mics. Assistants unspooled cables. Everybody was gearing up for the main event. The mission was on. As soon as Masutov had caught sight of the cameras, he'd felt a quickening in his chest. He had swiftly alerted his men. Get your shit together. We're on. This is really happening. Now they waited in tense silence. The last moments of their lives. Arsanov swigged from a plastic bottle of water. Sumgayev closed his eyes and muttered a prayer. Islamov tapped his foot nervously. Masutov craved a cigarette. A voice came over the radio. Have you got eyes on the camera crews? Yes, we're watching them now. Masutov said. Have they left yet? There was a long pause. Then the voice came back. Not yet. Any minute now. We'll let you know when the target is on the way. Just make sure you're ready. The voice clicked off. The channel went silent again. Masutov tried to ignore the tension he was feeling in his guts and checked his shitty watch. Ten o'clock in the morning. Almost time. This is a fucking bad idea, mate, Carl Hedges said. Sergeant Luke Carter looked round at his mucker. The two SAS men were sitting at a table in the corner of a large tented area seven miles due west of Balanivka. Nearby, a crowd of Ukrainian soldiers stood mingling and drinking brews, while others scoffed down plates of hot food served up by the slop jockeys at a makeshift canteen point. Beyond the tent, there was an ammunition dump a bunch of forty-five-gallon steel drums and a cluster of armoured vehicles parked on a wide patch of dirt close to the roadside. Further away, fields of sugar beet and potato crops stretched towards the horizon, pockmarked with clumps of trees and a few ramshackle hovels. Clouds the colour of wet cement smothered the sky, threatening rain. The Lager Point had served as a forward operating base for the Ukrainian troops during the recent struggle to retake Balanivka, a staging post to ferry manpower and weaponry to the front line. The battle had raged for weeks. Territory had been taken, then lost again, like something out of the Great War. Until three days ago, when there had been an unexpected breakthrough. 
The Russian soldiers had suddenly withdrawn from the town to a heavily defended point some twenty miles due east. Balanivka had been abandoned. It was in Ukrainian hands once more. The recapture of the president's birthplace had been a symbolic victory for his administration. Now he intended to crown the achievement with a speech to the world's media in front of the town hall, which was why Carter and Hedges found themselves in the wasteland of eastern Ukraine, 300 miles from Kiev. Luke Carter was the leader of the four-man regiment team attached to the presidential bodyguard. For the past few months, Carter and his three colleagues had been guiding the Ukrainians, advising them, and making sure there were no weak points in the president's security arrangements. All four lads were with the wing, the covert unit within 2-2 SAS that worked hand-in-glove with 5 and 6. Prospective recruits to the wing had to undergo positive vetting before they could be admitted to the regiment's inner sanctum. Every aspect of their lives was put under the microscope, every weakness assessed. Only those who had passed were trusted to safeguard the president. The SAS had been the obvious choice for the job. A rotation of lads from E-Squadron had spent the past eight years operating in Ukraine, covertly training up local forces to battle Russian irregulars in the east, while preparing for the day when Moscow might try to take another bite out of the country. They had the experience and the reputation, for few other SF units could match the regiment when it came to the art of bodyguarding. The Hereford pioneers had practically written the manual on close protection tactics back in the day. The president had resisted the suggestion at first. He felt it was bad PR to appear on national TV, imploring his countrymen to resist the invaders at all costs, while being guarded by a bunch of foreign soldiers. But his NATO allies were insistent. Too much was at stake, they had said. They had invested huge sums in supporting the fight against the Kremlin. Billions had been spent on arms and equipment. Training packages had been established. The intelligence services in Washington and London had launched propaganda campaigns to undermine the enemy. The loss of Ukraine's commander-in-chief would be a devastating blow to their efforts. Therefore, a compromise had been reached. The SAS would direct their Ukrainian counterparts, but they would remain discreetly out of shot when the cameras started rolling. The president's visit to Balanivka was a closely guarded secret. Outside of his inner circle, only a handful of people were aware of his intention to travel to the newly liberated town. Earlier that morning, the president, his most trusted advisers, his 16-strong Ukrainian bodyguard team, and his four SAS advisers had flown by helicopter from Kiev to the Lager Point. Meanwhile, an advance party of two SAS soldiers and a pair of Ukrainians had gone ahead to prepare the site. As soon as they gave the all-clear, Carter and the others would head straight for the town square. In an out job, thought Carter. Five minutes from start to finish. Dismount, meet some of the town's liberators, deliver the speech, then return to the FOB and get back on the chopper to Kiev. At least, that's the plan. Did you hear me, fella? Hedges went on in his melodic Welsh accent. I said... I know, Carter replied irritably. You don't like the mission. He sighed. I told you already, there's fuck all we can do about it. Hedges shook his head. It ain't right. We're taking a big risk. Fuck me, it's only been three days since them Russians were kicked out. It's nothing to do with us. We're here to do a job. That's it. I don't give a toss, Hedges replied sharply. Someone should have a word with the guy. If he gets plugged by some sniper today, we'll be the ones getting it in the neck from the head shed. Carter glanced at the other SAS man. Hedges was built like a bodybuilder, with arms like snooker balls stuffed into a pair of socks, and legs as wide as V2 rockets. A lot of the lads at Hereford had interests outside the business of soldiering. Some were into history. Others preferred rugby or getting pissed with the lads. But not Hedges. The bloke only cared about two things, door-kicking and fitness. At camp, he spent most of his free time in the gym, busting out sets of deadlifts and squats and guzzling protein shakes. But he also had a foul temper, the kind that could ignite at the slightest provocation, particularly on days when he couldn't train or control his diet, such as today.
Carter shrugged. He said, At least he's got some balls on him, coming out here to deliver a speech. Can you really see any of our lot in Westminster doing the same? Hedges snorted. It's unnecessary. We're indulging the bloke. This is a fucking ego trip. Luke Carter gritted his teeth and looked away. There was no point arguing with Hedges when he was in this sort of mood. He could try explaining that the President hadn't made the trip to massage his ego, that he was in fact here as an act of defiance, intended to boost the flagging morale of his troops, while at the same time getting under the skin of his nemesis in the Kremlin in an attempt to frustrate him, goad him into making mistakes. But it wouldn't make a difference, Carter knew. Hedges wasn't the type of blade who saw the bigger picture. He didn't give a shit about anything beyond his own narrow pursuits. Carter said, We'll be exposed for a few minutes, mate. No more. Hedges fumed through his nostrils. Let's hope the others have properly searched the area. Otherwise we're going to be shafted. Carter mentally rehearsed the plan they had drawn up before leaving Kiev. The advance party was tasked with clearing the site ahead of the President's visit. Buildings had to be searched for sniper teams, routes in and out of the square checked for obstacles and booby traps. The journalists had to be directed into place, their cameras and other equipment inspected to make sure nothing had been tampered with. Meanwhile, US signalers would monitor the airwaves for any signs of Russian transmissions or mobile activity. Once they were given the green light, Carter would notify the president and the commander of his BG team. Then the party would make the short drive to the centre of town, several kilometres due east of their location. They were taking no chances. The president was going to be dangerously exposed while he was in Balinivka. Hedges is right about that much. Screw this one up, and our heads will roll. A moment later, a voice squawked in Carter's earpiece. We're all set up here, Josh Bowman said. Bowman was in charge of the advance party clearing the square. A true East End lad, born and raised in Barking, Bowman was one of the older blades in 22SAS, one of a dying breed, a highly capable operator, and a regiment enigma. Everyone at Hereford had heard the story of how Albanian mobsters had murdered Bowman's wife and daughter during his time as an undercover police officer. Later, Bowman had joined the army before applying for selection. Then, for two years, he had disappeared from the camp without a word of explanation. There had been rumours that he'd transferred to the cell, the ultra-secretive unit within the SAS. We've got the shot ready, Bowman continued over the comms. It's a good vantage point. Church and town hall in the background, as your man requested. Flag has been raised above the building. We're on the left side of the statue as you approach from the west. One of the Ukrainians will meet you at the dismounting point. It's a 15-metre walk from there to the spot where the president will give his speech. Clear line of sight, so the cameras can swing round to catch a shot of him walking towards them. Fuck me. He sounds like James Cameron on set. Hedges muttered. He'll be giving an Oscar speech next. Carter tapped his pressel switch and spoke into his throat mic. Any dead spots in the vicinity? Negative. We've gone through the place with a fine tooth comb. It's clear. What about them local soldiers, mate? They're all here, Bowman said. Three men and three women from the force that liberated the town, plus their CO. They think they're here for a flag-raising ceremony, nothing more, he added. Roger that, Carter said. We'll let you know once we're en route. Better make it quick, fella, before Tyler scares off what's left of the local talent. Cockney bastard, another voice hissed over the comms. Tyler Dunk was the second SAS man on the advance party, a massive guy from the black country with pitted skin and a face that should come with a trigger warning. He was also the scruffiest bloke in the regiment, the kind of guy who could look shabby in a Savile Row suit. Tell the commander we're leaving now, Carter said to Hedges. Get his men organised. I'll inform the mark. Roger that. Carter rose to his feet and marched briskly across the tent to a tall, broad-shouldered guy dressed in a pair of beige khakis and an olive-green T-shirt, reading through a paper copy of a speech. Sir? Carter began. Artem Voloshin, the president of Ukraine, looked up at him. 
Yes? They're ready for you, sir. Now? We go now? The portly figure standing next to Voloshin asked. Andrei Kravets, the president's press officer, was a sweaty guy, dark-haired and unshaven, his round face framed by a pair of oversized glasses, his paunch bulged beneath his crinkled shirt. That's right, Carter said. He nodded at Voloshin. Me and Sergeant Hedges will ride with you both in the main vehicle, sir. And my bodyguards? Major Lysenko and Sergeant Tatarin will travel with us, said Carter. The rest will go in the support vehicles. Just remember, five minutes, no more. Yes, I know. Voloshin smiled again. You have one thing in common with my press officer, Sergeant. You both tire of the sound of my voice, I think. Carter grinned. He turned and led Voloshin and Kravets towards the other side of the tent, where the sixteen Ukrainian bodyguards were hastily assembling under Hedge's angry glare. Two men stood next to the thick-set Welshman. Major Lysenko, the commander of the presidential bodyguard team, was a serious-looking guy with arched eyebrows and heavily lidded eyes. At his side was Sergeant Tatarin, his 2IC, a lantern-jawed soldier with a neatly stubbled beard and a permanent frown. Carter approached and cocked his head at Lysenko. Are your lads ready, Major? he asked. Lysenko nodded. Yes, all good. We'll be travelling with the President in the Mastiff, Carter said. Once we arrive on site, we'll wait until the rest of the guys have debussed and taken up their respective positions around the square. The President doesn't leave that wagon until we've established a ring of steel around him. If there's any trouble, we'll call off the event and head back here on one of the designated routes. Is that clear? Lysenko shared a knowing glance with his 2IC. The two of them hated taking orders from a regiment man and made little attempt to hide it. A pride thing, maybe. They were the cream of the Ukrainian crop, Voloshin's most dedicated soldiers. They felt his presence sent a message about their inability to protect their chief. If I was in their boots, I'd probably feel the same way. But Carter didn't really care about hurting Lysenko's feelings. As far as he was concerned, they had a job to do. If that meant a few bruised egos, so be it. Sure, Lysenko replied coldly. We understand. Carter nodded. Get a fucking move on. Lysenko bellowed an order at his men. At once, the other fourteen lads snatched up their weaponry and kit, left the tent, and hurried towards the armoured vehicles. Carter and Hedges were wearing the same uniform as the Ukrainians. Army fatigues, plate armour, personal radio systems, and swept-back ballistic helmets. In addition, the two Hereford operators had olive-green face coverings over their noses and mouths. They were required to disguise themselves at all times while on ops in Ukraine, since the presence of SAS personnel was politically sensitive. If they were accidentally caught on camera and identified by Russian intelligence, it would trigger a diplomatic shitstorm. Both Carter and Hedges were also equipped with dual net comm systems, allowing them to rapidly switch channels and communicate back to Hereford on an encrypted line, without having to worry about anyone else on the team listening in. Which made sense on several levels. Although they were firm allies, there was a limit to how much int Whitehall was willing to share with the Ukrainians. They were going in with a serious amount of hardware, Carter and his colleagues were packing suppressed L-119A2 assault rifles manufactured by Colt Canada and based on the old DeMarco C-8, which was essentially a Canadian variant of the M4 carbine. Whereas the Ukrainians were equipped with the standard M4, the same weapon, more or less, minus the suppressor and a few other niche features. Each soldier also had four spare 30-round clips of 5.56 NATO brass in their front vest pouches, plus holstered Glock semi-automatic pistols as their secondary firearms, and a strip of brightly coloured blue tape around their left leg. The ribbons were a vital part of their uniform, identifying them as friendly forces. Some time ago, the Russians had begun impersonating Ukrainian troops by wearing matching strips of blue cloth around their right arms. In response, the Ukrainian high command had begun issuing new orders each day, 
stipulating where soldiers should display their ribbons. One day they might be told to strap them around their left arms, the next day they might be required to tie them on their right leg. It was a pain in the ass, but a necessary safeguard against Russian forces trying to pass themselves off as the good guys. And a powerful reminder, thought Carter. The enemy was cornered and desperate. Their early hopes of a stunning victory had evaporated. Now they found themselves on the back foot, suffering from a catastrophic drop in morale and increasing discontent back home. From now on, they would increasingly resort to dirty tactics in an attempt to claw back the initiative. We'll need eyes in the backs of our heads today. They started at a quick pace towards the row of vehicles parked along the dirt patch, a hundred meters away. A rough track ran from the wagons to the main road to the north. Carter and Hedges led the way, followed by Major Lysenko and his subordinate Sergeant Tatarin, marching either side of the President. The rest of the Ukrainians on the BG team followed close behind, the muddied ground squelching and sucking under the trample of their boots. Carter, Hedges, Kravitz, Lysenko and Tatarin made directly for a Mastiff patrol vehicle. A heavily armoured six-wheeler, equipped with a mounted Browning 50 cal and a 40 mm grenade launcher. Whitehall had supplied a number of them to Ukraine since the start of the war. The Mastiff was a big beast, offering maximum protection for the occupants if they blundered into any IEDs en route to the town. Carter vaulted into the back of the Mastiff and dropped into one of the fold-down seats fitted along the sides of the main cabin. Major Lysenko, Kravets and Voloshin planted themselves on the seats opposite, while Tatarin and Hedges made for the front cab, the Ukrainian sergeant taking the wheel and the Welshman depositing himself in the shotgun seat. Another Ukrainian filed past Carter and made for the hatch further forward, taking the gunner's spot, situated between the front and main cabs. From outside came the dull thud of doors slamming shut as the other thirteen Ukrainians piled into a pair of Bushmaster mobility vehicles. Seven guys would travel in the lead wagon, with the other six following at the rear of the convoy. If they ran into an ambush on the way, the front and rear vehicles would put down fire, giving the guys in the Mastiff a chance to escape. Lysenko wrenched the rear door shut and yelled out to Tatarin that they were sealed inside. Several voices flared up over the comms, talking in a stream of guttural Ukrainian. The guys in the Bushmasters, Carter presumed, confirming that they were also ready. Sergeant Tatarin gunned the ignition. The Mastiff lurched forward along the track, following one of the Bushmasters as it headed for the main road. Thirty seconds later, they were rolling towards Balanivka. Seven miles to the east, the voice came back over the radio. Target is on the move. They just left. Masutov sat up and felt the breath hitch in his throat. This is it, he thought. It's really happening. How many? he asked. Sixteen, the voice said. Three vehicles in total. Target is in the middle vehicle. He didn't know how they were able to monitor such a highly guarded figure. Didn't ask. Such things were above his pay grade. He assumed there was a drone eyes in the sky. One of the advanced new reconnaissance models the Kremlin had deployed in Ukraine, maybe. Sweeping several thousand meters above the ground, tracking the presidential convoy as it bowled towards its destination. The voice said, Remember the plan. Go in hard and fast. The first thirty seconds are everything. Yes, Masutov said. I remember. Don't fuck this one up. Think of your families. The voice clicked off again. The wagons rolled through the devastated outskirts of the town. Not that Carter could see any of it. There were no windows in the back of the Mastiff, just a confined space with a tangle of thick cables hanging from the sides and a set of metal toolboxes stored beneath the seats. Carter searched the President's face for any sign of anxiety or tension, but saw none. The guy looked almost supernaturally calm. Kravets sat to the right of his boss, beads of sweat studding his pale brow. Carter felt a stab of unease in his chest, the same feeling he'd had when he had first been told about the president's desire to travel to Balanivka. 
He tried to reassure himself that the chances of an attack this morning were minimal. Every inch of the main square and the surrounding area had been thoroughly swept by the advance party. Signals teams at the NSA and GCHQ had done their jobs and had come up empty. Not a whiff of Russian comms activity in the town. But the anxiety kept gnawing away at him. We're taking a big risk, Hedges had said. It's unnecessary. Carter wondered whether he should have tried harder to dissuade Voloshin. He could have suggested delaying the event by a few days, giving them a chance to send in a second clearance team, make sure they hadn't missed anything first time round. Never go in half-cocked. The unwritten credo of the regiment. Rushing into things without the proper planning was how mistakes got made. Men had died in the past because of planning failures. But Carter hadn't argued. Instead, he had simply nodded along and agreed to the job. Figured it wasn't his place to kick up a fuss. He was a soldier, after all, not a political strategist. My brother wouldn't have steered quiet, he told himself. Luke had always looked up to his older brother, respected him. Jamie was the reason he'd wanted to become a soldier in the first place. The pair of them had been in each other's pockets as kids, growing up in a rough estate in Northumberland with a violent alcoholic for a father. Sticking together had been the only way to survive. Jamie had defended his little brother on those dark nights when the old man staggered through the front door, breath reeking of whiskey, ready to fly into a rage at the slightest provocation. Once, during one of their frequent arguments, their father had grabbed a kitchen knife and lunged at their mother. Jamie had knocked the weapon out of his hand and beaten him senseless. Luke had been twelve years old at the time, but even now... He could still vividly recall the sight of his father lying on the kitchen floor, pawing at his shattered nose, blood oozing out of his mouth. Jamie had paid dearly for that incident, although the old man never laid a finger on their mother again. Luke didn't have a father as a role model, but he had his older brother. And so, when Jamie had joined Tutu SAS, Luke had been determined to follow in his footsteps. Four years after joining the Paris, he'd passed selection. Since then, their careers had taken very different paths. Luke was a soldier's soldier, a team player, one of the lads, respected by everyone, not a guy who picked sides or peddled agendas. He didn't question orders or rub people the wrong way. He did what he was told, kept his head down, and paid no attention to the bear pit of regiment politics. He had joined the SAS to fight. Why waste energy on the other stuff? Some guys applied for selection thinking they would be going to a unit where everything was straight down the line. Then they got there and realised it wasn't. The regiment was like any other unit in that respect. There were glory hunters who awarded themselves gongs they didn't deserve, careerists who paid more attention to their promotion prospects than the business of soldiering, arse-kissers who worked their way up the greasy pole by befriending the right people. Luke had never let any of it bother him, there were tossers and backstabbers in every walk of life. Best not to take any notice of them. But Jamie felt differently. He was genetically programmed not to take crap from anyone. He refused to turn a blind eye to the institutional bullshit that came with the territory at Hereford. That attitude had made life difficult for him. He'd made enemies. Lots of them. Too many to stay out of trouble. His reputation as a brilliant soldier had protected him for a while, but eventually he'd slipped up. Then the wolves had pounced. Now Jamie was a pariah, seeing out his army contract on glorified gardening leave, while Luke was running ops with the wing. Luke didn't know how to feel about that. He loved his brother. After cancer took their mother, Jamie was the only family he had left. Luke knew how much being in the SAS mattered to him. He would have given anything to get Jamie out of purgatory. But he was powerless to help. He knew how the system worked. Once you crossed the head shed, there was no way back. Not unless you had friends in seriously high places. And Jimmy doesn't have any of those. Luke shrugged off this depressing train of thought as the Mastiff hurtled through the streets. All we've got to do is survive the next ten minutes, he reminded himself. A quick routine in front of the cameras, then we're straight back to the safety of the base. In and out. Job done.
The Mastiff made a series of quick turns, then dropped its speed. Two minutes later, they jerked to a halt. The engine cut out, and then Hedge's voice sparked up in Carter's earpiece. We're here, mate. We've got sight of the square. Carter said into his throat mic. Josh, is everyone in position? In position, came the reply from Bowman. We're ready to roll. Carter swung his gaze towards Lysenko. Major, tell your men to get out and await further orders. Drivers are to steer where they are, plus the gunner, he added, indicating the soldier standing forward of them at the turret hatch, manning the top-mounted Browning 50 cal. Okay. Lysenko shouted over the comms, ordering the soldiers in the two Bushmasters to debass. Carter tipped his head at Voloshin and Kravets in turn and said, Wait here. Don't move until I give the signal that it's safe to leave the vehicle. Carter released his safety harness, rose to a low crouch, wrenched open the rear door and dropped down from the back of the vehicle, his rifle fixed to his sling. Lysenko followed, closing the door to the main cab behind him, while Hedges circled round from the front cab. Close by, the other soldiers had already dismounted from the Bushmasters and formed up in a tight grouping. Carter stretched to his full height and glanced round, orientating himself. Back in Kiev, he had spent hours consulting satellite imagery and maps of the town. The convoy had stopped on the southern side of the square. North of their position was the square itself, which was essentially a pin-neat garden studded with trees and flower beds. Paved avenues led towards a marble pedestal in the centre, surmounted with a bronze statue of a medieval warrior on horseback, brandishing a spear and shield. There was a small wooded area twenty metres or so to the east of the square, a playground to the west next to a row of bombed-out storefronts. All around, Carter saw signs of the recent battle for the town. The twisted metal carcasses of several Russian vehicles littered the roads. The pavements were strewn with debris, broken glass, shrapnel, pools of dried blood and bits of hastily abandoned kit. To the north of the square stood the town hall, a three-storey, pastel-coloured edifice with a Ukrainian flag draped from a brass pole protruding over the entrance. Next to it was a whitewashed church with a slate-clad spire. Further away, Carter caught sight of the blackened husks of several derelict apartment blocks and offices. A mass of journalists had assembled close to the centre of the square, partially screened behind a thicket of trees and bushes. Bowman and Dunk stood beside them, clearly identifiable by their face coverings and the suppressed L-119A2 rifles slung across their fronts. Half a dozen paces away, near the bronze statue, seven Ukrainian soldiers, infantrymen and women, waited patiently for the ceremony to begin. Carter swung round to face Major Lysenko. Pause two of your men on that corner, he said stabbing a finger at a crossroads fifty metres upstream from their position on the northwest corner of the square. I want two guys watching the road at our six o'clock, two more facing the junction to the northeast, and two more on the street to the southeast. The gunner will keep an eye on the side street directly to the south of our position. Questions? Lysenko shook his head and started barking orders to his men. The four teams quickly split up, sprinting towards their respective postings, while the gunner on the mastiff wheeled the turret round to face the side street ten metres to the south of the convoy. Between them, they would cover the main approaches to and from the square. As soon as Major Lysenko had confirmed that the soldiers were in position, Carter yanked open the mastiff door and said, OK, sir. We're ready for you now. Voloshin slapped his hands on his thighs, rose to his feet, and clambered out of the mastiff. Carter directed him towards the reporters fifteen metres to the north, while Kravets walked immediately behind his boss, his face drained of colour, eyes darting anxiously left and right. As Lysenko and another bodyguard marched alongside their president, the throng of cameras and smartphones swivelled towards them, poised to capture the moment as Voloshin walked up the avenue. Carter got back on the comms and said, how far have we got to be from the mark to stay out of the shot? Move three metres to your left, Tyler Dunk said in his slow, brummy drawl. That should do it. 
Carter and Hedges shifted to the side of the president, stepping away from him, until Dunk came back on the net and said, That's it. You're out of the shot now. Good job you ain't a company in the mark, Tyler, Bowman cut in. You'd break them cameras if your mug was on show today. Fuck off, Josh. Voloshin strode purposefully towards the crowd waiting for him in the square. Carter and Hedges quick-walked in the same direction, staying several paces from the president. When the footage was broadcast on the news that evening, it would show Voloshin in the company of his loyal bodyguards. No one watching at home would ever know that the Ukrainians had a group of SAS lads accompanying them every step of the way. The cameras tracked Voloshin as he made straight for the line of soldiers, the heroic defenders of Balanivka. One of them, an officer in a camo patterned field cap, stepped forward and stiffly saluted his commander-in-chief. Voloshin smiled broadly, and the two men pumped hands as the cameras clicked and whirred frenetically. Dunk and Bowman stood next to the line of Ukrainian soldiers, giving their backs to the media as they scanned the area. The guy in the field cap exchanged a few words with the president, gesturing towards several gutted buildings overlooking the square. Describing the atrocities inflicted on the town by the invaders, Carter supposed. Mass artillery bombardment. Scorched earth. Conscripts fed remorselessly into the meat grinder of the Russian army. More or less the same tactics they had used on the Eastern Front eighty years before, but less effective now. Voloshin listened and nodded somberly. Then the officer introduced him to the line of soldiers standing at his side, liberators of the ancestral home of their beloved president. Voloshin was a class act. That much was clear from the way he worked the audience. He shook each soldier's hand in turn, smiling genially, sharing a few words and posing for selfies. The Ukrainians clearly adored him. The most popular guy in his country's history, probably. There was only one other person in Ukraine who even came close to that level of adoration. Kravets tried to hurry his boss along. The PR man was obviously desperate to get back to the relative safety of Kiev as quickly as possible, Carter thought. But Voloshin refused to be rushed. He took his time, which was all part of the performance, Carter guessed. He was sending a clear message to the ruling cartel in Moscow, showing them he wasn't afraid that he could walk freely through the streets of a town only a few miles from Russian-held territory without fear of attack. The president smiled for a photograph with the last soldier, and then Lysenko hastily ushered him towards a patch of ground marked by a pair of sticks driven into the soil. The sticks had been placed by the advance party and indicated the spot where the president would make his live address to the cameras. From that position, the press corps would be able to get a shot of Voloshin with the bullet-scarred town hall and church in the background to the north. Voloshin cleared his throat and turned to address the cameras, flanked by his merry men. Today, we celebrate a historic moment in our country's history, he began, speaking in faintly accented English, another part of his charm offensive, Carter realized making sure that his words would be disseminated as widely as possible in the global media, getting his message across, something Voloshin had excelled at since the war had begun. My people come from this land, he went on. My father worked the soil here, and his father before him. This earth is in my blood. It does not belong to President Zhirkov or any of his cronies in the Kremlin. They have not worked this land or fought for it, or died defending it. No, it belongs to the people who live here, whose ancestors toiled here for generations. So does eastern Ukraine. So does Kherson. So does Crimea. Carter swept his eyes across the square, scanning for any sign of a threat. He saw the two Ukrainians at the crossroads to the northeast. The other teams were watching the adjoining roads from their positions on the corners of the square. The gunner atop the mastiff trained the fifty cal on the side street to the south. Half a dozen paces away, Bowman and Dunk continued observing the ground to the north, monitoring the town hall and church. Hedges and Lysenko kept their eyes on the crowd. Kravets dabbed his sweaty brow with a handkerchief. Voloshin continued, But this fight, this is not just a fight for Ukraine. No, 
This is a struggle for the soul of Western civilization. The whole world once tried to appease our enemies. Now they understand that evil cannot be negotiated with. It cannot be placated. Some people forgot this. They did not realize that the most important values, you must be willing to fight for them, to die for them. It is up to our soldiers in this land to keep alive the flame of freedom. Every town we recapture, every Russian force driven back to the east, is a victory for all peoples of the west. The Russians try to take what is not theirs. They kill our people, bomb our cities. They threaten to destroy our nuclear power plants. They declare their intention to wipe us from the earth. It does not matter. We will drive them back. The victory here at Balanivka is only the first step on a long road. Today is the beginning of the end of the invaders' illegal occupation. Then Carter heard the gunshots. Several of them, coming from the west. Carter's nine o'clock. In the next moment, he heard the shrieking din of bullets hammering against metal. He looked south just in time to see the gunner on the mastiff jerking wildly as a round caught him square in the face. Three more bullets missed their target, ricocheting off the turret housing and the fifty cal in a flurry of glowing sparks. Contact! Contact! Bowman roared over the net. Round's coming in! Carter swung round, looking towards the patch of woodland on the far side of the square. He saw four figures in army fatigues breaking clear of the tree line, less than forty metres from his position, packing assault rifles pissing bullets as they dashed towards the throng of reporters. Dunk, Hedges, and Bowman had turned to look in the same direction. So had Major Lysenko and the rest of the faces in the crowd. For a second, they stood frozen with shock and indecision. Then all hell broke loose. Panic instantly spread through the crowd. People started fleeing in every direction, screaming in terror and racing for cover behind the base of the statue and the surrounding greenery. A sound man chucked aside his boom mic and sprinted towards the armoured vehicles. He made it no more than four or five metres when a torrent of hot lead struck him in the lower back and sent him tumbling to the ground. Duncan Hedges broke forward to engage the enemy. Bowman and Lysenko dropped to their knees beside the statue, putting down rounds to cover their advance. The two soldiers on the far corner of the square realised what was happening and abandoned their post charging south towards the attackers. The two nearest assaulters whipped round to face them and let rip, cutting both the Ukrainians down. More rounds spattered the blacktop as two more Ukrainians raced up the street from the southeast corner, M4 barrels flaming. The assaulters dived for cover behind the burned-out shell of a truck before the Ukrainians could put the drop on them. Carter sprang into action. Not an active decision, more of an instinctive reaction in the lizard part of his brain, the product of millions of years of evolution, sharpened by the thousands of hours of hard training in the regiment. Priority number one, secure the mark, get him to safety. The crowd had rapidly dispersed. Several bodies littered the ground close to the spot where Voloshin had been delivering his speech. Carter saw a blonde woman in a puffer jacket, her legs and stomach stitched with bullets, her shattered camera lying beside her. Kravets was sprawled lifelessly on the ground nearby. The lower half of his face had been blown off. Amid the chaos, Carter spotted the president hurrying in the direction of the town hall, away from the safety of the convoy. Carter yelled at him to stop, but the guy didn't appear to have heard him and carried on running. Sensory deprivation. His threat levels were in the red zone. Carter had seen it happen to people in the thick of a firefight, Adrenaline overload. Some people lost control of their senses. Some sort of chemical imbalance. They stopped thinking rationally. Carter broke into a run, darting across the open ground as rounds fizzed through the air around him, ignoring the despairing cries of wounded civilians begging for help. He couldn't worry about them now. The life of the president was more important than anything else. Unpleasant, maybe. But that didn't make it any less true. Carter quickened his pace and caught up with the president in half a dozen strides. He thrust out an arm, grabbed hold of the guy by his bicep. This way, Carter shouted, indicating the mastiff on the southern side of the square. Now! He dragged the president towards the convoy, forty metres to the south. At his nine o'clock, 
Two of the assaulters were slumped on the blacktop beside the truck, bodies riddled with holes. The remaining two gunmen were crouching next to a bus shelter. Dunk and Hedges were pinning them down with suppressive fire, while Lysenko and the other Ukrainians broke forward. By now, the rest of the soldiers had rushed across the green to join the fighting. Fire and move tactics. The enemy shooters were hopelessly outnumbered. In a matter of moments, they would be cut down. Ten or twelve seconds had passed since the start of the attack. Carter hastened on. A small voice at the back of his head wondered why the Russians had staged such a futile assault. Four guys against sixteen trained soldiers and their SAS advisers. The enemy didn't stand a chance. So why the fuck are they attacking us? Something isn't right. As Carter manhandled the president towards the Mastiff, he noticed a sudden blur of movement in his peripheral vision, coming from his three o'clock, due west of the square, forty metres away. Carter stopped and looked past his shoulder. Then he saw them. Three figures crawling out of a manhole in the middle of the road, running straight towards him. All three of them wore the same basic uniform as the gunmen to the east, except none of these guys was carrying a weapon. All three had bulky vests strapped to their fronts, and suddenly Carter understood. These guys aren't shooters. They're suicide bombers. Distraction. A simple tactic, but effective. The gunmen to the east were the cannon fodder, drawing attention towards them so their mates could sneak up on the president and send him over to the other world. Fuck's sake, he growled at Voloshin. Hurry up! He hurried on towards the convoy, but the next time he glanced back, he saw that the bombers had closed on them, fists clenched tight around their detonators. The belts were designed to trigger as soon as the wearer released his thumb from the detonator switch. Voluntarily, or otherwise. A failsafe, in case anyone tried to neutralize the attacker. Shoot the guy, his hand would instinctively go limp, and the belt would detonate. The bombers were less than thirty meters behind them now. Forty meters to the Mastiff. We're too far away, Carter realized grimly. We'll never make it. A simple question of time and distance. The three guys in the suicide squad had no bulky armor or weaponry to slow them down. They were gaining ground fast. They would close on Carter long before he could bundle Voloshin into the back of the wagon. The kill radius of a typical suicide vest was around ten meters, Carter knew. Could be more. Depended on how much explosive material the wearer had strapped to their front. Carter had a matter of seconds before the nearest bomber drew within range. He made an instant decision. Carter stopped in his tracks, spun round, and threw Voloshin to the ground, pinning him down with his full body weight, partly to shield him from any fragmentation, but also to stop him from running away in a blind panic. In the confusion of the firefight, there was a chance that the guy might blunder straight into the path of the onrushing bombers. Enemy at the rear! Carter yelled. Suicide vests! They've got fucking vests on! Carter kept the president pinned down with one arm and tore his Glock semi-automatic from his thigh holster. In the corner of his vision, towards the east, the Ukrainian soldiers were still plugging away at the gunmen behind the bus shelter. Hedges and Dunk were there too. None of them seemed to have heard Carter. The nearest bomber was no more than twenty meters away when he lined up the Glock with his central mass and fired. Two rounds of nine milli parabellum flamed out of the pistol barrel in quick succession. The first bullet nailed the fucker in the crotch, shredding his balls. The second struck him in the face, shattering his lower jaw. The bomber spasmed, as if Dr. Frankenstein had thrown a switch and reanimated him. He tumbled forward, and then there was an earth-shattering boom as the vest detonated, vaporizing the guy. Instant cremation. The other bombers ran on past their atomized mate. Carter hastily swung the Glock across, lined up the next target. The second bomber was fifteen meters from the president. Carter loosed off four rounds, drilling the bastard in the shoulder and neck, giving him a one-way ticket to paradise. The bomber fell away a moment before the detonator activated. The fragmentation from the blast swept over Carter in a furious roar, nicking his flesh. He felt a burning pain in his right hand and released his grip on the Glock and dropped his gaze. 
a piece of shrapnel had embedded itself deep in his palm. Then he looked up again and felt his stomach drop. The third bomber was danger close, ten meters away. He had veered to one side of his comrades and bore down on Carter at an angle, fist clamped tight around his switch, ready to detonate. Carter knew he was out of luck. His gun hand was in rag order. He had no time to snatch up the Glock with his one good hand and drop the target. In another couple of seconds, the bomber would be right on top of him. Killing range. We're fucked. The rapid crack of a rifle erupted at his three o'clock. The bomber jerked and tumbled backwards, as if he'd slammed into a clothesline. Carter pressed himself flat against Voloshin as the bomber's vest exploded. The heat from the bomb blast fanned outwards, flinging a wave of shit over him. The gunfire on the other side of the square quickly ceased. Carter lifted his head and saw Bowman at his one o'clock, his rifle raised and trained on the spot where the bomber had been standing a moment before. There was nothing left of him now, except a black scarred patch of earth and a few scraps of burned clothing. The guy had vanished, like a magician performing a trick act live on stage. Several meters away, the bomber's severed head had landed in a bed of peonies and carnations, mouth agape in an expression of dumb surprise. Carter climbed to his feet, relief coursing through his bloodstream. He looked towards the eastern side of the square. Dust gritted his eyes, his teeth and gums. The remaining two attackers were lying in a tangle of limbs and broken glass next to the bus shelter. Dunk, Hedges and several of the Ukrainians were moving towards the woodland beyond the square, flushing out any more enemies that might be lurking in the immediate vicinity. The other four Ukrainian soldiers were jogging back over to deal with the maimed civilians. Carter patted the president down, checking for injuries. The guy had sustained a few grazes and cuts to his hands, and he was badly shaken, but otherwise he seemed unharmed. Are you okay, sir? he asked. Does anything hurt? Voloshin winced and said, I feel like I've got crushed ribs after you've sat on me. Otherwise, I'm okay. He smiled weakly, then coughed again and winced in pain. Nearby, Bowman was shouting at a pair of Ukrainian soldiers across the square and pointing at the manhole. Post some grenades in that drain! Fucking now! The two men promptly set off in the direction Bowman had indicated, one of them ripped a grenade from his belt, chucked it through the opening, and shrank back. There was a pause, followed by a deafening boom, and a plume of smoke belched out of the hole. A moment later, the two men edged forward and emptied several bursts from their M4s into the drain mouth. Any enemies down there would have been shredded to bits. Carter slung an arm around the president and helped him to his feet. He looked round at Bowman and said, Tell the drivers to get the vehicles going. We're leaving. Roger that, Luke. Bowman set off at a quick trot towards the convoy, hollering at the drivers. Standard operating procedure. Extract the mark, the immediate priority. Gather everyone together and evacuate the area. At his side, Voloshin was staring numbly at the carnage. Dead bodies, spent rounds, gleaming pools of blood. Carter said softly, Sir, we've got to get you out of here, right now. The president started to protest. My people, I can't, I can't leave them. There's no time, sir. He started hauling Voloshin away. We've got to go. There was a strong possibility that the Russians would stick a missile in the area once they realized the attack had failed. Carter decided against sharing this thought with the president. Just then, he heard a voice calling out from the direction of the statue. Carter looked over and saw a young woman in a blouse, her back against the pedestal, her left hand staunching the flow of blood from a wound to her right arm. She said something in Ukrainian to Voloshin. Carter couldn't understand a word of it, but whatever she said had a powerful effect on him. Tears welled in his eyes, his lower lip quivered. He swallowed hard, then turned and paced reluctantly towards the mastiff. Carter, moving alongside him, spoke urgently into his throat mic, updating the rest of the team on the president's status and the failed attack by the suicide bombers. Is everybody all right? Anyone down? 
Above the ringing noise in his ears, Carter heard a hoarse, brummy voice crackling over the comms. Me and Carl are fine, said Dunk. Major? Lysenko said. We have three men down. Repeat, three men down. All enemies neutralized. He paused. They're Chechens. Carter said. How the fuck did we miss them? We swept the place clean. Dunk said. There's a stay-behind shelter out here. Pissing distance from the square. Professional job. Looks like they were on hard routine. Carter felt something shift in his stomach. Christ, he thought. They must have been hiding down there for days. Everyone back to the RV, he said over the net. We're getting the fuck out of Dodge. Bowman stood beside the wagon, visually scanning the streets behind them. Carter guided Voloshin towards the rear of the Mastiff, yanked open the door, and helped the President up the steps. Voloshin staggered inside and collapsed onto the nearest seat. In the dim light of the main cab, Carter saw the slack form of the gunner crumpled beneath the hatchway. His face was a messy gout of blood and bone. Wait here, Carter ordered the president. He stepped back from the cab and saw Bowman staring at him. Jesus, what the fuck just happened? He asked in a low voice. Carter said quietly, It was a setup. They knew we were coming. But how? I don't know. But they wouldn't have gone to the hassle of building a stair behind shelter unless they knew the president was going to show his face here. Doesn't make any sense. Bowman rubbed his jaw. Maybe it was pure luck. They might have left a few blokes behind hoping that Voloshin would turn up. He shrugged. This is his hometown. They must have figured there was a decent chance he'd make an appearance. Maybe. But Carter wasn't convinced. The way those Chechens came at us, it took some serious planning, he thought. They set it up so they could draw the Ukrainians onto them. Buy some time for the bombers to have a free run at the president. Thirty seconds. That's all they would have needed. The rest of the BG team scrambled back towards the convoy. The Ukrainian soldiers moved hurriedly across the square, collecting the bodies of their dead comrades, while Carter filed a report with the radio operator at the forward mounting base. We've had a contact, he said. He forced himself to speak slowly to make himself understood to the Ukrainian operator. Repeat, we've had a contact. We'll be coming back on Route Bravo. Repeat, Route Bravo. Get a reception party ready and get the bird turning. We'll be with you in figures twenty. Is the mark injured? He's fine, but we've got three men down and multiple civilian casualties. We need paramedics and reinforcements to throw up a cordon and secure the area. Something else occurred to him. Get someone to seize all the cameras and phones from the journalists. No leaked recordings. We can't let anyone know this happened. The Ukrainian soldiers finished bundling the last bodies into the backs of the Bushmasters and jogged over to their respective wagons. Major Lysenko, Hedges and Dunk clambered after Bowman into the Mastiff cabin. As Carter started to follow them, a guy in a hoodie called out in a pleading tone of voice. Not Ukrainian, but an accented English voice. American or Canadian, perhaps. He stopped and glanced at the man. He was kneeling on the ground beneath an oak tree, cradling a grey-haired woman in a suit. Blood gushed down the man's face, from a wound to his scalp. His shirt was drenched red. Don't leave us, the guy in the hoodie cried. Please, don't. Help is coming, Carter told him. Stay here. Paramedics are on the way. Then he swung up into the cabin and pulled the door shut behind him. He took the empty seat opposite the president, while Lysenko got on the comms and instructed the drivers to get moving. A few seconds later, they were pulling away from the square, back towards the relative safety of the FOB. Fuck me, that was close, Hedges said. Nobody replied. Bowman nodded at Carter's gun hand and said, You'll need to get that cleaned up before it gets infected. Carter looked down at his blood-lacquered hand. In the mad rush to bug out of the town, he'd quite forgotten about his wound. Adrenaline had numbed the pain, dialing it down to a dull, constant throb. 
nature's painkiller. The jagged piece of shrapnel had buried an inch or so deep in his palm. A painful injury, but nothing that would keep him out of action for long. What did that woman say to you back there? Carter asked the president. Sir? Voloshin had been staring at the floor. He looked up and blinked rapidly, as if snapping out of a trance state. She begged me to leave her. To save myself, he said, his voice choked with emotion. She said I needed to live, so that Ukraine could survive, even if it meant... He broke off and looked away, his eyes rimmed with tears. Carter sat back and fell silent, a troubling thought picking at his skull. For security purposes, only a handful of individuals had been informed about Voloshin's visit to Balanivka. Major Lysenko, his 2IC, Tatarin, the SAS protection team, and his inner circle of advisors. Maybe a dozen people in total. People with impeccable credentials, their backgrounds thoroughly vetted by the intelligence agencies. Each of them had demonstrated their unstinting loyalty to their leader. So how the fuck did the Chechens know where to find us? Carter wondered. But he already knew the answer. Someone had told them about the president's movements he realized. Tipped them off. The only explanation for the attack, which could only mean one thing. We've been betrayed. Chapter 2. Credenhill, Herefordshire. 1,700 miles away, at exactly 10 o'clock in the morning, Warrant Officer 2nd Class Steve Duncan swept into the blandly furnished briefing room on the first floor at SAS headquarters. The fourteen lads sitting on the rows of cheap chairs waited in silence as the commander of Air Troop G Squadron made directly for the lectern, his massive arms swinging at his sides, fists the size of wrecking balls. Alongside him marched a slightly younger guy in his late thirties, greyhound lean and rugged-faced, dressed in a pair of black jeans, plaid shirt and timberlands, with must-brown hair that showed the first shoots of grey at the edges. Warrant Officer Jamie Carter, one-time hero of the regiment and now a Hereford exile, stopped next to Duncan behind the lectern and felt a tingle of anticipation. Six months ago, the head shed had turned Carter into an outcast. They had banished him from his squadron, turfed him out on long-term leave, and left him to rot. His reward for single-handedly preventing a conspiracy involving rogue elements within the CIA, an ex-regiment legend, and a plot to smuggle suitcase nukes to Taiwan. He should have received a gong for his actions. Instead, the top brass had scolded him and delivered a stark warning. Tell anyone about this, and we'll crucify you. For the first time in his life, Carter had kept his mouth shut. He took the terms on offer and walked out of the camp gates the same day. The smart choice. He knew they weren't bluffing. Either he agreed to play along or he was facing extradition to the U.S. on a murder charge, execution of a CIA fixer, a sentence of twenty years to life behind bars in some hellhole prison. Since then, Carter had been kicking his heels, in forced furlough. His days had been spent on life admin and honing his fitness, going on punishing runs through the hills near his modest home, keeping himself sharp for the day when his skills would be needed again. With one eye on his future, he had reached out to a few mates on the private circuit, old Hereford hands who had left to set themselves up in the trade. Over drinks, he'd sounded them out about contract work. He'd assumed, perhaps naively, that a soldier with his track record would not be short of offers. But he had quickly discovered that the world had moved on. The younger guys in the regiment had degrees and online courses in security management. They were fluent in cyber security corporate espionage, money laundering, skills Carter lacked. Employers didn't want mercenary warriors. They had no use for trained killers. They wanted technicians. In his darkest moments, Carter regretted not leaving the regiment sooner. He had been a young blade during the wars in the Middle East, back when Uncle Sam had been hell-bent on forging democracies in Baghdad and Kabul, with the Federal Reserve footing the bill. Some of the lads at Hereford, spying an opportunity to make their fortunes, had left the regiment early and set themselves up as private military contractors on the circuit. 
There had been stories of guys later selling their businesses for tens of millions of dollars. Carter had missed out on the gold rush. He'd stayed on in the regiment. A foolish decision, in retrospect. Now his prospects looked bleak. He had no specialist qualifications. No one gave you an MBA for intervening to stop a deadly terrorist attack. The best he could hope for was a contract with one of the oil companies. Steady work, but dull. Not the kind of career he had envisaged for himself after leaving Hereford. But better than nothing. Better than a kick in the teeth. He had eighteen months left. Eighteen months on the sidelines, keeping himself busy and collecting his special forces pay. Then he'd leave the camp for the last time and try his luck on Civvy Street. But then three days ago, everything had changed. Carter had received a call out of the blue from the regiment CO, Peter Hardcastle, summoning Carter to his office. He'd arrived at the meeting the next morning, fully expecting to be told that he was being sacked, the final nail in the coffin of his career as a blade. Instead, to his astonishment, Hardcastle had offered him a lifeline, a transfer to G Squadron. Now, suddenly, Carter was back in from the cold, ready to go back to doing what he did best, soldiering. Silence fell like a curtain over the room as Duncan prepared to speak. Right, lads, before we get down to business, we've got a new face in the troop, he said matter-of-factly, his voice carrying a trace of his tough Glaswegian roots. Duncan was feared and respected in equal measure. A legend of the regiment, he was also something of a closed book, not someone who engaged in chit-chat or went out on the lash at the end of training. Carter had seen Duncan from time to time at one of the local watering holes in Hereford, sitting alone and sipping a Diet Coke, but you had the sense he was watching everyone out of the corner of his eye. He gestured towards Carter and continued, I'm sure you all know Geordie. No doubt you're wondering what he's doing here. Turns out D Squadron have had enough of him after he fucked up on his last stop, so they've dumped him on us. Most of the soldiers chuckled heartily, but one guy at the back stared coldly at Carter, his face taut with barely concealed hostility. Eddie Rigg, a veteran blade, had long greasy hair, a straggly beard, and sleeves of elaborate tattoos inked down both of his arms. With his dark jeans, black boots, and Metallica t-shirt, he had the look of a biker. All that was missing was the leather jacket. Next to him sat a thick-set Fijian, Sokovi Sek von Alagi, was the descendant of regiment royalty. His father and uncle had both served in the Royal Green Jackets before joining Tutu SAS. Sek's father had fought at the Battle of Mirbat in Oman in the 1970s. His uncle had taken part in the Iranian embassy siege and later saw action in the Falklands. No one had been surprised when Sek had followed in their footsteps by passing selection. A fearless warrior, he had only two interests outside the regiment rugby, and family. Physically, he was a beast, bull-necked and thick-muscled, as wide as he was tall. His t-shirt looked as if it had been shrink-wrapped around his biceps. You gonna teach us something we don't know, Geordie? Sex said. He grinned. Yeah, how to royally piss off the head shed, replied a squat figure sitting on the front row. Carter looked at the man who had spoken. At first glance, Brad Hickey looked more like a southern redneck than an SAS soldier. He wore a bright red baseball cap, chewed tobacco, and had a tattoo on his right arm of a coiled rattlesnake, above the words, Don't tread on me. Hickey had spent a couple of years going out on joint ops with the lads in Delta Force and SEAL Team 6, and the experience had turned him into a massive American SF fanboy. Carter smiled wearily. He knew what these lads were thinking. They think I've been sent here as a punishment to piss me off. Everyone knew his hard luck story, how he had been shafted by the bosses in the wake of the Tajikistan op. By posting him to G Squadron, they were taking him out of his comfort zone, hoping to get a reaction from him, provoke him into kicking up a fuss, something that would give the powers that be an excuse to sack him. That's enough, Duncan said. He turned to Carter. Welcome to Air Troop, Geordie. I'm sure you'll get to know everyone very well over the next few weeks. Have a seat. Carter nodded and took an empty chair on the front row, 
wedging himself between Hickey and Tom Farrell, a softly spoken Ulsterman with a shock of red hair and a neatly trimmed beard. Farrell was one of the longest-serving men in the regiment, with a wife and four kids. He rarely said much, but he was quick-witted and had a sense of humour as dry as a bag of bones. Duncan looked towards two men sitting beside the lectern. Carter recognised them both from previous jobs. The younger man was Lyndon Grist, a tall, bookish int officer attached to Tutu SAS from the Intelligence Corps. Grist served as the interlink between Hereford and the security services and had responsibility for preparing target packs for the team. Next to him sat Christopher Smallwood, the regiment ops officer, a career Rupert in his late thirties with a receding hairline, arched eyebrows and a severe manner. Fellas, over to you, Duncan said. Lyndon Grist, the int officer, got up and circled round to the lectern while Duncan stood to one side. Grist coughed to clear his throat, and then addressed the men. Gentlemen, this mission is a hard arrest on foreign soil. I'll run through the background target pack we've got from six, take any questions, and then hand over to Steve. Grist paused and tapped keys on a laptop. A moment later, a photograph flashed up on one of the massive screens mounted on the rear wall behind the lectern. Carter found himself looking at a puffy-faced figure with silvery hair a grey-flecked beard and slitted eyes framed by a pair of rimless glasses. A pinkish scar shaped like a sickle curved down from the corner of his left eye. Grist said, Your target is this man, Denis Viktorovich Gorchakov, Russian national, born in what used to be Leningrad, 53 years old. Started out running a catering firm before he moved to Moscow. According to the int we have from six, Denis Gorchakov is one of Russia's most powerful figures. For the past twenty years, he's made a fortune working as the accountant for several high-profile oligarchs. He's also rumoured to be the president's personal banker. Fuck me, he must be worth a few quid, said Sek. Grist said. Six believes that Gorchakov is one of Russia's richest men. They estimate that his personal wealth is somewhere in the ballpark of three billion. Farrell whistled. Tell you what, Brad, with that much wonga, even a thick bastard like you might stand a chance of getting laid. That prompted a few hearty chuckles from the others. Hickey glared at him. I get my fair share of action, mate. The women can't get enough of this. He pointed to his crotch. They're hardly dating you on account of your tiring intellect, are they now? Farrell joked. Laughter spread throughout the briefing room as the others joined in. Sek snorted and said, Even if this Russian feller is minted, he's not likely to be flaunting it. His kind never do. Money will be securely hidden in a Swiss bank. Duncan smiled. Nothing is secure in this world, Eddie. Not any more. You should know that. Gorchakov is extremely paranoid, Grist cut in. Comes with the territory when you handle money for the likes of the Russian president. He knew that one day his enemies would come looking for him. A few years ago he started buying up diamonds, works of art, gold bullion, anything he could readily liquidate if he needed to make an emergency getaway. Duncan said, Basically, our man is sitting on a ton of transportable wealth, stuff he'd want to keep close to hand. Probably got it hidden in a safe somewhere in one of his properties. What's the interest in this guy? asked Farrell. Someone in Whitehall needs some help fiddling their expenses, like, Grist said. Gorchakov has spent his career investing stolen funds on behalf of his bosses, which means he knows all the Kremlin's dirty financial secrets. Where the president's cash is hidden, what assets he owns, where the money came from, who got a slice of the action. Illegal activities, criminal networks, corrupt dealings. Obviously, what he knows is of considerable interest to Vauxhall. Sex stroked his jaw thoughtfully. Are we sure this guy is the president's personal banker? Last I heard, he was one of the bloke's harshest critics. He's always on TV slagging him off. Grist said. Six believes that's an act, a smokescreen designed to conceal the true nature of his relationship with the president. Duncan smiled thinly. Typical Kremlin tactics, misdirection. Make it look like your mates are working for the other side. That way, no one will suspect them of doing your dirty work for you.
Gotta hand it to the Russians, Farrell said. They're crafty, even if they are a bunch of murderous bastards. Gris nodded and ran a hand through his thinning hair. Voxel had their suspicions about Gorchakov. They knew he was close to the president, but they couldn't be sure. But then Gorchakov started making public statements against the president, which raised a couple of questions. Why wasn't the Kremlin trying to silence him? Where did all his wealth come from? The more Six looked into it, the more they were sure that this guy was the president's money manager. For the past several months, Gorchakov has been living under the radar in Poland. The official story is that he fled Moscow after the president turned against him. In fact, Six believes that the Russian president deliberately organized the move in order to protect Gorchakov. Hickey creased his brow. But if Gorchakov is the president's banker, surely he'd want to keep him close. Grist shook his head. The president has a growing number of enemies inside the Kremlin, he explained. People who would like to get hold of Gorchakov have a conversation with him. It's in his interest to keep him well away from Moscow. Duncan said, There is mounting internal opposition to the president. The war in Ukraine has weakened his position, and his enemies smell blood. Senior Kremlin officials are now openly discussing how to get rid of him. What has that got to do with our man? asked Hickey. Three days ago, Six received credible int that the FSB is planning to snatch Gorchakov from his bolt hole in Poland. The working theory is that they're going to torture him into giving up his secrets, then deliver an ultimatum to the president. Stand down, or you'll lose everything. In light of this development, Vauxhall has sanctioned an operation to lift Gorchakov and extradite him to London. That's where you lads come in. Carter said, What's the target location? Grist signalled to Duncan. The latter leaned over and worked one of the laptop keyboards. A series of images promptly flashed up on the wall-mounted screens behind the lectern. Carter saw a low-resolution satellite shot of a large rectangular compound surrounded by a perimeter fence set in a sprawling landscape of dense woodland. There was a street view of the same location. Another screen displayed a photograph of what looked like an identical building. Grist said, Gorchakov owns four properties in Poland, scattered throughout the countryside, all built in remote areas, all built to the exact same specs, using the same materials, the same carpet, furniture, gardens, same everything. Bit fucking extreme, remarked Sek. Maybe he's got a condition, Hickey suggested. OCD or some shit. Bad enough to build the same gaff four times. Sek looked sceptical. Could be, Farrell said. I knew one lad who did close protection for a Greek shipping magnate. Billionaire. Had mansions all over the world. He reckoned this fella had the same suits, watches and shoes at every house. He'd get himself measured up for a Savile Row suit, then order five of them and send one to each place. Which one is Gorchakov staying at now? asked Carter. None of them. Right now he's out of the country. Last seen in Geneva, dealing with clients, we think. Sek wrinkled his brow. Then how do we know which mansion to target? We don't, Grist replied. At least, not yet. But we believe that Gorchakov is due to fly back to Poland imminently. Are you sure? Grist nodded. Gorchakov makes frequent trips to Geneva, once every couple of months to meet with clients. Usually follows the same routine. He flies in on his private jet, stays in the presidential suite at the Grafton Hotel for six nights, before heading home. In the meantime, we're monitoring activity on his accounts. As soon as that goes silent, we know that he's finished his business and is heading back, at which point we'll track the flight path of his private jet. The destination will indicate which property Gorchakov will be staying at in Poland. What's the green light for the arrest? asked Carter. You'll wait until we have official confirmation that Gorchakov is at his residence, which will come from our friends at Cheltenham. They'll be monitoring internet and phone activity at all four locations. As soon as he logs onto a computer, uses his phone or the landline, we'll know about it. Then you'll fly in and snatch the target. That's hardly ideal. We're not going to have much notice. Grist shifted his weight and shrugged. Can't be helped. We can't do anything that might alert Gorchakov. If he realises he's being watched, he'll get spooked, and there's a very good chance he'll go underground. What about bodyguards? 
asked Farrell in his soft Belfast brogue. Eight guys on the BG team. Gorchakov never travels anywhere without them. When they're cutting around on the roads, he rides in a Rolls-Royce Phantom with his bodyguards in a couple of G-wagons, front and rear. Polish? Russian, ex-Spetsnaz, so they're capable enough. Armed, of course. Do we know their routine? According to our source, four of them patrol the grounds when the big boss is staying over for the night. Another two guys posted at the gatehouse at all times. We can assume two more will be inside the building, guarding the principal or taking a nap. Carter said. Who's the source? One of the maids. She was sacked several months ago and sought asylum in the UK. Came to Six's attention when she listed her previous employer on a job application. Why would she dub in her old boss? It's a personal thing. She claims Gorchakov treats his staff like shit. Sixteen-hour shifts, dirty accommodation, no running water or electricity. Some of the girls were regularly abused. Farrell said, We should be locking the bastard up, not giving him a new life on the taxpayer's dime. Haven't you heard, Tom? Crime pays. Sec grinned. A ripple of laughter spread through the room. Grist said, The maid's information is solid. We can trust her. Has he got any local protection? Polish police, security forces, anything like that? Carter asked. Not as far as we're aware, no. Gorchakov prefers to rely on men he knows he can trust. Anyone else in the house? Asked Sek. Wife and kids? Grist shook his head firmly. Gorchakov's family is still in Russia. The president has kept them there as collateral, to make sure Gorchakov doesn't get any ideas. The only other occupants are the household staff. Does he have a strong room? Carter glanced over his shoulder. The question came from Eddie Rigg, the bike fanatic with the long beard. Rigg had been quiet so far during the briefing, but now he seemed to be staring at the images on the screens with a keen interest. Good question, said Duncan. He looked towards Grist. Lyndon? Grist said. As far as we gather, yes. The maid has confirmed that there's a strong room on the second floor of each property. Gorchakov mainly uses them to store his loot. They're glorified safes. Specs? Sek asked. We're looking into that as we speak. Rig said. We'll need to know everything about those rooms before we fly out. Thickness of the walls, type of door, whether there's plumbing and electricity inside. And what kind of locking system the guy uses? Sek added. Carter glanced at him. What difference does that make? We're just covering all the bases, Geordie. Don't want any nasty surprises when we get inside, do we? Carter stared at him, but said nothing. Duncan said, Once we've secured the target, we'll hand him over to Six. They'll subject him to an enhanced interrogation and find out what he knows. Then we'll get the beers in, Farrell added. Hickey stared at him with raised eyebrows. Sure you should be drinking at your age, Tom? Jesus, you're so old you were probably on the fucking ark. I'll buy you a bloody shandy, you wanker. Farrell and Hickey both laughed easily, but Carter wasn't tuned in. He was puzzling over something. Why the big fuss over this block? He asked. Why does Six give two shits about some Russian accountant buying up a load of country piles and yachts for his boss? The int officer turned towards Smallwood. The ops man said, Gorchakov is the fixer to the Russian elite. He's the guy who arranged the purchase of the president's super yacht and his palace on the Black Sea coast. Billions of dollars in assets. The propaganda value of British officers seizing the president's prize yachts will be immense. It'll embarrass him, make him look weak in front of his own people. It might also concentrate minds inside the Kremlin, Grist added. The President's remaining backers might start to reconsider their positions if they think their assets are at risk. What if the target resists arrest? Carter wondered. Smallwood met his gaze evenly. He said, Six wants Gorchakov alive. No ifs, no fucking buts. If the Principal resists, do whatever it takes to suppress him. But make sure you bring him back while he's still drawing breath, or you can forget about a career in this squadron, Geordie. A short time later, Grist wrapped up the intelligence briefing. Then Duncan stepped forward and announced that they were taking a short break.
Grist and Smallwood left the room, while Carter, Rig, and the rest of the troop drifted towards a table near the back. Plates of sandwiches had been laid out, along with a load of snacks and fresh fruit, and stainless steel urns filled with coffee and tea. Carter fixed himself a brew, grabbed a ham and cheese sandwich, and chatted with a few of the other guys. There was the usual Hereford small talk. The guys swapped rumours about blades who had left the unit recently, the jobs they had landed, the money they were supposedly making. A retired veteran from the Gulf War had recently killed himself. Sec moaned about how he'd have to miss a rugby match at Twickenham the following week. Hickey bored everyone senseless about his recent trip to Florida to meet up with his new besties from Delta. They were going to go into business together one day, Hickey said, running their own training packages. Hickey had big plans for his life after the regiment. He was going to make a new life for himself in the US, apparently. Sell up his terraced house, buy up a condo in Tampa, and get rich. He couldn't wait. Rig stared at Carter from across the room, a look in his eyes as cold as liquid nitrogen. Carter wondered what he had done to piss the bloke off. Maybe nothing. Maybe Rig just didn't like him. That happened sometimes at Hereford. You were living in a close-knit world, spending your time in small, patrol-sized units, surrounded by a bunch of lads with strong personalities. Sometimes people simply didn't get along. But still, it seemed fucking weird. Twenty minutes later, Duncan marched back into the room with Grist and Smallwood. The men of Air Troop returned to their chairs for the operational briefing, which covered logistics, times, locations, equipment, everything they needed to know before planning the assault in detail. Mounting up point will be at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, Duncan said. Once we land, there will be a planning briefing. Then it's a case of waiting for confirmation that Gorchikov is on site. Once we get the green light, we're straight on the Blackhawks. Hickey said, Time to target. Anything from 40 minutes to two hours, depending on which property you'll be assaulting. Refueling en route at a friendly base in western Poland. What are the rules of engagement? Farrell asked. Neutralize any BGs who attempt to return fire. Secure the rest and get in and out of there as quickly as possible. Smallwood coughed and said, Six is very keen for this mission to go smoothly. We don't want to find ourselves in a position where we need to explain to our Polish friends what's happened, or, God forbid, risk a blue on blue with the local police. You'll also be going in sterile, Duncan said. That means standard uniforms, no badges or insignia, nothing that might identify you. That goes for you especially, he added, glaring at Hickey. Me? Hickey affected an innocent look. What the fuck have I done, Chief? Them badges you wear. That stupid challenge coin you carry round. The one with the winged dagger on it. That shape might be acceptable in the land of the free, but as long as you're in my troop, son, you'll leave that crap in your locker. Carter said. When do we fly out? Two days from now, Duncan replied. A few days before Gorchakov is due to finish his meetings with his clients in Geneva. We leave at 0600 hours on the dot. Chopper to Bryce Norton, then we'll cross deck for onward flight to Germany. The meeting continued throughout the early afternoon. There was a long discussion about the kit they'd need for the job. Explosives, rifles, cutting devices. Then Duncan left the room. He returned two minutes later with a guy from 18 Signals. Jacob Moody was a combat communicator with the look of a triathlete, slim and wiry. He walked the team through the tech they would be using on the ARP. Comms kit, eavesdropping, drones, cameras. There would be a direct link from Ramstein to GCHQ at Cheltenham throughout the mission, Moody said, providing the guys with up-to-the-minute information on any goings-on at the stronghold. Moody would also accompany the team to Germany, so they could deal with any technical glitches before mounting up. In addition, each soldier would swap the SIM card on his phone for a local one prior to their departure. Some time ago, Whitehall had discovered that Kremlin agents had been covertly positioning pineapple Wi-Fi devices around the base at Credenhill. The pineapples were small, mass-produced units that allowed hackers to stealthily glean personal information from anyone who logged onto a public Wi-Fi network. The Russians were rumoured to have installed pineapples at several other locations, Cheltenham, Vauxhall, 
the SBS camp at Poole. In theory, they could use the data scraped from the phones to identify and track British personnel operating in Ukraine. As a result, changing SIM cards was now part of standard operating procedure for all regiment men on overseas ops. Once Moody had finished the tech brief, Duncan stepped forward. OK, fellas, I think that's all the basics covered for now. If anything else comes up before we fly out, I'll let you know. In the meantime, sort out your kit and weaponry. Any other questions? He looked round the room, then nodded. Good. I suggest you get a move on. We leave in two days. Chapter 3 At two o'clock the following afternoon, Jamie Carter and the rest of the team reported to the G Squadron hangar located at one end of the camp at Credenhill. The cavernous space was a hive of activity as the soldiers checked and packed their equipment ahead of their flight to Ramstein the next morning. Glock pistols and L-119A2 rifles were broken down into their individual components and cleaned to make sure they were in good working order. Ballistic helmets, aviator gloves, knee pads and elbow pads and tactical plate carriers were packed into army backpacks. Also carried by each man, tourniquets and shell dressings, suppressors for their primary weapons, night sights, rail-mounted red dot sights, flashbangs, L2 grenades, smoke grenades, several pairs of plastic cuffs, and five spare clips of ammo, 5.56 by 45mm NATO rounds for the L119A2s, 9 milli brass for the Glock semi-automatics. In one corner of the hangar, Eddie Rigg was checking over a hydraulic jig, which was a four-foot-long pole with a pair of metal sleeves at one end, which expanded when inserted in the slight gap between frame and door. The resulting force pushed everything outward, allowing the operator to easily wrench the door away from the surrounding frame, a vital piece of kit for any method of entry team. At a nearby table, Sec was assembling a stack of shaped charges for blowing open doors and windows. The burly Fijian worked methodically, connecting strips of debt cord to cigarette packet-sized lumps of C4 explosive. Both the cord and the C4 were rigged up to lengths of thin electrical wire. There were rolls of double-sided black tape on the table, plus two dozen Claymore clacker firing devices used to detonate the charges. Close by, Hickey tested a metal detector, the kind of thing used to detect landmines, shaped like a garden strimmer, with a bulky main operating unit and a telescopic rod attached to a search head at the other end. Hickey, chewing his skull tobacco, disassembled the detector and started packing the separate parts into the carry case. While Carter checked his weaponry, he caught sight of Farrell handling a thermal lance. The lance was a nifty tool, a man-portable pressurised cylinder filled with oxygen, rigged up to a length of cutting cable, a favourite of UKSF teams, ideal for slicing through steel doors or when you needed to hack through metal bars on a window in a matter of seconds. Two additional thermal lances rested on the floor. Farrell noticed Carter watching him and looked up. Something wrong, Geordie? Or are you just admiring my good looks? What are we taking them things for? Carter indicated the thermal lances. Back up, son, in case we need to cut the principal out of the strong room. He patted the cylinder and grinned broadly, revealing a set of crooked yellow teeth. Or do I need to explain room entry procedures to you? Before Carter could reply, Duncan set down his Glock and marched over. They're a problem, Geordie. Carter said. Why do we need three lances? One is more than enough for the job. No harm in preparing for the worst, is there? Better than winging it like your old mates in D Squadron. Carter tensed his muscles. Farrell and Duncan shared a laugh. I've never needed three lances to make a hard arrest, Carter said evenly, or a metal detector. Duncan shrugged. We do things differently in G Squadron, he said. I'm starting to realise that. Duncan stepped towards him, dropping his voice to a low growl. What are you trying to say, meat? Carter pointed to the pile of explosives Sec had been putting together. He said, there's got to be twenty frame charges over there. 
Our guys never used more than two or three on house assault. This looks more like we're planning a bank raid than a hard arrest. And what the fuck do we need a metal detector for? Something glinted in Duncan's eyes. In case you've forgotten, we're under orders to retrieve any int the target has got stored in his gaff. Laptops, phones, hard drives. Them Russians are all the same. Slippery bastards. He might try and stash his hardware somewhere when he hears us crashing through the front door. Carter shook his head fiercely. We don't need all this kit. We'll be weighed down. The team leader shot him a filthy glare. Listen here, you thick bastard, he said frostily. Me and the lads have been kicking in doors for the past six years. We've done shitloads of busts in Iraq, Afghanistan. We know what we're doing. So don't tell us how to do our fucking jobs, all right? Carter met the Scots' gaze, his jaw set firm. Around the hangar, the other twelve guys had stopped what they were doing and looked towards him, like school kids anticipating a scrap. The logical part of his brain told him not to argue the point. You've been in G Squadron for five minutes, the voice cautioned. This is your one chance to salvage your career. Don't screw it up. It's your call, Steve, he muttered. Aye, that bloody well is. Duncan eyeballed him for a moment longer. Then he wheeled round and walked away. The other lads went back to work. Carter turned his attention to his kit, but he couldn't shake the seed of doubt that had been forming in his head since the briefing. It was true that every squadron had their own way of doing things. Contrary to the popular image of the regiment in the media, standard operating procedures varied from team to team. Knowledge gained in the field was passed down from one group to the next by the veteran NCOs, the men who formed the spiritual backbone of the SAS. The best soldiers adapted to the situation in front of them. It wasn't unusual to find subtle differences in the ways that each squadron tackled a problem. So, maybe it was nothing, Carter told himself. Maybe Duncan and his guys were just covering all the bases. But maybe not. Half an hour later, the men finished packing their kit. They stowed their ops baggage in a secure area, ready to snatch up and load onto the Chinook the next morning. Then they left the hangar, passing the helipad, as they made for the car park a short distance away, chatting and joking. As Carter started in the same direction, Duncan called out to him. He turned and saw the bluff Scott strolling over. No hard feelings, Geordie? Carter made a face. Jesus, Steve, I ain't a fucking snowflake. Duncan relaxed his features into a warm smile. He jerked a thumb in the direction of the hangar. Look, I, I know all that kit might look a bit excessive, but we just like to make sure we're not going in half-cocked. You know how it is. It's fine, Carter said. There was a pause of silence as Duncan regarded the younger man. Then he said quietly, I know why you're here, mate. I've heard all the stories on the grapevine. Carter said nothing. Duncan continued. The way the head shed shafted you after that siege in Mali is fucking disgraceful. They should have given you a medal for what you did out there. Carter shrugged. It is what it is. Duncan cleared his throat and said, Me and the lads are going to RV at the White Horse later on. Get a few beers in. Sort of a troop tradition the night before we head out on an op. We'll be there from eight o'clock, if you're interested. Carter thought. These guys are meant to be professionals. Instead, they're spending the night before a mission out on the lash. But he decided against saying anything. He already got off to a bad start with his new colleagues. That tongue of yours has got you in plenty of trouble in the past. You're welcome to tag along, Duncan went on. But don't feel like you've got to come or anything. I know it's not really your bag, Geordie. He smiled, but there was something peculiar about his tone, Carter sensed. An implication that his presence would not be entirely appreciated at the troop's pre-op piss-up. Carter didn't take it personally. He'd been a blade for long enough to know the score. He was damaged goods. A cautionary tale. One minute you were flavour of the month with the head shed, the hero of the regiment. Then you weren't, for whatever reason, and suddenly everyone else wanted to steer clear of you. He'd seen it happen to guys in the past, 
good soldiers whose careers had suffered because they had pissed off the higher-ups. Carter had no interest in going out on the lash. There had been a time once when he had enjoyed that side of regiment life, bonding with his muckers over several pints, getting into scraps with the locals outside the kebab shop after closing time. But then he'd had a wake-up call. One of the veterans had taken Carter under his wing, showed him the importance of dedicating himself to being an elite operator. Nowadays, Carter was something of a loner. He preferred his own company to getting hammered with a few idiots in some grungy pub. Thanks, he said, but I'll take a rain check. Got some life admin to sort out. Course, Geordie, no worries. Duncan slapped him cheerfully on the shoulder. See you bright and early tomorrow, son. Duncan turned and beat a path towards his slate-grey Range Rover. Rig and Hickey made for their Harley Davidsons. The two lads were both massively into their motorbikes, always discussing new customised stuff for the Harleys or flicking through copies of MCN. Carter gave his back to the others and folded himself behind the wheel of his Volvo S90. He was looking forward to a quiet evening at home, a walk across the hills perhaps, then a few hours reading before he got his head down. He had a biography of Alexander the Great he was keen to finish. Better than sitting in a boozer all night, listening to Hickey, Rig, and the rest of the lads in air troop talking shite. He gunned the engine and steered out of the car park. Twelve minutes later, Carter reached his home a couple of kilometres outside Credenhill. He eased the Volvo to a halt at the end of the gravel driveway, climbed out, and started for the front door. He was about to shove the key in the lock when his phone buzzed. Carter took out his phone and peered at the screen. No call or ID. He stepped back from the door, swiped a finger across the scuffed glass to answer. A gruff voice on the other end said, Geordie, it's Phil Greening. Carter froze. Major Phil Greening was the 2IC of the regiment, a hard-as-nails old sweat from G Squadron, with twenty years of service under his belt. It was unusual for an ex-ranker to reach the upper echelons of the SAS. As such, he commanded total respect among his peers. But he wasn't the sort of bloke who checked in for a casual chat. Whatever Greening wanted with him, it had to be bad news. What the fuck have I done now? Listen, Geordie, I need to speak with you. Not a request, but a demand. Carter sighed through gritted teeth. Sure. When? Tonight. The King's Arms, near Madley. Seven o'clock. We'll grab a pint and I'll explain everything then. Why? What's this about? I can't say right now, not on the phone. Just make sure you're there tonight, got it? Roger that. And Geordie? Yes? Don't mention this to anyone else. The King's Arms was an old-school boozer housed in a crumbling red brick structure six miles outside Hereford. The place had seen better days, and better decades too. The paintwork was peeling, dirty net curtains were drawn over the windows. A sign outside promised good food and cold beer, which was setting the bar pretty low, in Carter's opinion. He left his Volvo in the car park and paced briskly towards the entrance. Seven o'clock in the evening, dusk was encroaching on the landscape. In the distance, a ribbon of leaden clouds stretched across the horizon. Carter knew he was in the shit. No other reason why Greening had reached out to him directly. I don't know what I've done wrong this time, he thought, but it seems I can't set foot in camp these days without pissing someone off. He took a deep breath and stepped inside the bar. The decor looked like something out of a documentary about the Cray Twins. Cigarette burns on the frayed carpet, velvet padded stools, dark wood panelling, and chipped furniture. A stench of stale beer hung in the air so thick you could probably get hammered on it. A flat-screen TV fixed to one wall showed the rugby highlights. A handful of punters sat at the bar. Old men with bloated faces and packets of rolling backy, sipping cheap beers while they scanned the betting tips in the red tops. How the owners stayed in business was a mystery to Carter, up there with the Bermuda Triangle and the appeal of social media. Carter scanned the faces of the drinkers and caught sight of Greening at a table at the back, sipping a pint of Guinness. 
Two people were sitting opposite Greening, their backs to Carter, a man and a woman. Carter beelined for the table and wondered what the fuck was going on. Greening rose to greet him. The Regiment 2IC was crisply dressed in a barber jacket, polo shirt, dark jeans and desert boots. His hair was the texture of steel filaments. His bushy eyebrows slanted downward at an angle so that they formed a distinctive V above the bridge of his nose. He was in good shape for his age, trim and honed. The skin was pulled so tight over his face, it looked like it might snap. Geordie, thanks for joining us, Greening said. They shook hands. This is Alex Maitland, he continued, gesturing towards the woman. She's with five. Carter looked the MI5 officer up and down. A black woman in her mid-thirties, with scraped-back brown hair and a high-cheekboned face, angling down towards blood-red lips. She wore flared trousers and blazer over a plain white work shirt. From a mid-range high street chain, probably. A salary as a five officer wouldn't stretch to anything more luxurious. She had a delicate manner, but Carter sensed there was an underlying steeliness to her, as if she had been built from some seemingly fragile but unbreakable material. Pleased to meet you, Maitland said, in a voice that could have come from anywhere in the home counties. Greening waved a hand at the guy next to Maitland, a flabby white bloke in a bin liner suit. He looked about a decade older than Maitland and about fifty kilos heavier. A few wispy strands of greying hair were raked over his otherwise balding pate. Mark Sutton, Greening said by way of introduction. From our friends over at the National Crime Agency. Mark is with the Organised Crime Command. Mark, this is Geordie. Sutton nodded a greeting. All right, fella. Carter blanked him and looked questioningly at Greening. What the fuck is going on, Phil? Take a seat, Geordie. Get you a drink, beer, coke? Carter shook his head. I'm fine. Suit yourself? Carter took the empty chair next to the regiment major and racked his brains, trying to figure out what he could have possibly done to draw the ire of the security services and the police. Greening set his Guinness down, rested his meaty hands in his lap. How are you finding life in G Squadron? he asked. Fine, Carter replied impatiently, but I've only been there about five minutes. In the tail of his eye, he noticed both Maitland and Sutton watching him closely. And the other lads? You're getting on well with them? I guess so. What's this about, Phil? Carter had a visceral dislike of polite chat. He preferred to drop the bullshit and get straight to the point. Maitland said, Have you heard of a group calling themselves the Steel Reapers? Doesn't ring any bells. Why? It's a motorcycle club operating within the SAS, Maitland said. Membership is restricted to serving soldiers. It's a small group, no more than a couple of dozen members. Including several of your new friends in the air troop, Greening put in. We know that Steve Duncan and Eddie Rigg are definitely part of the club. Possibly Brad Hickey, along with several other lads. Duncan is one of the founding members, actually. Good for him, Maitland said. The Reapers are run like a proper bikers club. There's a sergeant of arms, a president, a clubhouse. New prospects have to swear an oath before they get badged, and they don't ever discuss their activities with outsiders, sort of like the Freemasons, which is why you've never heard of them. They might sound like a crap heavy metal band, said Sutton, but don't be fooled, they're a dangerous bunch of lads. Carter glanced at the NCA officer. He had the deflated look of a guy who had never made it higher than the lower rungs of his profession and knew it was all downhill from now on. He quickly decided that Maitland was the more senior of the two, a young woman on the up, a future director general at Thames House, possibly. How so? Carter asked. Maitland said, We have reason to believe that the Reapers are involved with known criminal elements operating inside the UK. Specifically, a motorcycle club with suspected links to organised crime. They call themselves the Blood Kings. Carter tensed. A hollow feeling spread through his chest. Doing what? Fencing stolen goods, Sutton said. That's one aspect of it, but
but it's possible that they might be caught up in a bunch of other stuff too. Drug trafficking, extortion, murder. Jesus Christ. He knew that some of the guys at Hereford were mad about their motorbikes, and there had been rumours that several of them had formed an unofficial club. Carter had always assumed they spent their downtime fixing up their vintage two-wheelers and cutting around country lanes in their bike leathers. But he'd never imagined that they would be associating with organised crime figures. He shook his head. Are you sure about this? We have a source in the Kings, Sutton responded. In the Plymouth chapter, a UC. Greening said, A UC is... I know what it means. You've got an undercover cop on the inside. Go on. Sutton cleared his throat and said, Our UC tipped us off about a big deal the Kings had lined up. What kind of deal? Cash, in exchange for ammunition. Specifically, 600 rounds of 9x19mm parabellum. Obviously, the scale of the deal sounded alarm bells, Maitland said. A typical street-level sale might involve 20 or 30 rounds at most, often a lot less. Getting hold of that much ammunition is beyond the reach of most ordinary criminals. Sutton said, We put surveillance on the sellers. Had our people track them from the RV. And? They tailed the sellers all the way back here, to Creddenhill. Shit. Greening coughed and said, Of course, we don't know the full extent of the relationship. Could just be one or two bad apples in the troop. Perhaps they allowed themselves to get mixed up with the wrong crowd. Happened before, unfortunately. Maitland gave him a look and said, The kings are notorious. They're active on the continent and in North America too. Several of their members are wanted in connection with crimes ranging from kidnapping to manslaughter. You don't strike up a casual friendship with these guys, not without knowing who they are and what they do for a living. Plus there's the money, Sutton added. Carter crinkled his brow. What money? Duncan and his biker buddies snapped up a place a few miles up the road from the camp about a year ago. They've paid for all the building work in cash, tens of thousands of pounds. Carter shrugged. Maybe Steve won the lottery or came into a tidy inheritance. Sutton stared at him. Maitland said, Cards on the table. Your friends are up to their necks in trouble. They're not my mates. Christ, it's not even my squadron. Well, that's as may be, but we have evidence of SAS personnel conspiring to sell stolen ammunition to the kings and large unexplained sums of cash. And we know that the Reapers have a pre-existing relationship with the Plymouth chapter, which is deeply concerning on several levels. It raises the question of what the soldiers are getting in return. You think they're selling more than Amor? We're dealing with highly skilled soldiers with years of special forces training. Flogging stolen equipment is bad, obviously, but it's not the only service they have to offer. For all we know, they might be instructing the kings, teaching them surveillance tactics, weapons training, eavesdropping techniques, helping to plan the murders of rivals, maybe even executing them. Pure speculation, of course, Greening cut in. The truth is, we simply don't know. How long has this been going on? Carter asked. Sutton said, We think it goes back to Iraq. At the time, Duncan and some of the veterans in air troop were suspected of looting valuables when they were going out on raids each night. Jewellery, gold bars, cash, weapons, trinkets, anything they could take with them that might fetch a good price on the black market. Carter considered. He'd taken part in loads of door-kicking ops in Iraq back when the regiment had been going toe-to-toe -to -toe with terrorist cells in the country. Each night, his strike team had gone out on multiple raids, swooping in to lift one suspect before piling straight back into the chopper to execute the next mission, counterinsurgency on steroids. Some of the targets had been high-ranking figures under the old regime and had enriched themselves accordingly. Carter had never personally witnessed anyone on his team taking a five-finger discount from the buildings they'd busted. But then again, he hadn't paid much attention to his mates. He'd been too busy trying to stay alive. Smuggling the loot back to Hereford would have been easy enough, Sutton carried on. They might have hidden it in their baggage, or in the vehicles. But the big problem these days is banking the money. 
You can't stroll into your local Lloyd's and pay in two hundred grand in cash, not without HMRC taking a keen interest in your affairs. That's where the kings came in. Maitland said, "We could never prove anything, but we think Duncan was the original point of contact. He and the Plymouth chapter president go way back, according to the UC." Carter said, "What about the door? If the lads are bent, they'll have stashed the money somewhere. So where is it?" Sutton squirmed. "We're not entirely sure. Have you checked the squadron fund?" Each SAS squadron, Carter knew, had its own individual fund for organizing stuff like Christmas parties and refurbishments. Most of the money came from petty fines and donations. We have, Maitland said, it's clean, three grand plus change in it. Ditto the clock tower fund. So, where's the cash? Could be anywhere. Maybe the Reapers used the biker crew's accountants to launder it for them. Might be hidden offshore. Or they might have stored it somewhere until it's safe to retrieve. Could be sitting in a storage unit in a field in Shropshire, for all we know. Sutton said, "Obviously, if we knew where to find the money, we wouldn't be sitting here now." What's any of this got to do with me? Carter asked. Maitland said, "This is a delicate situation, but the guys in the Reapers are a close-knit bunch, oath-bound never to betray their brother members, which means we're fumbling in the dark." We need to know how deep this thing really goes. Assuming the UC's claims are true, Greening said, "Our guys never let us down in the past." Sutton said bluntly. The point is, we need to get in front of this thing, Maitland said. Establish what's actually going on. That means finding out who is involved with the Kings, the exact nature of their relationship, any other illegal activity they're potentially caught up in. Sutton said. That's where you come in, pal. We want you to keep a close eye on the other men in your troop, Maitland explained. Watch what they're doing, who they're fraternizing with, anything that might help us better understand what's going on. A cynical laugh escaped Carter's throat. <laughs> Sorry, love, you're asking the wrong person. I ain't a snitch. Maitland narrowed her eyes. This isn't about being a grass. You're looking at this through the wrong end of the telescope. We're asking you to help expose a potential criminal conspiracy right at the heart of the SAS by spying on my own kind. Greening shifted uncomfortably. I know it's far from ideal, Geordie. I don't like it any more than you. But the regiment's reputation is at stake. If this got out, it would ruin us. Carter laughed bitterly. The regiment. <laughs> What did you lot ever do for me? All them years I put in, putting my balls on the line, and you bastards threw me on the scrap heap. That wasn't my decision. A realization suddenly dawned on Carter. He felt the blood boiling in his veins. That's why you transferred me to G Squadron, isn't it? So you could strong arm me into being a plant. Greening smiled apologetically. We had no choice. We couldn't approach any of the guys in the troop, or anyone else in G Squadron, because we didn't know if we could trust them. It had to be an outsider. I've read your file, Maitland interjected. You're the perfect candidate for the job. Someone with a deep sense of bitterness and enmity over the way they've been treated by their superiors, a divorcee who lives alone and struggles to make his monthly maintenance payments. Who knows? It might even encourage Duncan to bring you into his confidence. If he thinks you're desperate enough to turn to crime, Jesus, don't go overboard with the compliments. Greening said, "There is something else we can offer you, something that might be of interest." Carter looked at him, waited for the major to go on. How would you feel about becoming the new squadron sergeant major for G Squadron, Geordie? They already have one. For now. But assuming the intelligence picture is accurate, once this is over, he'll fall on his sword. Even if he isn't directly involved, the fact is, two of his men have been caught flogging ammunition to an organized crime group on his watch. That's grounds for dismissal alone. He grinned. Do this for us, and you could be the new SSM. What if you're wrong? What if it's more than just a couple of bad apples? Greening snorted. 
Assuming that these men are, in fact, guilty, they will be punished accordingly. They'll regret the day they set foot inside the camp. Carter fell silent and stared out of the grimy window. He struggled to believe what he was hearing. There had always been a few shifty characters in the ranks at Hereford, soldiers who had dabbled in crime for one reason or another. The worst offenders were usually weeded out before they could do any reputational damage. But what Maitland and Sutton were describing was something much more serious. If they were right, G Squadron was rotten to the core. He didn't give a toss about the stolen goods. Others had done much worse in the past and got away with it. The head shed had form when it came to sweeping the ugly stuff under the rug. None of his business. But rubbing shoulders with a bunch of drug dealers and killers was a different matter. Greening was right, he realized. If word got out that Britain's elite soldiers were profiting from organized crime, that might sound the death knell for the regiment. There would be a public outcry. Ministers would inevitably demand blood. Never mind that they were only able to enjoy their flat whites and craft beers because men like Carter, hard men from the roughest parts of Britain, places the rest of the country had forgotten about, were willing to get their hands dirty. The regiment has taken a battering in public lately, Greening said. No way we'd survive if this leaked to the public. You realise that, don't you? Carter thought about his younger brother. Luke had followed him into the SAS after joining the Paras as a 19-year-old. He was one of the good guys, a keen soldier with a bright future ahead of him in the regiment. Are you really going to let a few corrupt idiots destroy Luke's career? Fuck it, he said. I'm in. Good man, Greening muttered as he patted Carter on the back. This is a good thing you're doing, Geordie. The CO won't forget this. Tell him to thank me later, Carter growled. He nodded at Maitland. I'm guessing you lot are running this shore, not Tawny Soprano here, he added, gesturing towards Sutton. Maitland said, This is a joint operation between Five and the NCA, but it's been agreed that we will take the lead on this one, given the security implications. Carter nodded. What do you want me to do? For now, nothing. You'll carry on as normal, but keep your eyes peeled and your ear close to the ground. If you see anything suspicious, you are to report to us. How long for? As long as it takes, until we have sufficient evidence to understand how deep this thing goes. What about surveillance? Sutton said. We've had bugs in their homes for weeks. Car tracking. The guys at Cheltenham have been monitoring phone and internet activity ever since we learned about the ammo deal. And? And nothing. It's a dead end. No one has said or done anything incriminating. All they do is talk about rugby, beer and sex. They're probably using burner phones, Maitland said. That's our assumption. If some of them are in deep with the Blood Kings, they'd want to cover their tracks. Of course, these guys will have done their anti-surveillance training, Greening said. They won't be making any amateur mistakes, if indeed they have anything to hide. Maitland looked Carter hard in the eye. This is a dangerous undertaking. I can't stress that enough. If Duncan and his friends find out you're a plant, there's no telling what they might do. Carter laughed. <laughs> I'm a big lad. I can look after myself. I'm serious. Don't take any unnecessary risks. Don't do anything out of character, anything that might draw attention. Save your breath. I've worked for your people in the past. I know the drill. Maitland stared at him. She said, This is our best chance of exposing the Reapers. But if we slip up, if they have even the faintest suspicion that we're onto them, they'll cease their activities. Our hopes of putting a stop to them will go up in smoke. Any questions? Greening asked. How do I contact you? The Major motioned to Maitland. She dipped a hand into her jacket pocket and fished out a miniature phone, no bigger than a thumb drive, with a grey plastic case and a tiny keypad below a postage stamp-sized display. Maitland handed him the mini phone and a USB charger. The device fitted snugly in the palm of his hand and weighed no more than a pound coin. She said, Keep this on you at all times. The battery only lasts for ten hours, so it's best to keep it switched off and check in once a day for any messages. 
There's a SIM card installed with a single number in the address book. Text me if you need to request an urgent meeting. The phone runs on the old 2G network. Most carriers still operate the frequency, so you shouldn't have any problems getting a signal. Carter pocketed the phone and charger. Do you seriously think the lads in G Squadron are bent? Maitland considered the question. Then she said, Ask yourself this. If they're prepared to sell ammunition to known criminal entities, bullets that may very well be used to murder civilians or a police officer, what else might they be willing to do? Carter said nothing. He thought about the metal detector he'd seen back at the squadron hangar, six hours ago, back when he had been getting ready for a routine hard arrest, looking forward to a new start in G Squadron. He thought, too, about the thermal lances, the hydraulic jack, the big stack of explosives. The questions they had been asking at the briefing, their interest in the Russian strongroom. More like a bank raid than a hard arrest. Remember, Maitland said, watch your back. I'm serious. If you find yourself in trouble, we won't be able to help you. Chapter 4 Ten hours later, in the bleary grey light before dawn, the fourteen men of Air Troop RV'd back at the squadron hangar. Grist and Moody joined the team as they lugged their army baggage from the storage racks over to the Chinook waiting for them on the nearby helipad. The morning was damp and cold, and Carter could see his breath misting as he approached the rear of the chopper. He climbed the hydraulic loading ramp to the main cargo hold, passed the loady, and took his place next to the other soldiers on the webbing seats, his rucksack secured between his legs. At the far end of the cabin, he could see the glowing lights of the cockpit panels as the two pilots went through the usual pre-flight check, while the steady drone of the turboshaft engines filled the hold, mingling with the womp-womp of the front and rear-mounted rotor blades. Carter sat quietly in the dimly lit cabin, anxiety stirring in his guts. He had spent a restless night replaying his meeting with Greening, Maitland and Sutton, weighing up various scenarios and processing the intelligence, or rather, the int they had chosen to share with him. He had to assume they were holding some stuff back, Five's way of doing business in his experience. They shared only the information they needed to, only what they considered essential to the success of the mission. With the stolen ammunition sale, the security service had enough evidence to nail a couple of guys in the troop. If their instincts were right, Duncan, Rig, Hickey and the rest were embroiled with a band of violent criminals. Maybe they were selling guns. Maybe they were even killing guys who had crossed the Blood Kings in the past, or owed them money. It's possible that they might be caught up in a bunch of other stuff, Sutton had said. Drug trafficking? Extortion? Murder? Carter decided he had two big problems. The most immediate concern was the risk of discovery. He would have to tread carefully. If he tried befriending Steve Duncan and the other members of the Reapers, they would become suspicious, which could be fatal. Best to bide my time, Carter thought. Weird for an opportunity to present itself. Which brought him to the second problem. There was a risk that the top brass might turn him into a scapegoat. Suppose he found nothing damning. In that case, the head shed could use his report to cover themselves if the shit ever hit the fan. Don't look at us, they would protest. We ordered an investigation into these allegations. Blame our plant. He failed to do his job. Geordie Carter let us down. There was a chance that he was being set up to fail. Those who made it to the top of the regimental pyramid were politically ruthless. They wouldn't hesitate to shaft someone else if it meant saving their own asses. Even an ex-ranker and Hereford legend like Phil Greening. But he was sure of one thing. There would be zero chance of the guys going to jail. The regiment hated airing its dirty laundry in public. Moreover, Whitehall would be desperate to avoid the ugly spectacle of serving SAS men taking the stand at the Old Bailey. Duncan and the others would be dealt with behind closed doors, he guessed, dismissed from the regiment on some bullshit pretext, losing an army radio or some other minor breach of protocol. The last soldiers boarded the Chinook. The loadmaster signalled to the pilots, 
the rear ramp raised to the closed position, entombing the passengers in the cabin. The blades increased to a deafening scream, and there was a sudden lurch as the chopper lifted off the ground. A few minutes later, they were pitching forward across the dawn landscape. The ride to the RAF base at Bryce Norton took twenty minutes. The engine dialed down to a dull whir, the ramp lowered, the men piled out of the Chinook, and there was a swift transfer to an A400M Atlas military transport aircraft waiting for them on the tarmac stand. A slick-looking airlifter with propellers shaped like scimitars, the replacement for the old Hercules C-130. Faster than the Herc, able to carry a much heavier cargo across a greater range, but not much more comfortable from a passenger's point of view. There was a row of canvas seats fixed to either side of the fuselage, a loadmaster's station, some luggage racks, and not much else. They were buckled up and in the air in less than five minutes. A smooth operation, every part of the machinery running like clockwork. The British military at its finest. There were times when Carter could look past the bullshit and take pride in being a soldier, but increasingly he found himself at odds with the institution. He hated the office politics and the cronyism, the shameless opportunism. Maybe I'm better off out of it, he thought. Perhaps it's time to jack it in. Tell the bastards I'm not interested in selling out my mates and quit Hereford for good. Carter had given his life to the regiment. In return, they had shafted him, turned him into an outcast. In his naivety, he had assumed that being a committed soldier would protect him from his enemies inside Hereford. He had been wrong. He'd learned the hard way that only those prepared to play the game thrived in the snake pit of regimental politics. He'd seen officers writing up their own citations during ops in Iraq, painting themselves in the best possible light to ensure they received a medal at the end of it. He'd seen one Rupert putting a couple of rounds in a severely wounded insurgent during a Baghdad house raid so that he could claim the credit for slotting the guy. Junior officers had led their teams on pointless missions in the hunt for glory, recklessly endangering the lives of good men. His brother had found it much easier to adapt to life in the SAS, but Luke had always been an easy-going kid. At school, he had been universally popular, in a way that had eluded Jamie. Luke's friendly nature and no-nonsense attitude had allowed him to flourish at Hereford without getting sucked into the political vortex that chewed up and spat out so many capable soldiers. Jamie Carter hadn't been so fortunate. His few friends had cautioned him, told him to look the other way. He'd ignored their advice and called out those who put their own interests ahead of the unit. He had been paying the price for it ever since. Now he'd reached the end game, the last days of his career as a blade. But as much as he hated some aspects of the regiment, he dreaded having to leave. He remembered the advice he'd been given by an old colleague in D Squadron. When you're in the regiment, you're a hero, the guy had said. Everyone wants a piece of you. But when you leave, you're a nobody. All of a sudden, no one gives a shit about you anymore. Fifty-nine minutes later, they touched down in Germany. Ramstein Air Base had been built in the early days of the Cold War on an area of swampland on the western side of the Rhine. The previous year, it had been the stopover point to process the mass exodus of refugees from Afghanistan. Now it functioned as the forward operating base for US and UK SF missions in Ukraine. On the main tarmac apron, teams were directing armoured vehicles and pallets of equipment onto the back of a pair of waiting Hercules C-130 transport craft. Other planes were being refuelled or attended to by teams of mechanics. The relentless grind of the military machine. In the distance, scraps of mist clung to the peaks of low wooded hills. A short, grizzled-looking soldier in his fifties greeted them. He looked like a private school rugby teacher. Short dark hair, hands like a pair of JCB buckets, face with more cracks in it than a code-breaking manual. Sergeant Major Mike Beatty was one of the regiment lifers. Twenty-plus years of service probably earned his winged dagger beret back in the days of the Black Death. Carter had seen him around the camp a few times in the past, dishing out bollockings to the young crows. He had been dispatched to Ramstein on a two-year posting as the local coordinator, overseeing the day-to-day -day operation of the Reg contingent. 
BT swaggered over, carrying himself like he owned the place, which he did, in a way. All right, fellas, good flight. Yeah, cracking, Farrell deadpanned. Top quality service, I'm never flying business class again. BT stared at him, not getting the joke, then nodded at Duncan. We've got you set up inside. He flapped a hand in the direction of a massive hangar situated on the far side of the apron. This way, I'll give you the grand tour. He started towards the hangar at a brisk pace. Carter, Farrell, and the rest of the men in air troop hefted up their rucksacks and followed him across the rain-greased tarmac. They swept past the duty guard and stepped inside a space as big as a football pitch, divided into several areas. On the left side of the hangar, a bunch of prefabricated modular units had been stacked on top of one another, like Lego bricks. Stairs led from the ground floor to a series of heavy-duty gantries, providing access to the upper tier. Dos block, Beatty said. Ablutions in the unit next door. Hangar is fully secure. Guards on duty 24-7. No fucker gets in here without the proper clearance. He pointed towards a row of windowless steel-framed units on the far side of the hangar. Planning section. Soundproofed with secured locks on the doors. You're in briefing room four. Here, you'll need this. Beatty plucked out a white plastic keycard from his pocket and passed it to Duncan. The card only works on the door to your allocated room. What about the scalies? asked Duncan. The sergeant major gestured towards several units in another part of the hangar. Signalers are set up over there. Their kit is rigged up to satellites and radio antennas, encrypted comms with GCHQ. Beatty indicated the other areas of the hangar. There was a cookhouse, a makeshift gym with free weights and treadmills, a kitchen, a cordoned-off space for storing kit, and a breakout area where guys could grab a brew and watch the news on the pancake flat TV plus a separate accommodation block for the air crews. The place was a whirlwind of activity. Dozens of regiment operators went about their business, scoffing down food in the canteen, busting out sets on the bench presses, or packing kit. A few sat around chatting or watching films on their laptops. Carter noticed some familiar faces from D Squadron among them, his old team. None of them paid the new arrivals any attention. Everyone minded their own business which was as it should be. I'm based off-site, Beatty said, but there's a permanent staff here at all times, clerks plus the guards. If you can't get hold of me, they should be able to help you. Any questions? Where can we grab a pint later? asked Farrell. Nowhere. The rest of the base is strictly off-limits. You're not to leave the hangar under any circumstances. Duncan said, We're on a fifteen-minute standby anyway. The beers will have to wait till we're back home. Hickey chewed on his backy and grinned. Guess you'll have to stick to the orange juice for now, Tom. Farrell shot him a savage look. Shouldn't you be hanging out with the Delta lads in the next hangar, swapping QAnon theories? Fuck off. Sec puffed out his cheeks. Let's hope they're showing the rugger on the telly, boys. Otherwise we're going to have to pass the time listening to more of Tom's crap jokes. Right, you lot. Duncan said. Drop your bags and grab some scran. We'll RV in the briefing room in an hour. Chapter 5 At exactly ten o'clock, the team filed into the shipping container-sized unit that would function as their base of operations during their stay at Ramstein. There was a long table in the middle of the room, ringed by twenty chairs, and more hardware than a branch of curries. There were laptops and tablets, a secure landline, several mobile devices, a tangle of hosepipe-thick black coax cables, four computer screens so big they could double up as snooker tables. The guys took their respective places. All fourteen men from Air Troop were present, plus Moody, the communicator from 18 Signals, who had travelled with them from Hereford, and Lyndon Grist, the regiment int officer. Between them, they would coordinate the surveillance and eavesdropping during the operation, to snatch Denis Gorchakov. The ops officer Smallwood had stayed behind in Hereford, but would oversee the operation remotely. Duncan kicked off proceedings. First things first, we'll have to draw up immediate action plans, 
one for each stronghold, he began. The fuck do we need to do that for, Chief? Hickey questioned. The layouts are all the same, aren't they? One plan's all we need. Duncan shook his head. The approaches will be different. Getaway routes, flight paths, all of that malarkey. There will be subtle but important variations in the plans. Look, I know it's a royal fucking pain in the arse, but that's the way it is. What about the building designs? Have we got blueprints? Duncan said. Our friends at Six pinged them over a while ago. Architectural diagrams, mapping, and so on. Satellite imagery? On its way from the Americans. Taking some time to get it ready, as always, but should be with us in a few hours. There is a team of suits at Vauxhall working to supply us with more information as and when they receive it. We'll need to know every single thing about them buildings, said Farrell. Thickness of the glass on the windows, locking systems, panic buttons, the works. Duncan said, Desk jockeys are already on it. They're checking the latest footage to see how the stronghold's illuminated at night too, so we'll know where to find the dead ground when we fly in. Hickey took off his baseball cap, mussed his matted hair and placed it back on his head again. What's the deal with the assault, Chief? We'll split into two teams, said Duncan. An assault team will make the hard arrest, second team will establish a cordon outside the stronghold, six lads to guard the outside, eight on the assault group. Carter wrinkled his brow. That's a bit fucking much. We should divide them teams equally, seven lads on each. A harsh look flashed in Duncan's pale eyes. Are you questioning my judgment? Carter shrugged his shoulders and said, I just don't see why we need so many guys inside. That int we've got suggests the bulk of the BGs will be patrolling the grounds. That's where the firefight will be, if there is one. Duncan shot him a look that could cut through a block of ice. That is the way we're doing it. End of. Carter started to argue his point, then cut himself short. Duncan returned his piercing gaze to the other lads and carried on outlining the plan. Both groups will go in by chopper and debus right on top of the target, he said. The lads on the assault team will breach the stronghold at the designated entry points and go in to make the hard arrest. Meanwhile, the cordon team will set up a defensive perimeter in the ground and deal with any guards in the vicinity. If they surrender, secure them with plastic cuffs. If they show any signs of force, you have authorization to neutralize them. I'll be leading the assault group into the stronghold. Duncan went on. Geordie, you're too IC, so that means you're in charge of the cordon. Try not to fuck this one up, eh? Polite laughter rippled through the room. Carter stared at him, his muscles tensed with anger. Duncan stared back, daring Carter to defy him. That all right with you, Geordie? Or have you got a problem with that as well? Carter pursed his lips. He knew that Duncan was deliberately giving him the shitty end of the stick by putting him on the perimeter instead of the assault force. But there was no point contesting the decision, he told himself, partly because it was sound tactics to keep your commanding officer and your deputy on different teams. That way, if one group of lads ran into trouble, the two IC would be instantly available to take command. Besides, if he tried angling for a place on the assault team, some of his colleagues might start to question his motives. He remembered Maitland's warning back at the King's Arms. Don't take any unnecessary risks, she had said. Don't do anything out of character, anything that might draw attention. Nor mate, he replied. That works for me. Farrell feigned a look of surprise. Fuck me sideways, Geordie Carter not questioning orders. That's a first. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'll need a double Jameson's after that. The men seated either side of Carter erupted into laughter, easing the tension in the room. The noise subsided, and then Duncan pointed to a detailed map of Poland on one of the screens. He said, Once we have confirmation of the target location, we'll board the Blackhawks and head across the border, stopping to refuel here at Gornica Air Base. He tapped a finger, indicating a spot in western Poland, a few miles due east of the German border. The base is manned by a detachment of RAF personnel, so they'll be expecting us. Then it's straight back in the air and onto target. Farrell said, 
What about the return trip? Same routine. Where are the strongholds exactly? asked Rig. The nearest one is twenty minutes by bird from Gornica, that stronghold Alpha. Delta is the furthest, fifty-five minutes from the FOB to the target. Once we're on site, we'll secure the area, apprehend the target, and scour the place for int. We'll need to conduct a full sweep from top to bottom, grab everything we can get our hands on. Maybe we should just break into all of them houses, Sek joked. Make sure we don't miss out on any valuable int. Yeah, a thorough sweep, Hickey chuckled. He winked at the big Fijian. The pair of them exchanged a knowing look and grinned, as if they were in on a private joke. The team proceeded to discuss detailed planning for each stronghold. They covered actions on, establishing what to do if the choppers went down, marking emergency RVs and rallying points. They studied the grounds of each compound, looking for ideal landing zones, measuring how far the assault group would have to run from the Blackhawks to the target. They checked and noted down the distances to the nearest police stations in the area and the locations of any friendly forces. What if someone raises the alarm? Sek asked. Two of the homes are only a few minutes from the local police stations. They might rock up before we have a chance to get out. Moody said, One of you will be carrying a barrage, Jammer. Works like the countermeasure Chevrolet in the US presidential motorcade. As soon as you activate it, anyone in the area trying to use a phone or computer will find that the signal has dropped. That'll stop anyone from putting in a call to the Polish police. They went through the rest of the plan. When they had finished, they walked through it again, so that everyone understood what they were doing. Carter was impressed with the way the lads applied themselves. They were switched on, dedicated soldiers. He found it hard to imagine that they were caught up in anything seriously dodgy. One or two of them, perhaps, but that was no different to any of the other squadrons. Perhaps they allowed themselves to get mixed up with the wrong crowd, Greening had said. It's happened before. Which was true enough. He'd known some shady characters during his time in D-Squadron. Guys who had been caught with their hands in the till. That sort of activity had been going on for almost as long as the SAS had been in existence. Could these guys really be corrupt? Carter asked himself. He honestly didn't know. They took a short break, and then they turned their attention to the house assault. Rooms were mapped out. Floors allocated to different members of the attack team. They looked at entry and exit points, breaching methods, identified the most likely hiding spots for the target. They wanted to leave nothing to chance. Once they landed, they were going to be on the clock. They couldn't afford to get bogged down dealing with unexpected problems. At the same time, Farrell and Sek examined the plans for dead spots. The pair of them stared at the layout of the basement with puckered brows. What the fuck is that? Sek wondered out loud, tapping a finger against a boxed-in area. Farrell squinted at it. Void for a chimney, maybe? Can't be, Sek replied. It's only on this floor, nothing above it or below. Well, it sure as shit ain't the plant room. That's over to the right, fella. Sek grinned. Mark it up? Point of interest? Aye, definitely, Farrell replied lips parting into a crafty smile. A short time later, Rig said, What's the crack with the strong rooms? That's a question for Lyndon, Duncan replied. He nodded at Grist. Well? Six has been looking into it, Grist said. They've obtained the plans from the company that installed the rooms. Same specs at all four homes. Emergency power supply, plumbing and ventilation. Reinforced steel door. Biometric locking system. Walls? Galvanized metal, six inches thick. Easier to cut our way through the door, mused Hickey, if we have to. Panic button? asked Rig. Grist nodded. As far as we know, all the rooms have a secure connection to the local police station. Response time? asked Rig. Between seven and twelve minutes, depending on the distance from each station to the relevant compound. Any other hiding spots that aren't on the blueprints? Hidden doors? Safes? Not to our knowledge. We've walked through the layout with the maid. She's adamant that Gorchakov hasn't made any structural changes to the building since they were constructed. 
but it's possible that he might have a secret hiding place his household staff don't know about. Carter had been poring over the architectural plans while the others had been talking. He looked up and said, Those strong rooms are all the way up on the third floor. Rig looked towards him. Yeah, so? There's nothing else of interest up there, according to these drawings. Just some storage areas and spare rooms. All the main living and sleeping quarters are on the lower floors. What's your point, Geordie? Carter said. The target will be closer to the ground floor exits than the strong room. It's more likely he'll leg it in that direction. Why would he head to the third floor? He'd be trapping himself. No, mate. Tech cut in. He nodded at the satellite imagery on the screens. There's nothing for miles near any of the compounds. Arse end of nowhere. Where would he go? There's the garage, Carter pointed out. He's got a fleet of classic cars stored at each compound. He could easily jump in one of them and make a getaway. He might, but he wouldn't get very far, as long as you lot outside do your fucking job. Carter said tetchily, It's a waste of time focusing on the strong room. He's not going to be hiding in there. Rig stared at him, face contorted with anger. Since when were you the expert on making hard arrests? Last time I checked, you spent the last six months out on your arse, twiddling your thumbs while us lot were doing the business. Carter glowered at him. He opened his mouth to reply, but then Duncan came between them, acting the role of peacemaker, his hands raised in a placatory gesture. Easy, fellas, he said, breaking the silence. Calm down, the pair of you. We're all on the same team here. Jordy, I know you're keen to do a good job and make an impression, seeing as you're with the big boys now. Duncan grinned. We've got one chance at nabbing the target, the Scotsman continued. But if we're too busy sniping at each other, we'll get nowhere. Focus on your individual responsibilities, and let's make sure we bring that bastard home with us. Then we can get the beers in and celebrate. The briefing continued throughout the rest of the afternoon. Moody updated them on the eavesdropping and surveillance ops. They had a team monitoring Gorchakov's luxury jet, he said which at that moment was sitting on the ground in a private hangar at Geneva Airport. They had specialists monitoring the chatter on the accounts held by the Russian. New satellite images were periodically downloaded to their laptops. Nothing was being left to chance. Rig and Sec kept circling back round to the strong rooms. They wanted to know how long it would take to exit each building from that room, how long to cut through the door with the thermal lance, the manufacturer of the biometric locking systems, what they were likely to find inside. They were very interested in those rooms, down to the tiniest detail. Carter wondered about that. He thought again about the thermal lances, the frame charges, the metal detector. He thought, too, about Duncan's decision to stick him on the cordon team. Maybe it wasn't a tactical move. Maybe there was another reason for wanting to keep him outside the stronghold. But he had nothing concrete, no hard evidence of wrongdoing. No smoking gun. In the late afternoon, Duncan called an end to the briefing. They left the secure unit and spent a short time organising their kit. Helmets, breaching devices and plate armour were dumped in the taped-off area at the rear of the hangar, ready to snatch up at a moment's notice, along with several collapsible North Face rucksacks. What do we need them for? Carter asked Duncan. Why the fuck do you think? Duncan snapped. To scoop up any int we come across, you daft prick. A short time later, they made their way over to the cookhouse and scoffed down the greasy portions of food served up by the slop jockeys. Then it was a question of waiting until they got the heads up from the signalers, which could come at any time, Moody had told them. Could be an hour or two. Could be a couple of days. Impossible to tell. Several of the lads from the other reg teams mingled with the new arrivals. Carter caught up with a couple of old mates from D Squadron. Conversation was strictly superficial. No one asked why he had been transferred to G Squadron, or what his new troop was doing at Ramstein. None of their business. And they had their own workloads to tackle. They didn't give away any details about their ops, but Carter could take a guess. Training packages, teaching the Ukrainians how to fight, how to handle specific weaponry. 
close protection jobs for high-profile officials. His own brother had been posted to Kiev some months back, had probably passed through Ramstein on his way east, Carter guessed. He watched the rolling news on the TV in the breakout area. There was a lot of stuff on the economy. Inflation was going up, sterling was going down, energy bills were going to cost more than the Apollo space program. There was some stuff about the US elections and the spectre of a comeback by the former president. The war in Ukraine had been pushed down the agenda. War fatigue. People could only tolerate hearing about mass death and destruction for so long before they tuned out. There was a short item about an attack on a military installation in Crimea. Dozens of Russian soldiers had been killed, vehicles obliterated. No one had claimed credit for the explosions, but the direction of travel was clear. The momentum was with Ukraine's forces. The Russians were retreating, ceding territory, abandoning conquered towns. The pro-Kremlin mayor of one eastern city had been shot dead in the street. The newsroom cut away to an official ceremony in Kiev. The Ukrainian president was awarding a medal to one of his generals. Voloshin was decked out in his trademark military shirt and khakis. The general was in standard uniform. He was lean and slender, with hair the colour of wood ash, and a face that looked as if someone had chiselled it out of a block of granite. His nostrils were so wide you could plough snow with them. An eye patch covered his left socket. The two men shook hands and smiled for the cameras, and then the commander made a short speech to the gathered dignitaries. The caption at the bottom of the screen gave his name as General Viktor Koltrov. Our soldiers are doing something no one else thought possible, the dubbed voice translated into English. They have made a stand against tyranny and oppression. They have shown that they are willing to fight, to die, for their freedom. All the world should remember this. When the invader sought to crush us, when others predicted disaster and defeat, our warriors refused to cower. They met the enemy head-on, with courage and determination. Now we are forging a new chapter in our glorious history. The general looked straight into the camera as he continued. Soon, the day will come when the last Russian tank is driven back across the border. This evil will not win. The toil and sacrifice of our soldiers will not be in vain, my friends. We will achieve total victory, so that the soil runs thick with the blood of the dead occupiers. Glory to Ukraine. General Kolchov punched the air, drawing a raucous cheer from the audience. There was something in the way he carried himself that reminded Carter of a hawk. Wish we had someone like that running the show back home, Farrell remarked. Carter looked round at him in surprise. Who? This bloke? Sure, why not? Farrell tipped his head at the figure with the eye patch. Koltrov is the real deal, so they say. Liberator of Kharkiv, a proper commander. Not like them pricks we've got in the head shed. Carter snorted his contempt. He's a Rupert. They're all the same, mate. In it for themselves. Farrell shrugged. At least he's not conducting the war from behind the safety of a desk. You've got to give him credit for that. Doing his job doesn't make him a hero. Maybe not. But how many of our generals would do the same thing if they were in his boots? Ask yourself that. Fair enough, Carter conceded. But it doesn't make a scrap of difference what this guy does. It'll come down to the guys on the ground, at the tip of the spear, and the quality of training and kit, like it always does. Ruperts don't win wars. They can sure as shit lose them, though. Carter laughed. <laughs> True. Farrell said, You mark my words. This guy is going places. They say he's in line to be the next president. Not if this thing goes nuclear. There won't be a country to rule over, then. Farrell puffed his cheeks and exhaled. Jesus, you're a depressing bastard sometimes. Thought you Geordies were supposed to be all about the banter. Carter laughed dryly. You've been watching too many reality shows, mate. We don't all eat at Greg's either. The hours ticked by. The team spent most of their time in the briefing room, continually refining the plan as a steady stream of information flowed in from Vauxhall, Cheltenham and Washington. When they weren't fine-tuning the house assault, they dust in their bunks or streamed TV shows on Netflix.
Hickey beasted himself on the weights. Sec watched the rugby and gulped down gargantuan quantities of coffee. Duncan sat in a corner with Beatty, the pair of them chatting in muted voices. Carter buried himself in a new history of the Vietnam War. The men were used to the routine. Waiting was ingrained into their DNA. One of the first things you learned when soldiering in 2-2 SAS? You had to be prepared to sometimes lie in an OP for days on end, living on cold rations and staying mentally alert, watching for an enemy that might never show. A few days in a hangar with a cosy bed, warm food and entertainment wasn't exactly a hardship. Thirty-seven hours after they had arrived at Ramstein, Duncan summoned the troop back to briefing room four. Moody and Grist were sitting at one end of the table, amid a clutter of laptops, computer cables, notepads and paper coffee cups, like students pulling an all-nighter. We just got word from Cheltenham, Grist said. Gorchakov's jet took off from Geneva half an hour ago. What's the flight path? asked Rig. They're bound for a private airfield at Sabotka, which is equidistant between strongholds Bravo and Delta. So we could be heading to either one of those places, Rig said. Correct. How long until we know for sure? asked Sek. The jet is due to land at Sabotka in an hour, eleven o'clock local time. Once he gets in, we'll have to wait until he logs on or uses the landline before we know which stronghold to hit. Moody said, there's no mobile coverage at either location, so we can be fairly sure he'll be leaving a digital footprint shortly after he's through the front door, even if it's just to check his email. Carter looked at the map on one of the big screens. Bravo and Delta strongholds were both situated in Lower Silesia, the southwestern corner of Poland. Bravo was 20 kilometres due south of the airfield at Sobotka. Delta was about the same distance to the east. Nothing to suggest Gorchakov would favour one site over the other. A 50-50 call, like a coin toss. Duncan said, Get some rest. Could be a while before we get confirmation. The Scalies will wake you as soon as they have more news. Some of the guys returned to their bunks in the accommodation block. Most didn't sleep. The mood among them had subtly changed. Action was imminent. Any moment now, they would get the signal to go in. Months of planning would come down to a few minutes on the ground, kicking in doors and getting the job done. Carter knocked back black coffee and tried to concentrate on his book. He was reading about the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. 14,000 French soldiers against 80,000 revolutionaries under Ho Chi Minh. The last days of French Indochina. Eleven o'clock came and went. Three hours later, the call went up from Moody and the men assembled once more in the harshly lit briefing room. Moody looked like he hadn't slept in a month. Grist paced up and down the room, his phone clamped to his ear, talking in a low voice to the person on the other end of the line. The last soldiers filed inside. Duncan shut the door, and then Grist terminated the call and said, We've just had the green light from Vauxhall. Where's the target at? asked Duncan. Site Bravo, Grist said, south of Sobotka. We're sure? Moody nodded. GCHQ has a match on Gorchakov's voice. He's made multiple calls from the landline. Plus we have internet activity from three different devices at the same location. Phone, TV, computer. At two o'clock in the morning? Hickey pulled a face. What's the guy doing, watching porn? He's a money man. Grist explained. They're slaves to the stock markets, probably monitoring his investments in Hong Kong. Duncan levered himself out of his chair and said, Right, lads, the mission is go. Grab your kit. We're moving out immediately. Chapter 6 The journey east took them a little over two hours, through a pitch-black landscape studded with clusters of apricot light. Like constellations in a night sky, Duncan, Carter, Rig and Sec rode on one of the UH-60 Blackhawks. Hickey, Farrell and the rest of the troop were close behind in the second chopper. Both Moody and Grist had stayed behind at Ramstein to remotely coordinate the intelligence and comm sides of the op, with Six and GCHQ feeding through any new information 
to the men in air troop as and when they received it. The soldiers were packing all the necessary kit for a door-kicking op, suppressed L-119A2s, ballistic helmets, plate hangers, pistols and grenades, NVGs, personal radios. The designated entry team had their specialist breaching equipment, shaped charges, thermal lances, hydraulic jigs. Each man also carried a series of scribbled notes, indicating the direction to the compound from the landing zone at all four sites, so they wouldn't have to waste precious seconds orientating themselves when they hit the ground. There was a brief stopover at Gornica to refuel the Blackhawks. To avoid suspicion, the local Polish commanders had been told that the guys were taking part in a training mission in support of Ukrainian troops. The birds were on the ground for less than five minutes. Then they were back in the air and racing south towards Site Bravo, a distance of approximately 150 kilometers from Gornica, 45 minutes to target. We'll be dropping out of the Black Hawk at around five o'clock in the morning, Carter calculated. Then we'll give Gorchakov the wake-up call of his life. They screamed south across the pre-dawn terrain in near darkness. The lights inside the cabin had been turned off. Both pilots and the Lodi had switched to their NVGs. So had the assault team. They would keep their NVGs lowered until they were almost on top of the target location. If the grounds were suitably well illuminated, they would flip up their goggles and switch to their natural night vision instead. As they closed in on the target, Carter checked his rifle one last time, making sure he had a round in the snout, ready to discharge as soon as he dropped out of the Black Hawk. He did the same for his holstered Glock, the pre-assault routine, like a football player in the dressing room before a big game. Then he looked up and noticed the others. Rig and Farrell were inspecting the lances. Sec was sorting out his lock-picking kit. Hickey popped a wad of chewing tobacco into his mouth, gripping his metal detector tightly. No one paid any attention to their weapons. They seemed more preoccupied with their breaching gear, which struck Carter as odd. Rule number one when you were going into a potential firefight, double-check your hardware. No blade wanted to get the dreaded dead man's click when the enemy was bearing down on them from twenty meters away but these guys were apparently more concerned with their door jigs and shaped charges than the chances of suffering a stoppage. At 4.30 in the morning, Duncan announced they would have to make an unscheduled stop. Traffic had been detected at Site Delta. Someone was using the landline. Vauxhall had ordered them to wait until they had looked into it. There was a possibility that the target had left Bravo and made the short trip east to the Delta stronghold. The pilots set down the Blackhawks in a field several miles due north of Sobotka, while the team waited in tense silence for further updates. Time slowed to a crawl. Five minutes passed, then six, then seven. Then Moody came back over the comms and confirmed that the target was definitely at Bravo. The activity at Delta was a false alarm, he said. Apparently the gardener had been using the landline to call his wife. Twenty minutes later, as the first fiery streaks of daylight glowed near the horizon, the pilot's voice crackled over the comms channel. Five minutes out. The men waited. Hickey chewed his wad of tobacco aggressively. Sec checked his shaped charges. Three minutes out, the pilot said. In the gathering dawn, a thousand metres below, Carter could see the barren Polish countryside a sprawl of stubbled fields, farmhouses and woodland. One minute out, the pilot said, and then, outside of the house is lit up. Don't worry about that, Duncan replied. Just get us onto the target. The men flipped their NVGs up. No need to use them on the op, not with the grounds lit up like a Christmas tree. They would only need their goggles if the power was cut during the raid and the estate was plunged into darkness. The loadmaster stood beside the side door, scanning the gloom below, and communicating with the pilots as the Black Hawk began its swift descent. There was a sudden jolt as the landing gears touched the ground, and then the Lodi gave the signal and the passengers snatched up their kit and spilled out of the side of the chopper. Carter pushed forward and swept his eyes across the ground, the grass swishing beneath the downwash. 
they had landed right on top of the designated LZ in the palatial gardens at the front of Gorchakov's estate. Fifty metres to the north stood the mansion itself, a three-storey mock Georgian structure with a porticoed entrance topped with an ornate pediment and pointed roof turrets projecting from the corners. Like something out of a fairy tale. The lights were on in several of the ground floor windows, but the upper stories were pitch black. A paved central avenue ran from the gated entrance to a carriage circle with a pair of Mercedes-Benz G-Class wagons parked at the 9 and 3 o'clock positions and a Rolls-Royce Phantom at the 12. Left of the avenue was a domed pavilion overlooking a pond filled with water lilies. Further away, 30 metres or so from the main building, Carter spied a single-storey timber-framed garage with a pitched slate roof, four parking bays and a log store. Three of the bays were closed. There was a pristine condition Aston Martin DB5 in the fourth bay. A million dollars worth of classic automobile. A service road led from the garage towards a smaller, separate entrance on the western side of the property. To the east was a tennis court and a large garden dotted with exotic trees and statues. The whole area was illuminated by scores of security lights along both sides of the avenue like strip lights on a runway. The layout was instantly familiar to Carter. He had spent hours studying every square inch of the Russians' properties, committing the details to memory. Directions, distances, dead ground. The benefit of intensive preparation, one of the things that separated Elite SF from everyone else. The second Black Hawk had touched down 20 metres away, on the western side of the Central Avenue. Both choppers would keep their blades turning and their engines burning throughout the operation, ready to take off again the instant the teams reboarded. Duncan's booming voice fizzled over the net, rallying the assault group to his position beside the second chopper. As they hurried towards the main entrance, Carter, Sec, Farrell and the three other guys on the cordon team took up their pre-designated positions. Farrell and Matt Scowcroft, a short, cocky Essex lad, broke west, towards the pavilion. Carter and Sec focused their attention on the gatehouse at the front of the estate, 50 metres due south. The two other members of the cordon group, Jared Vokes and Kevin Redzik, had responsibility for clearing the ground to the east, the tennis court and the garden. Eight guys on the BG team, Carter reminded himself. Gorchakov never travels anywhere without them. Thirty metres away, the gatehouse door crashed open. Two figures barreled out of the structure, muscle-bound heavies stuffed into tight-fitting dark suits. One of the guys had a shaven head. His colleague sported a red goatee and wore a pair of pearly white trainers. Both were gripping AK-12 assault rifles. Drop your weapons! Carter shouted. Now! The heavies ignored him. That was their first mistake and their last. The man with the goatee was a couple of paces ahead of his bald-headed mate, 25 metres from Carter and Sec. He caught sight of the soldiers spilling out of the two Blackhawks and started bringing up his AK. A sound idea, in theory. Neutralise the nearest threat, but terrible in practice, because Carter was already aiming at him. Carter lined up the L-119A2 with the guard's trunk which was immense, anatomically speaking. All that work Goatee had done in the gym, honing his pecs and abs, had provided Carter with an ample target, like taking aim at King Kong at point-blank range. He squeezed the trigger twice. Rounds whistled out of the muzzle. Spent jackets sprung out of the ejector port. The round smacked into Goatee in the midriff, stitching him in the guts. He groaned and folded at the waist, and Carter emptied a third shot plugging the guard in the head on the way down. He was dead before he hit the ground. Carter swiveled towards the bald-headed guard as he charged forward and brought up his AK-12. Baldy had the same idea as his dead friend, kill the invaders. He had no intention of changing his plan, clearly. Too late in the game. He was already committed. Better to plough on and hope for the best. Carter double-tapped the on-rushing heavy with surgical precision. Two rounds thudded into his chest, giving him a matching pair of lung punctures. 
The third struck a few inches higher, catching him in the neck. He made some sort of grotesque gurgling sound and crumpled to the ground in a tangle of lifeless limbs. Two guards down, six to go. Two of the heavies would be inside the building, Carter knew, protecting the target, which left four more guards patrolling the grounds. Assuming the maid's information was accurate, there was always the chance she might be wrong, or Gorchakov might have bolstered his security detail in recent weeks. Any number of reasons for the sudden change in the BG routine. We'll find out soon enough. A muffled explosion rumbled across the estate, barely audible above the blast of the choppers, as the assault group detonated one of their shaped charges. Carter glanced over his shoulder, spotted the telltale cloud of acrid smoke spewing out of the breached entrance to the stronghold, fifty metres north of his position. He saw the glass shards from the blown-out windows, glinting in the glow of the exterior security lights. The assault team charged through the front door, a chorus of voices relaying information over the net as they systematically began to clear their designated floors. Five seconds had passed since the start of the op. Carter heard Farrell screaming over the comms. Lose them! Lose the weapons! He snapped round to his right. Ten metres away, Farrell and the Essex boy, Scowcroft, were advancing to engage a couple of suited guards rushing over from the western side of the estate. One of the BGs had ignored the threat and aimed his AK at the two SAS men. A gout of flame spewed out of his muzzle, illuminating the gloom as he fired a quick burst at Farrell. The rounds whipped past the Ulsterman, missing him and slapping into a statue at his four o'clock. In the next beat, there was a weak, ka ka as Farrell fired twice. The guard on the left toppled backwards, arms pinwheeling like an acrobat falling from a circus tightrope. He fell into the pond, splashing down amid the water lilies. The fourth guard froze, stricken with indecision, a perfectly natural reaction. His confidence had been dented. He had just seen three of his friends get cut down. Doubts were beginning to seep into his mind. Should he stick to the original plan, or make a run for it? Literally a life-or-death decision. The guard went for a third option, not flight or fight, but surrender. He tossed aside his weapon and raised his arm so high, he looked like a televangelist praising Jesus. On the fucking grind! Farrell yelled, keeping his rifle aimed at the heavy. Stay where you are! The guard sank to his knees, while Scowcroft scampered forward and ripped out a pair of plastic cuffs from his side pocket. He shoved the Russian face down on the grass, roughly pinned his arms behind his back, and slapped the restraints around his wrists. To the east, a short distance from the tennis court, another pair of guards had thrown in the towel. They lay on their fronts ten metres from Vokes, the young soldier from East Hull bellowing at them to stay still, while Redzik rushed forward to cuff them. Through the ground floor windows, Carter saw a series of blinding white bursts of light as the assault team chucked flashbangs into the various rooms. Lights were flicking on in the upper floor windows. In others, he spotted the torch beams from their rifles cutting through the darkness. He hastened over to Farrell and Scowcroft and dropped to a knee beside the plastic cuffed guard. He grabbed a fistful of lank hair and lifted the Russian's head. How many others in the house? Carter shouted above the incessant whir of the choppers. The guard hesitated. Carter shoved the rifle barrel hard against the guy's cheek. How fucking many? Two, the Russian replied. Two inside. Carter released his grip. The guard's head sagged, his cheek slapping against the paving as Carter got on the comms channel. Steve, we've got three BGs down, three others secured. He reported to Duncan. Cordon is set. Watch your back. There are two guards in the house, possibly more. There was a pause of two or three seconds, accompanied by several bursts of gunfire. Then Duncan said, Roger that. We've already sorted them. Two guards. They're both down. He sounded slightly out of breath. Christ, that was quick, Carter thought. These guys don't fuck around. Any sign of the target? Not yet. Wait out, Geordie. 
Carter glanced at the other guys on the cordon team. Farrell and Scowcroft were keeping watch over the three plasticuffed guards. Vokes, Redzik, and Sek scanned the grounds in every direction. Observing the entrance to the stronghold, the gardens east and west of the avenue, the road beyond the wrought iron gate, watching for threats. They weren't expecting more trouble from within the estate. They were thirty seconds into the op. The grounds were quiet and still after the initial fury of the firefight. No sign of any more guards. Their main task now was to prevent anyone else from entering or leaving the building. There was always the possibility that Gorchakov might give the assault group the slip and make a run for it through the front door. Or reinforcements might rock up at the front gate to try and rescue their boss. Or the police. The sounds of the suppressed weapons wouldn't have carried far, Carter knew, but someone in the vicinity might have heard the burst from the AK-12. The barrage jammer should have knocked out the phone masts in the immediate area, but there was always the chance that the equipment hadn't functioned properly. Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will. We're six miles from the nearest town, Carter reminded himself. Six miles from the nearest police station. If someone makes the call, we'll only have a few minutes to bug out before the plod get here. He looked back again at the mansion. Flashes and torch beams periodically flared up in the unlit windows, allowing Carter to track the other team's progress as they worked their way systematically through each floor. Speed and aggression combined with forward momentum. A textbook regiment building attack, the kind of thing they had practiced countless times before at the killing house. At some point, he noticed that one of the second floor rooms had caught fire. The blaze spread rapidly, engulfing the curtains, shrouding them in bright orange flames. Smoke billowed out of the window. Then Carter's eye was drawn to something on the other side of the building, a window on the far right of the third floor, the hallway leading to the strong room. Through the glass, he saw orange sparks flying off the wall as the assaulters began cutting their way inside with the thermal lance. How the fuck has the accountant managed to lock himself in there? Carter wondered. Gorchakov would have had to race upstairs, hurry down the corridor, and seal himself inside the room in double quick time. Carter watched and waited. After a short time, the third floor window went dark again. They've cut through the door. They're inside. He kept staring at the window outside the strong room, waiting for Duncan to come back on the comms and announce that they had acquired the target. Instead, there was dead silence. A moment later, a voice hissed in his ear. Not Duncan, not the assault group. Moody, the signaller, monitoring the op from the signals room at Ramstein, 400 miles away. Geordie, someone has triggered the panic button inside the stronghold. That thing goes straight through to the police station, mate. You need to get out of there immediately. What happened to the fucking jammer? That only works on certain frequencies, Moody explained. Panic alarm must be on a different channel. How long have we got? Officers will be on your coordinates in figures seven or eight minutes. Roger that. Steve, what's your situation? No answer. Carter tried again. Steve, have you got the target yet? Seconds passed. Still nothing. Target acquired, Duncan replied at last. We've got him, Geordie. Bring him outside. Cops are on the way, Duncan said firmly. Stay where you are. We're conducting a search for technical materials. We'll be out in figures five. Wait out, Geordie. Shit, Carter muttered under his breath. We're cutting it close. Too close. He hurried over to Farrell and Scowcroft, dropped down beside the nearest plastic cuffed guard, and rooted through his pockets. He pulled out a vape stick, a slim leather wallet, a pack of chewing gum, a smartphone with a cracked display, some coins, a load of other crap. The car keys, he growled. Where are they? The bodyguard tipped his head at the guy next to him, a mean-looking son of a bitch with a widow's peak of black hair and a bristly moustache. Carter scooted round to the guy and started patting him down. In the front pocket, he found what he was looking for a small chrome key fob with the Benz motif engraved on the front. 
What the fuck are you doing? Sek asked. He was speaking over the net, easier than trying to have a conversation with a pair of helicopter engines roaring nearby. We need to block the entrance, Carter said. Slow down the cops. Wait here and watch the approaches. He shot to his feet and wheeled away, sprinting towards the two G-wagons parked in front of the mansion. He tapped the unlock button. The lights flared on the vehicle on the west side of the carriage circle. A pimped-up version of the standard G-Class, with a grey matte finish, rear spoiler, double exhaust, and run-flat wheels. Carter ran over to the side of the wagon, his heart pounding furiously. He tore the driver's door open and slid behind the wheel. The boy racer theme continued on the inside of the wagon. There was a lot of gold trim on show, a lot of black leather and embossed badging. The door clunked shut. Carter punched the stop-start button, upshifted into drive, and stamped on the accelerator. Meatloaf blared out of the speaker grills as Carter steered counterclockwise around the circle and bowled south along the main avenue, the engine belting out its machine-like roar as he sped towards the front gate. A few minutes before impact, he slammed on the brakes and wrestled the wheel hard to the right. The tyres squealed in protest. The G-Wagon lurched and rocked before it came to a halt side-on with the wrought iron gate, blocking the entrance. Carter cut the engine, pocketed the key fob, leaped out of the vehicle, and jogged back over to the cordon team some sixty metres away. You two, he said, looking at Vokes and Redsick in turn. He motioned towards the gate. Get over there and watch the entrance. Anyone shores up, put some suppressive fire down. Move it! The two soldiers sprinted down the main avenue at once. The front gate was the main access point to the estate. If the cops arrived before the assault group had exited the stronghold, the makeshift roadblock would buy them a few extra seconds to make good their escape. Not much, but better than nothing. We're on the clock now. The stopwatch inside Carter's head told him that four minutes had elapsed since the op had gone noisy. Six minutes until the police rolled up at the front gate. By now, the fire on the second floor had spread to the neighbouring room. In a few more minutes, the upper stories would be a raging inferno. He tried raising Duncan again to warn him about the blaze. Got nothing. He tried Rig and Hickey, the other five assaulters. He got the same result every time. No response. Carter broke off and reached out to the other guys on the cordon team. Sec, Tom, have you got comms inside? Sec and Farrell glanced at one another. Then Sec shook his head. No, mate. Ned's gone quiet as a dog's fart. Must have a radio jammer inside, Farrell said. Only explanation. Carter started to reply. Then he noticed a shadowy blur in the periphery of his vision. He snapped his gaze towards the left of the mansion, tracking the movement. His ten o'clock. The dimly illuminated stretch of ground between the stronghold and the timber-framed garage. Seventy metres away, a stout, silver-haired figure in a dark jacket hurried out of the side of the building. At this distance, in the thin, dawn light, he was too far away to properly identify. Not the right build for a bodyguard. A VIP, maybe? A guest? Or a client? Someone getting the five-star treatment from the accountant. Therefore, a person of interest. He carried a leather satchel over his shoulder and moved in a lopsided gait as he hastened towards the garage, towards the vintage cars. Carter instantly grasped his intention. He's making a run for it. Get to the garage, fire up one of the motors, escape via the smaller gated entrance on the west side of the compound. Carter glanced back at Farrell, Sec, and Scowcroft. They hadn't seen the silver-haired figure fleeing from the house. Scowcroft was still standing behind the guards, while Sec and Farrell kept a close eye on the front of the stronghold. They were obsessed with that entry point. They seemed more interested in what was happening inside than the surrounding area. The silver-haired guy in the suit was twenty metres from the garage now, closing fast. Movement! Extreme left! Carter yelled over the thunderous din of the choppers. There's a runner! Going to engage now!
He broke into a mad dash across the grass and raced past the pavilion and the lead-riddled bodyguard floating among the water lilies, lungs burning with the effort as he sprinted towards the garage to intercept the guy before he could leg it from the estate. The man in the suit had almost reached the Aston Martin. He was less than half a dozen paces to the car. Carter quickened his stride, running for all he was worth. The guy stopped beside the driver's side door, fumbled in his pockets, dropped a set of car keys. Carter saw the glint of metal in the glow of the security lights and stooped down to pick them up. Stop there! Carter shouted. Move and I'll blow your head off! The guy automatically froze. He stayed bent at the waist, his back to Carter, as if he had stooped to examine a rare species of butterfly. On your knees! Drop the satchel! The man did as he was told. He set down the satchel and slowly lowered himself to his knees, his hands still raised. Carter swept forward and shoved him face down on the asphalt. The guy moaned and protested in a foreign tongue as Carter pressed his full weight down on his lower back, pinning him to the ground while he fished out a pair of trifold plastic cuffs from his pocket. He slid the loops over the guy's hands and cinched them tight, drawing a sharp cry of pain as the material dug into the soft flesh of his wrists. Let me go, he begged in harshly accented English. Please. Carter stood up and rolled the man onto his back. He dug out his utility torch, flashed it in his face, and did a double take. He was looking at Denis Gorchakov. Chapter 7 Carter stared at the Russian for a long, cold beat. His mind was racing. He felt as if someone had just punched him in the breadbasket. He took in the salt and pepper beard, the narrow slitted eyes, the jowly cheeks, the sickle-shaped scar below his left eye, the grey hair. It's definitely him, Carter thought. This is Gorchakov. So who the fuck had the assault team arrested? Let me go, Gorchakov said nervously. The Russian had a look of fear and desperation in his eyes. Please, I can pay. I have money. Shut the fuck up. A moment later, Sek came sprinting over from the direction of the estate. He caught up with Carter, glanced at the target lying on his back, and stopped mid-stride as if he'd walked into an invisible wall. What the fuck? He shook his head. Is that... Yeah, Carter said. It's him. I thought the lads had made the arrest. So did I. Then what the fuck is he doing here? I don't know, Carter thought to himself. Check the bag, he shouted. Sek bent down and reached for the satchel. It was some sort of designer brand, Carter noted. Brown leather with a suede trim, a crossbody strap, and a polished clasp. The Fijian flipped it open, peeked inside. He's got a couple of laptops in here, he shouted back. Disk drives, phones, some documents, loads of crap. No money, though, he added with a hint of disappointment. Carter pointed the barrel of his L-119A2 at a spot between the Russian's eyes. How the fuck did you escape? Gorchakov licked his lips. He looked shit scared. His eyes were as wide as lampshades. Sweat beaded his brow. His mouth opened and closed in terror. Tell me, Carter growled. The Russian replied in a panicked voice. There's a, a body double inside. He surrendered uh, to your friends. That's who they arrested. Gorchakov nodded quickly. Don't shoot me, please. I give you money. Anything. Shut up. Carter thought. Body double. This guy must be more paranoid than we thought. He tried raising Duncan again. Steve, are you there? For a moment, he got nothing. Then Duncan said, I can hear you. We're having some signal issues over here. What's going on? Carter told him about Gorchakov legging it out of the building, the body double. Duncan listened in silence and then said, How do we know your guy isn't the double? Check your man, Carter said. 
Check for the scarring under his eye. Duncan went quiet again for a couple of beats. No scarring on our guy, he said. He's the double, all right. Crafty fucker must have left his double inside while he did a runner, Sex said. Almost worked, too. We're taking him back to the chopper now, Carter said over the comms channel. Hard arrest has been made. Exit the building now. Roger that. We'll be out in a few minutes. Still checking for hardware. No need, Carter said. Target was carrying a lot of hardware with him. Get out of there, mate. Duncan was interrupted by a muffled boom over the comms. One of the assaulters has just set off an explosive charge, Carter realised. They're opening something up in there. Duncan said, The Russian might have left some vital stuff behind. We're doing a thorough sweep of all floors of the house, out in figures too. There's no time, Carter snapped. Cops are on their way for fuck's sake. Nothing. Carter tried again, but he got the same dead silence he'd heard before. Fuck it. Come on, he said to Sek. Give us a hand. They grabbed hold of Gorchakov by his biceps and hauled him upright. It was like lifting a skip bag filled with rubble. The guy must have weighed north of twenty stone. Carter slung the satchel over his shoulder. Then they frog-marched the Russian towards the cordon team. He staggered along between his captors, moaning softly and making all sorts of wild promises. By now, Carter guessed that six or seven minutes had passed since the start of the op. Three minutes until the cops arrived on the scene. He was halfway towards the front of the estate when Farrell came rushing over. The Ulsterman nodded approvingly at Carter. Nice work, he said into his throat mic. Can't believe he almost managed to sneak out. Have you got comms with the lads inside? Carter asked. I can't get hold of them. Same for us. Just went dead. No answer. Shit. Get a move on, Sex said, breathing hard. Get him onto the chopper. The three of them carried on towards the nearest Blackhawk, moving as fast as they could manage while carting along twenty stone plus of sweaty Russian. Farrell kept glancing back at the house. The guy looked nervy. Anxious for his mates to bug out in time, thought Carter. Or maybe he had something else on his mind. As they neared the chopper, he noticed the glow of police sirens on the horizon, some two miles due south. A long chain of them, red and blue neon bursts flashing and popping in the grainy half-light, getting larger as they raced towards the estate. Carter figured they had two minutes before the cops reached the front gate. Two minutes until we're completely surrounded. He looked over at the stronghold. There was still no sign of anyone on the assault team emerging from the front door, and he wondered what the fuck was taking them so long. In another dozen paces, they had reached the side of the chopper. Sek bundled Gorchakov into the cabin and strapped him into one of the canvas seats. Then Carter felt a hard shove in his back. He stumbled forwards. Before he could recover, a pair of hands dragged him bodily into the Blackhawk. Farrell clambered in after Carter and pulled a black hood over Gorchakov's head, while Sek hollered an order at the Lodi. The latter signalled to the pilots to take off immediately. The fuck are you doing? Carter shouted above the thunderous roar of the engines. Sek said, We're getting out of here. Back to base. Orders from the assault group. What about the other lads? They'll be right behind us, Farrell said. Out of there any minute. But that's breaking SOPs, Sex said. The target is the priority. We need to get him back to base before the cops show up. Before Carter could protest further, there was a sudden lurch as the chopper lifted off the ground. He dropped into the nearest seat, Gorchakov's leather satchel on his lap rage simmering in his blood. It was against all standard procedures to leave your mates behind during a mission. All kinds of stuff could go wrong. The assault team might find themselves in a firefight with the police, or the chopper might crash on takeoff, in which case they would be in the shit, alone, with no way out. If anything happens to them, we'll have blood on our hands. As the chopper climbed higher, he caught sight of Duncan and the rest of the assault group streaming out of the stronghold. 
Each soldier was shouldering a bulky-looking rucksack in addition to their regular kit, Carter noted. Some of them seemed to be struggling under the weight of their loads as they hustled towards the second Blackhawk. Scowcroft, Redzik and Vokes swiftly abandoned their respective positions and raced over to board the chopper with the assaulters, leaving the cuffed guards behind. Further south, the loose chain of police cars sped towards the entrance. They were a minute or so out, Carter guessed, and he felt a slight pang of relief. It would be a close-run thing, but the assaulters would make it out with moments to spare. To the north, the fire on the second floor had spread rapidly. The whole eastern wing of the building was now wreathed in flame. Tendrils of noxious smoke eddied up from the turret, tarring the pallid sky. The mansion disappeared from view as the Black Hawk banked sharply to the right before levelling out. The loadmaster had a short discussion with one of the pilots through the boom mic attached to his headset. A look of surprise and bemusement flashed across his face. Then he shrugged and returned to his station. What was that about? Carter shouted above the noise. Message from the other pilots, the loadie replied. They're going to zigzag around and create a distraction in case the police start taking shots at us. They'll expose themselves to any incoming flak. Give us time to get to safety. The chopper quickly gained airspeed. Far below, the wood-studded hills and ploughed fields scrolled past in a steadily increasing blur as the Black Hawk raced away from the stronghold, heading towards the airbase at Gornica. They stopped briefly at Gornica to refuel. While they waited, Carter told the Lodi to check in with the pilots on the other Black Hawk. He wanted to make sure the assault group had managed to get clear of the stronghold. The Lodi came back a few minutes later to make his report. The second heli had successfully evaded the police without taking any hits, he said. No casualties from the main assault. They were running behind the first chopper, but would catch up with them for the post-op debrief in Germany. A few minutes later, they took off again and continued west towards Ramstein. The same route as the outward journey, but in reverse. Gorchakov stayed silent during the journey, breathing erratically through the hood. The Russian was having to adjust to a whole new reality. An hour ago, he had been the president's banker, one of the most powerful players in the Kremlin. Now, he was a prisoner. There would be no more private jets or lavish holidays, no more tooling around in his prized Aston Martin. His new life, the one Six would give him in exchange for his int, was going to be a lot less glamorous. A new identity, a semi-detached house in some dreary town in Wiltshire, a monthly retainer, enough to keep him in beer and ciggies, but not much else. Probably the occasional trip to Vauxhall to brief his handlers on the financial dealings of some minor player in the Russian political elite. There were worse fates, but Carter doubted that Gorchakov would see it that way. He would be swapping the corridors of power for suburban anonymity. They landed at Ramstein shortly after eight o'clock in the morning, a full six hours since they had left the airbase. The pilots skillfully brought the bird down a short distance from the regiment hangar. The engine reduced to a low whine. The Lodi gave the thumbs up, and then Farrell and Sek hefted the shell-shocked Russian to his feet and manhandled him out of the side door. Dawn had fully broken now. Rods of sunlight broke through the clouds, burning up the last shreds of morning mist. Carter followed the others out of the chopper and paused a few paces from the fuselage, searching the sky for the other Black Hawk. Nothing. No sign of the chopper. Carter was trying to make sense of the assault, mentally logging details ahead of his next meeting with Maitland, Sutton, and Greening. He thought about the explosions inside the mansion, the comms cutting out. Sek was calling out to him from across the tarmac stand. This way, Geordie. Reception party is waiting for us inside. Let's give them the big prize. Come on. Carter put the lid on the dark thoughts in his head and hurried away from the Black Hawk. He caught up with Farrell, Sek, and Gorchakov as they reached the hangar entrance. They manhandled the hooded Russian past the sentries and escorted him towards a separate interrogation cell located towards the rear of the structure. Two shadowy-looking figures stood outside the prefab container, waiting to receive Gorchakov. 
A pasty-looking man in a plain suit and a dark-haired woman in a grey jacket and pencil skirt and oversized glasses. Both of them had that air of arrogance, suspicion and insecurity shared by all those who worked in the security services. Carter guessed they were the six officers. Lyndon Grist, the regiment int officer, was standing next to Mr. and Mrs. Bland. Carter glanced round, but there was no sign of Mike Beatty, the sergeant major running the show at Ramstein, which surprised him. Attending to business with one of the other SAS teams operating out of the hangar, he assumed. They handed the Russian over to the six officers. Carter gave them the satchel Godshakov had been carrying and said, Here. Forensics will want to take a look at this stuff. Mr. Bland accepted the satchel without replying and handed it to Mrs. Bland. As they marched Gorchakov away to a holding cell, Grist stepped forward and grinned. Good work, guys, he said. Then the smile dropped from his face. Where's the other lot? Sek rubbed the back of his neck as he explained how the assaulters had been delayed by their attempts to create a distraction. How far behind are they? asked Grist. Nor more than a couple of minutes, Carter said. They bogged out of the stronghold right behind us. Should get here any moment. Grist said gravely. That was a ballsy move, drawing enemy fire away from the target. Duncan's call, I presume? I think so, Carter replied. Grist nodded again. Good man. I expect he'll be up for a medal. Sack said. If anyone deserves a gong, it should be Geordie. He's the one who apprehended the target. If it wasn't for him, the guy might have done a runner. Is that so? The int officer eyed Carter with something approaching admiration. Five minutes in G-Squadron and you're already making a name for yourself. You surprise me, Geordie Carter. At this rate, you'll be O.C. by the end of the year. Right, let's do the post-op debrief, Farrell suggested. What now? Carter looked at him with raised eyebrows. What's the big hurry? Just makes sense to do it right away, Farrell shrugged. Get that shite over with, Lake. Carter shook his head angrily. We should wait for the rest of the lads to come in. None of us was on the assault team, he pointed out. We need their version of events. Sek said, What difference does it make? We all know what happened. There's no big fucking mystery. A stony silence hung in the air. Carter stood glowering at him. Then Grist coughed and said, I agree with Geordie. Better to wait and do it properly once everyone is present. Fuck it then, Farrell muttered. As they waited by the side of the hangar, Carter glanced sidelong at Farrell and Sek, his mind working overtime. He wondered why they had been so keen to do the debrief right away. They seemed in a big hurry to leave Ramstein. He had the distinct impression they wanted to get out of there as quickly as possible. He shook his head again. Everything was happening very fast, too fast for Carter's liking, as if it had all been carefully planned beforehand, like a military operation within a military operation. A cold feeling spread like a chill across the nape of his neck, the old familiar sensation prickling his skin, telling him that something was seriously wrong. Two minutes later, the familiar whirring of an approaching chopper carried across the grey blanketed sky. Carter saw the second Blackhawk approaching from the east, nose pitched slightly forward, rotor blades beating the air. It came in low and hovered in the air for a beat, before it slowly descended towards a cluster of hangars on the far side of the tarmac stand, virtually the other side of the airbase from Carter's vantage point. What are those idiots doing? They're landing in the wrong place. Farrell didn't reply. Carter tried raising the assaulters on the comms to find out what was happening. He got the same dead silence he'd encountered back at the stronghold. The bird disappeared from sight behind the hangar. Sixty seconds passed. Then the chopper lifted into view again and hopped over to the regiment hangar before landing on the apron a short distance from the other Blackhawk. The soldiers dismounted from the side door, laughing and joking with one another. The assault group, plus Scowcroft, Redzik, and Vokes, the other half of the cordon team. Duncan swaggered towards the hangar at the front of the group, looking chuffed to bits. 
Carter had seen that look before, on the faces of other lads at the end of an op. The look of a true warrior, satisfied with his handiwork. As they drew nearer, Carter noticed that some of the assaulters' clothes were torn and scorched in places. A few of them had sustained grazes and cuts during the attack, but otherwise they seemed to be in good nick. Then Carter noticed something else, too. Their rucksacks were missing. All but one. Duncan strolled straight over to Carter and thumped him heartily on the shoulder. All right, fella, he grinned. What's wrong with you? Got a face like you've been dick slapped. What the fuck happened back there? Carter snapped. Why didn't we fly back together? Duncan laughed it off. We were late getting out of the building, you twat. Wrapped up searching for technical goodies. Thought it was best to get the target out of harm's way. That wasn't the plan. The plan changed. You know how it is. Carter stared daggers at him, the blood pounding between his temples. No, I fucking don't, mate. Duncan relaxed his features into an easy smile. Chill out for fuck's sake. The plan worked, didn't it? Job done. What the fuck was that about? Carter said, changing the subject. Landing on the other side of the airfield. Duncan raised his hands in a placatory gesture. Don't look at me. Blame that useless pilot. Dickhead got the wrong LZ. Landed us all the way over on the other side of the base. Had to tell him to hop back over here. Carter watched the air troop leader with a growing sense of unease. He knew that Duncan was lying. The RAF pilots used on SF Ops were the best in the business. There was no way they would make such an amateur mistake. Get on with the debrief, Grist announced. Geordi, Steve, Sec, we'll run through everything in the usual room. Shouldn't take long. Let's bloody hope not, Duncan replied under his breath. Grist didn't appear to have heard him. The rest of you can have a well-deserved rest, he said. Pack your kit, fix a brew, and put your feet up, gents. You've earned it. We're heading back to Hereford at two o'clock this afternoon. A short while later, Carter, Duncan, Sec, and Grist gathered in the briefing room. Grist sat on one side of the table next to Moody, with the three soldiers lined up opposite. Several items had been arranged on the table between them. Gorchakov's luxury satchel, a North Face rucksack with the contents laid out on a polished walnut, a battered laptop that looked as if it predated the invention of the wheel, a couple of basic-looking burner phones, three manila folders stuffed with printed-out documents, some legal pads, and a stack of paperwork. Carter ran his eyes over the meagre hall and felt a pressure building inside his head, pushing against the backs of his eyeballs. He wasn't thinking about the hardware in front of him. He was wondering what had happened to the other bags and what was inside them. Grist kicked off the debrief. Let's get straight down to it, lads. Talk me through what happened. Insertion was fine, Duncan said. Entry to the stronghold wasn't a problem. Explosive charge on the door to gain access. All the kit was in good working order. Carter sat bolt upright. He said, That's not true. The radios were out of order. Comms were down for three or four minutes total. Two separate occasions. Moody knitted his brow. That's the first I've heard of it. He looked towards Sec and Duncan. Is that true? Geordie's right. We lost comms once or twice during the raid, Duncan said. We figured it might be a radio jammer, seeing as the target has invested in a premium security package at his gaff. No. Moody shook his head determinedly. That can't be it. If the signal was jammed, it wouldn't have dropped in and out like that. So, what happened? asked Carter. Could be a faulty radio. Sex suggested. Those new sets have been playing up since we started using them. Load of crap. Better off with the old kid, if you ask me. Moody made a doubtful noise and pointed at Carter's personal radio. Let me have a look at that. Carter detached the radio and passed it to Moody. The signaller examined it delicately, like a jeweller assessing a precious stone or an archaeologist examining a priceless artifact. He pushed various buttons and twisted dials, then handed it back to Carter. Looks all right to me, he said. His brow heavily puckered as he puzzled over the problem. Doesn't make sense. One or two radios might break down, but 
loads of them, at the same time. Highly improbable. What are you saying? Grist asked. Moody didn't answer. Instead, he turned to Sack and Duncan and said, Did anyone switch channels during the raid? By mistake, perhaps. Duncan and Sack looked at one another. They looked back at Moody, shook their heads. Not as far as we know, Sack said. We just had the same issue as Geordie. The net went quiet and then it came back. Then it happened again, just like he said. Moody shrugged and looked irritated, as if he found the explanation unsatisfactory. I'll take a closer look into it back home, see if there's some other reason for the kit playing up. Go on, Steve, let's hear the rest of it, Grist said. Duncan said, We cleared the building and apprehended the target, or at least we thought we did. Unbeknown to us, the target had a body double. While we were restraining the wrong guy, the real target did an exit right and tried to make an escape. Thankfully, Geordi was on hand to make the hard arrest following correct identification. It's thanks to him that the mission was successful. So I've heard. Continue. Subsequent to making the arrest, we scoured the place for intelligence. We searched high and low, but this was all we could find. Duncan waved a hand at the meagre hall of hardware and documents on the table. Not forgetting the satchel the target had on him, of course, Grist added. Aye, that too. But you were in there for almost ten minutes, Carter said. I heard you lot blasting your way through the place room by room. It can't have taken you that long to check for int. Duncan stared at him with flat eyes. Like I said, we were doing a detailed sweep of the house. Every nook and cranny had to be cleared. What about the strong room? Same deal. Emptier than a tube carriage in a pandemic. Target must have relocated all his loot. Maybe he was worried about the Russians coming after him and decided to stash his wealth somewhere off the grid. Explains the body double, Sex said. He'd only do that if he was worried about being taken out. Grist said. Six will send in a team to check the other properties, naturally. See if he's hidden anything else. Duncan continued his narrative. After completing our search, we exited the property and boarded the helis. As per my instructions, our pilots zigzagged around the property to draw any fire away from the target. Did the police engage? Negative. We were out of range before they could open fire. Any casualties? Duncan folded his thick arms across his chest. Two of the guys suffered some light burns from the explosive charges. Brady twisted his ankle, clearing the basement. That's it. Nothing serious. Any equipment left on site? Anything that might identify you? No. Any enemies killed on site? Two bodyguards inside the stronghold. And outside? Three enemies clipped, Carter said. Three more BGs surrendered. We disarmed and restrained them and left them in front of the building. Good job we had Geordie on the cordon team, Duncan remarked. Listen, if you're planning on writing anyone up for a citation, it should be him. Saved the day. Carter said frostily. Cut the bullshit, Steve. Calm down, lad. You did well. What's the fucking problem? I don't need a gong. I ain't interested. Steve's trying to do you a favour, you moody cunt, Sex said. No need to get arsy about it. Carter bit back on his anger and looked away. He had a nose for bullshit, and at that moment the briefing room stank of it. Duncan was laying it on thick, bigging up Carter in an attempt to deflect the attention back to him, making Grist focus on his heroics rather than the question marks surrounding the op. He turned to the int officer and said, What's the deal with the Polish authorities? They must know about the raid by now, what with the cops being alerted. That's being sorted out through diplomatic channels. There won't be any noise from them. Would have been a different story if any of the officers had been injured. And the target? He'll be stuck on a private jet in the next hour or so. Six will take him to a black site for an enhanced interrogation. Find out what he knows. Then they'll take him to a safe house. As for the hardware, Six will have their forensic guys strip everything for data. Go through it with a fine tooth comb. Grist paused and drummed his fingers on the table. We did find something else, though. Something unexpected. He leaned across the table and reached for the satchel. 
popped a clasp, unzipped an internal storage pocket, and pulled out a small velvet drawstring pouch. While the others looked on curiously, Gris tugged on both ends of the drawstring and tipped the contents onto the table. A shower of diamonds spilled out of the bag, each one perfectly round and about the size of a penny coin. Carter counted twenty of them, gleaming beneath the stark glow of the panel lights. Sex stared at the diamonds, his mouth hanging open in shock. Jesus, he gasped. Look at that, will ya? Five carat diamonds, Grist explained. Gorchakov's maid told us that he had a stash of them. He used to carry them with him wherever he went. His getaway fund, we presume. Fuck me. Carter did a quick mental calculation. The going rate for a five-carat diamond varied considerably, depending on the cut, colour, and clarity. But say a minimum of a hundred thousand dollars for the lower quality stuff, with an upper limit of half a million for the premium cuts. He was looking at perhaps two million bucks worth of diamond. He glanced sidelong at Duncan. The Scotsman was staring at the rocks intently. Then he lifted his gaze to Sec. An accusing expression flashed across his face. Grist fired off a few more questions before he wrapped up the debrief. They filed out of the unit, and Carter hauled his weary body over to the canteen to grab a brew, while Sec and Duncan walked over to the far side of the hangar and disappeared through a plain door. Carter watched them, questions boring like drill bits in the sides of his skull. Where were they going? What the fuck are they up to now? Something on your mind, mate? Carter looked round. Farrell was sitting at one of the tables and helping himself to a plate of biscuits. No, mate, it's nothing. Cheer up. The Ulsterman popped another biscuit into his mouth. We got the job done, didn't we? Not every day we nab a Russian billionaire. No, guess not. He grinned and wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. You know what your problem is, Geordie? You don't know how to relax. Too highly strong. Need to let your hair down once in a while, know what I'm saying? Maybe. Carter poured a cup of black coffee and wandered over to the breakout area. He wasn't in the mood for chatting shit, so he turned his mind back to the debrief. He thought about what Moody had said about the comms issues. Not a problem with the radios. Not a jammer. There could only be one other plausible reason for the comms dropping out during the raid, Carter thought to himself. And in that moment, as the realisation sucker punched him, he felt a cold tingle of fear crawling down his spine. Because then, he grasped the appalling truth. It was right there in front of him, staring him in the face. I hope I'm wrong, Carter thought to himself. But if I'm right, this could destroy the regiment. Chapter 8 The troop returned to Hereford at four o'clock in the afternoon. The CO and the ops officer were there to greet them and congratulate them on a job well done. Then it was back to the mind-numbing routine of training and waiting on standby for the next mission. Duncan ordered the team to meet the next day at the squadron hangar to unpack their kit. There was a heated discussion about where they would go for beers that evening and who was buying the first round. Everyone seemed to be in fine spirits. There were plenty of smiles and laughs and a lot of good-natured piss-taking. The World Cup winning team arriving back home to a hero's welcome. Carter took a rain check on the celebrations and drove straight home from camp. He changed into his civvies, had a scrub and a shave, cracked open a bottle of supermarket brand beer from the fridge, fired up the wood burner. Then he retrieved the mini phone he'd secreted in his survival pack. Carter powered up the device, navigated the crude menu system, and tapped out a new text message on the micro-sized keypad. Need to meet. ASAP. He hit send. He placed the mini phone on the side table, sipped his crap lager, and flicked on the TV while he waited for a response. He spent several minutes pointlessly scrolling through the streaming sites, found nothing but junk, and settled on the news on which the general theme seemed to be Britain's gradual slide into the sea. House prices were going up. A mid-terrace in London now cost more than the GDP of Botswana. The next generation were never going to be able to afford a house. Climate change was killing humanity. The rich were pulling up the drawbridge. Same old story, Carter thought. 
The people in charge make a fucking mess, then they shuffle off stage and leave it to everyone else to pick up the bill. There was a story about the ongoing counter-offensive in Ukraine. Russian forces were engaged in fighting dangerously close to the nuclear power station at Holovika, in the southeast of the country, the largest station in Europe. Ukrainian forces had recently reconquered the area ahead of a renewed push towards Kherson. They were making rapid progress, the report said, gaining ground at an astonishing rate. Even the Ukrainians seemed surprised by their success. The Russians were being driven back towards the Dnieper. The local Russian commander appeared in front of the media, threatening to bomb Holovika unless the Ukrainians withdrew from the area. The power lines connecting the plant to the national grid had been damaged in the recent Russian shelling, the report claimed. Engineers were having to rely on diesel generators until they got the power up and running again. The camera cut to a NATO summit meeting in Berlin. The fresh-faced U.S. Secretary of State stood behind a lectern, flanked by the U.S. and NATO flags, as he addressed the camera directly. Let me be absolutely clear, the Secretary said in his smooth Californian accent. The President takes any threat of nuclear escalation extremely seriously. Any attempt to destroy civilian nuclear infrastructure or the deployment of strategic nuclear weapons against Ukraine will result in swift and firm retaliation from this administration, the likes of which the world will not have seen before. We strongly advise Russia to resist a potentially destructive escalation of hostilities and call for the establishment of a protected zone around Holovika as a matter of international urgency. Carter's phone buzzed with an incoming message from Maitland. He scooped up the device, clicked it open, frowned at the tiny screen. Tomorrow, 1700. Same place. He was about to turn the phone off when another text came through. Did you find anything? On the TV, the news had moved on to other world events. Famine in Bangladesh, saber rattling over Taiwan a fraught general election in Italy. He stuck it on mute. He wrote, You were right. It's not just a few bad apples. Major Phil Greening sat at his kitchen table and stared at the burner phone, wrestling with his conscience. He had a decision to make, the most difficult of his career. Make or break time. There was a golden Virginia tobacco tin next to the burner, filled with disposable SIM cards. If Greening needed to reach out to his contact for whatever reason, he had to first insert a fresh SIM in the phone, then dial the number he had committed to memory, taking care to properly dispose of the card afterwards. Crushing it and flushing the debris down the toilet was the preferred way of doing this, he understood. He had also been told only to make a call in the event of an emergency. Think of it as a fire alarm, they had told him. Don't break the glass unless it's an emergency. Greening was immensely proud of what he'd achieved in his regimental career. Few rankers ever made it as high as second-in-command of the SAS. He had succeeded through a mixture of determination, ability, making the right friends, and, yes, a large dollop of good fortune. But there were times when he yearned for his old life as a raw recruit in G Squadron. Times like now. He had known about the goings-on in his old squadron for a while, when he'd first been alerted to the problem, Greening had decided to let it slide. That had been his first mistake. He had tried to rationalise the issue. After all, the regiment historically attracted risk-takers, gamblers, non-conformists, guys who often acted as if the normal rules didn't apply to them. The vast majority of soldiers in 2-2 SAS were honest, hard-working, decent lads. But one or two sometimes strayed into criminality. He remembered some of the stories doing the rounds at Hereford twenty years ago. Whispered tales of SAS legends who had cooked the books while training up foreign militias, inflating the numbers of soldiers and pocketing the difference in supplies and money. Soldiers who had looted buildings during raids, stripping them bare. It happened. Unpleasant, but a fact of life. And no one got hurt. What they called a victimless crime. Greening had tried to keep his hands clean. He didn't approve of the actions of some of the men under his command, but he learned to quietly tolerate them. As long as they were doing the business and nothing got out of hand, he was prepared to look the other way. 
but then Steve Duncan and his colleagues had gone feral. The problems had started soon after Iraq. That was when the Steel Reapers had started hanging out with the Blood Kings on a regular basis. Things had quickly escalated after that. Greening had been forced to cover for his men. He had worked his whole life to avoid trouble, and now, at the very pinnacle of his career, he was having to lie to protect a group of guys who were in too deep with a criminal gang. Good soldiers, he reminded himself, first-class operators, some of whom he had taken through selection himself. He should have intervened at that point, taken Duncan aside and read him the riot act, threatened to shop them to the CO unless they got their act together. Instead, Greening had simply carried on as normal, hoping that things would blow over, telling himself that the lads would see sense eventually. That had been his second mistake. Now Greening found himself in an impossible position, and he was running out of time. The way he saw it, he had two possible courses of action. Option one, he could choose to say nothing, allow the investigation to run its course and risk exposing the actions of the guys in air troop, as it inevitably would. Geordie Carter was many things, but he was nobody's fool, and the Reapers had started to get sloppy. Things would come to light. Inevitable. Greening was looking at a scandal that could destroy the reputation of not just G Squadron, but the whole of 22 SAS. Or he could make the call, save his old squadron and the regiment from humiliation. If he acted, he would virtually guarantee that the investigation would hit a dead end. There would be some disappointment at Thames House and Scotland Yard, but the higher-ups at Whitehall would breathe a collective sigh of relief. They hated it when outsiders shone a light on the inner workings of the regiment, for fear of what they might find. It would mean ruining the life of a good soldier, Greening reminded himself. But the sacrifice was surely worth it. The future of the regiment was on the line. Therefore, not really a choice at all. Greening knew what to do. In truth, he had already made up his mind when he'd climbed out of bed that morning. Since then, he had been stalling for time, trying to delay the thing he knew must be done, even as the thought of it shamed and appalled him. Mistakes made, coming back to haunt him. He took a swig of famous grouse, stealing himself. Then he picked up the phone and punched in the number. It rang three times before a scratchy voice on the other end answered. Yes? Steve, it's Phil. Listen, we have... I told you not to call this number, Duncan interrupted. This is an emergency. There's something you need to know. There was a bout of cold silence. Go on, Duncan said. You're being watched. They're on to you. The line went silent again. Police? Among others, our friends north of the Thames, too. Then Duncan said, Ho. There's a plant, Greening said, in your troop. Who? Greening hesitated. He was about to get his hands dirty again. An unfortunate turn of events his own fault, but he wasn't going to make a third mistake. I'm not doing this for you, he said. I'm doing this for the sake of the regiment, just so you understand. Phil? Yes? Give me a name. Greening told him. The line went quiet for several beats, long enough for Greening to wonder if he'd lost signal. Steve? You there? Leave it with us. We'll take care of it. How? Better you don't know. Chapter 9 Exactly thirteen minutes before the meeting, Carter stepped outside his front door. Home was a two-bedroom cottage set on the fringes of an isolated village, a few miles west of Credenhill. The place had been a dump when he'd bought it four years ago, all he could afford after his divorce and the maintenance payments. Carter had rebuilt it from the ground up with the help of his brother. Walls had been replastered, fences erected, floors sanded, brickwork repointed, roof tiles replaced, guttering cleaned, paving relayed, doors rehung. The knackered old garage with the asbestos roof had been demolished. In its place stood a tall timber structure with an office set in the eaves. His ex-wife was a psychotherapist now, 
which probably said something about their relationship. Carter crossed the gravel and approached his Volvo. He was intensely aware that he was about to destroy the careers of several blades. He didn't know how he felt about that. He couldn't care less about the looting. Morally wrong, perhaps, but no worse than the rich bastards in the establishment fiddling their expenses or handing out contracts to their mates in exchange for a lucrative slice of the action. Far as he could tell, the only difference was that Duncan and his mates had been caught red-handed. He realised something else, too. My own career is finished after this. Carter had hoped that his transfer to G-Squadron would signal a fresh start, an opportunity to start over again, redeem himself. Now he saw with terrible clarity that the regiment had only brought him back to serve a purpose. Once the investigation was over, they would almost certainly want rid of him. He was a liability. The other guys in G-Squadron, the ones who hadn't been dealing with the Blood Kings, would view him as a snitch. No one would want to go near him. Greening's promise to make him Squadron Sergeant Major was bullshit. They'll retain me for as long as they need me, then chuck me on the scrap heap, the Hereford Way. He slid behind the wheel, fired the engine, and stopped at the edge of the main road. Looked left, then right. A Harley Davidson came roaring into view, the unmistakable roar of its engine cutting across the air. It whizzed past the Volvo and disappeared from sight as it swerved round the next bend in the road. Idiots, Carter thought to himself. There were tons of bikers in the area these days, tooling around the countryside, causing accidents and irritating the locals with their noise and litter. He pulled out of his front drive and motored south towards Madley. Twelve minutes later, he rolled into the car park on the eastern side of the King's Arms. At five o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, the area was quiet. There was a nursery school on the other side of the potholed road, a service station and an Indian takeaway further east, next to a dilapidated bus stop. Further along, a row of crumbling red brick terraces and a clutter of new builds. A white Mercedes-Benz Sprinter van had carelessly parked on the edge of the junction directly west of the pub, thereby blocking the view of anyone trying to turn onto the main road. Delivery driver. Area was full of them. Barreling down the roads, crisscrossing the same streets multiple times each day, blocking driveways and side streets. He pushed through the door and stepped into the pub. He counted a dozen or so customers scattered around the joint. In one corner, a shaven-headed bloke in a hoodie pumped coins into a fruit machine. A couple of fake-tanned young women sat at a table drinking cocktails. A huge guy at the bar was drinking alone, his thick arms and neck inked with richly detailed tattoos. Further along, an old-timer in a flat cap admired the tits on the woman behind the bar. Carter had seen more life in a petri dish. Cost of living, maybe, Carter mused. Cheaper to drink own brand beers at home than down the local, but also lonelier and bleaker. He found Maitland and the others at the back of the bar. Sutton sat in the middle of the trio, attired in the same bin-liner suit he'd worn at the first meeting, greening to his left, Maitland to his right, smartly dressed in a single-breasted jacket, silk blouse, and a dark pencil skirt. Her lips were glossed a deep shade of purple, the opposite end of the spectrum from Sutton, fashion-wise, the kind of person who could wear frayed hand-me-downs and still look like a million bucks. Greening stood up to greet him and gestured to the empty stool. Carter parked himself on the padded velvet, declined the offer of a drink, and the others listened patiently while he talked them through the raid in Poland. Sutton took frequent swigs from his pint glass of coke. Maitland left her sparkling water untouched. Greening didn't have a drink, Carter noted. The two IC occasionally interrupted him, seeking clarification on some minor detail or confirming the chronology of events, like a detective questioning a key witness to a crime. He seemed agitated, constantly checking his watch and shifting his weight. Carter finished his report. Sutton stared at his empty pint glass. Maitland bit her lower lip, a slight frown creasing her otherwise smooth complexion. Greening took out his phone glanced at it, then laced his hands together and looked levelly at Carter. He said, Let me see if I've got this straight. 
You're saying that the whole of Air Troop is corrupt, yes? Not everyone. One or two of the guys might be sound, but the majority of them are in on it. You're sure? As sure as I can be. But you have no definitive proof, no smoking gun. Greening spread his hands in front of him, like a poker player revealing a dud hand. That's right, Carter said. Then how can you be so certain? I don't mean to piss all over your story, Geordie, but there's nothing concrete here. Just a load of hearsay and suspicion. No, it's a lot more than that. How do you mean? Maitland asked. They went overboard on the kit front. I personally saw them packing three thermal lances for a hard arrest. That's unheard of in my experience. They took a metal detector too. When I asked why they were bringing it, they fobbed me off with some bollocks about needing to search for hidden tech. Maybe they were being cautious, Sutton said. Carter gave him a look. He said, Then there's the time they took clearing the house. They were tearing that place apart, blowing their way into various rooms. Searching for hardware, maybe, Sutton suggested. Like Duncan said. Carter shook his head. I've done house clearances, hundreds of them. This wasn't like any job I've been on. It was... different. In what way? They knew the police were en route, and they still insisted on searching the house for several minutes. That was reckless. Could have ended up with us in a firefight with the cops. Poor tactical judgment, no doubt. Greening agreed. But it doesn't definitively point to anything more sinister. Carter said. There's more. We're listening, Geordie. There were problems with the comms. The net went silent on two separate occasions during the raid. At first, I figured it might have been a technical problem with the radios, but the signalers ruled that out. They told me they tested the devices and didn't find anything wrong with them. Well, then why did the radio stop working? They didn't, Carter said. The other guys had switched channels during the mission. They were communicating on a different frequency, so I couldn't listen in. You're sure? Carter said. The comms dropped while the guys on the assault team were clearing the stronghold. That can't be a coincidence. If they were searching for loot inside the house, they'd need a way of talking to one another privately, establish what they'd found, and where. Or could they even do that? Sutton asked. Change channels, I mean. Easily enough, I Get everyone to set their radios to the new channel before flying out. Whenever the guys need to talk in private, they just switch frequencies then jump back on the main net when they're finished. That's how I'd do it. But you didn't actually hear them talking about any of this stuff? No. This is all just pure speculation. You have no idea what they were saying. Carter eyed the overweight NCA man. I didn't need to hear them, mate. There's only one reason why they'd want to cut me out of the chatter, and it wasn't to talk about the fucking weather. Go on, Maitland said. Please. Carter thought for a beat. They had rucksacks, the assault group guys. They were carrying them when they left the house, eight in total, but when they got off the chopper, the rucksacks were gone. Maitland searched his face. Any idea what happened to them? I can do better than that. He told her about the second Blackhawk landing on the wrong side of the airbase at Ramstein, how it had been out of sight behind another set of hangars for several minutes. He mentioned Duncan's piss-poor excuse for the cock-up. Pilot error. You didn't believe him? Sutton asked. Course not, Carter snorted. No RAF would make that sort of mistake. Never in a million years. Maitland said. You're suggesting they landed in the wrong place deliberately? They needed a place to unload the backpacks before they returned to the hangar. Too risky. Someone might have taken a peek inside. If I was in their boots, I'd do the same thing. Give the pilot a slice of the action and get them to set down away from the rest of the team. But they'd need someone on the ground for that, Greening pointed out, to help unload the stuff and bus it over to the aircraft. Carter nodded and said, I think Mike Beatty is in on it. Mike? Jesus. Greening wore a look as if someone had taken a dump on his front lawn. Based on what evidence... Or is this another one of your bloody hunches? Carter said, 
Beedy should have been there to receive us when we returned, but he was out of sight the whole time. He's in charge of logistics at Ramstein, so he's ideally placed to coordinate the transfer, and I saw him talking with Duncan before the operation, furtive-like. Doesn't mean anything. They could have been reminiscing about the good old days, discussing the price of petrol. Anything. I know what I saw, Carter said tetchily. But that's just it, Sutton pointed out. You didn't actually see the transfer taking place, did you? No. Did you even get sight of the contents of the bags? No. What else? asked Maitland. That's it, Carter shrugged. That's everything. Sutton looked disappointed. Greening checked his phone again. Maitland said, This is all very promising. But? It's a long way from being conclusive. Personally, I'm going to need a lot more in order to escalate this thing. I agree, Greening said. The careers of regiment men are on the line here. I want to be absolutely certain of their guilt before we take any action we might regret. I suggest we hold off until we have gleaned more concrete information. Carter felt the rage rising in his throat. I'm taking a major fucking risk. Some of the lads are already giving me funny looks. If I start prying too hard, they'll realise something is up. We're not asking you to, Maitland said coolly. Just keep doing what you're doing. Let's see where this takes us. Good plan, Sutton chipped in. They're bound to stick their snouts in the trough again soon. Besides, you were the hero of the mission, Greening pointed out. From the sounds of it, you're well on the way to earning their confidence. Keep this up and they're bound to bring you on board. I ain't doing anything illegal. No, Phil's right, Sutton said. This is good for us. If you're invited to join the group, it'll mean we can definitively identify those parties involved with the Kings. Good for you, Carter corrected. Not me. Maitland said, One thing I don't understand. What's that? I can't get my head around why Duncan and his friends weren't more careful to cover their tracks. They must have known how it would look to you, that you'd know something was off. He nodded and said, I think they were using the raid as a test. They wanted to see how I'd react, to see if I was okay with what was going on, like being on probation, I guess. They were assessing a potential recruit. Not just that. I think they were worried about infiltration. Sutton said, We've been over this already. They know your background, your uh, issues with authority. They've got no reason to suspect you of being a plant. Doesn't matter. These guys are playing for high stakes. One wrong move, their careers are in the shitter, and they're looking at a long stretch picking up the soap at Wormwood Scrubs. Maitland stared hard at him. Did they suspect anything? I don't think so. That's why I kicked up a fuss about the stunts they were pulling. I had no choice. If I didn't look surprised, they would have smelled a rat. Let's hope you're right, Sutton said. For all our sakes. Maitland called an end to the meeting. They agreed to RV again nine days later at a new location to be confirmed closer to the date. She wished Carter luck and told him to be careful. Sutton wandered off to field a call on his phone. Carter stood up, grabbed his bell-staff leather jacket and shaked to leave. At the bar, the thick-set guy with the extravagant tattoos caught Carter's eye for a moment before he downed the rest of his pint, slid off his stool and made for the door. Greening placed a hand on Carter's shoulder. Good work, he said. I mean it. This is a fine thing you're doing. We all appreciate the dangers of this mission. He gave a bitter laugh. Nah, you really don't. It's not your head on the block if this thing goes tits up, is it? Carter didn't wait for a reply. He gave his back to Greening and headed for the entrance, feeling angrier than he'd felt for a very long time. There were two gang members in the sprinter, an older guy and a young prospect. The older man had a thick, whitish beard shaped like an upside-down spear tip and pinhole eyes surrounded by an avalanche of weathered flesh. By far the biggest thing about him was his chest. It was huge, gargantuan, a freak of nature, fifty-nine inches at its widest point. His name was Jimmy Naismith, 
but everyone knew him as Big Daddy. He was the driver. The guy in the front passenger seat was nineteen years younger. With his leather waistcoat and tattoos, Connor Ward looked the part of a biker. Every inch of his face had been covered in ink. There were images of skulls, eagles, crucifixes, snakes devouring mythical beasts. He had more art on his face than the fucking Tate, one of his buddies had once remarked. Ward had been a gang prospect for more than a year, twelve months of his life working as a glorified dog's body for the Blood Kings, running around and doing all the menial jobs for the badged veterans, cleaning their bikes, scrubbing down the toilets in the chapter clubhouse in Liverpool. Now he had a chance to finally earn his own patch, become a fully-fledged member of the Blood King family. He was determined to seize the moment. The plan was simple. They had taken up their position shortly after the target had left his house ahead of the meeting, parking fifteen metres downstream from the pub at the corner of a T-junction with the pub entrance at their eleven o'clock. There had been some heated debate about whether to use bikes or a van. In the end, heads won over hearts, and they went with a four-wheeler option, purely because it was the more practical method. Two guys sitting on a stationary bike in a sleepy Herefordshire village would draw attention from the natives, but no one would notice a couple of blokes in a delivery van. Now all they had to do was wait for the heads up from their friend. Ward was the trigger man. That had been decided back at the clubhouse. The chapter president had taken him to one side and given him the talk. The one all prospects dreamed of hearing. It's time, lad, the president had said. Are you ready to swear the oath? The Blood Kings required prospective members to demonstrate their absolute loyalty to their brethren by committing an act of murder. Usually that involved plugging someone in a rival gang trying to muscle in on their turf, or a revenge killing. Eye for an eye. Old Testament shit. But this was something entirely different. Ward and Naismith suddenly found themselves in uncharted territory. They were out of their depth in many ways. A lot of things could go wrong. Don't fail, the President had warned them both. Don't even think about it. We can't fuck this one up. The burner phone resting on the dash trilled. Naismith swiped it up and answered on the second ring. The third man on the team was the chapter treasurer, McAteer. He had the surveillance job. Naismith, a.k.a. Big Daddy, spoke to him for several seconds. He tapped to end the call, set down the phone, and said, Target heading for the exit. Any moment now. Get ready. Ward hitched up the black gaiter collaring his neck so that it covered the lower half of his face and reached for the shotgun stowed in the footwell, ready to pounce. Thirty metres away, the target emerged from the pub. The sun had begun to sink below the horizon as Carter emerged from the King's Arms. Six o'clock in the evening on a Thursday night, the pub car park was half full now, or half empty, depending on how you looked at it. The two fake-tanned women stood near the entrance, sucking on their menthol cigarettes. Further away, an old man in a wax jacket waited for his golden retriever to finish sniffing a lamppost, splashed with fresh piss. On the other side of the road, a woman in black joggers and a sweater was out for a late run. The Indian takeaway was empty. The white sprinter van still hadn't moved. Carter breezed past the two perma-tanned women and made for his Volvo. He stopped beside the driver's side door, fumbled in his pocket for his keys, depressed the unlock button. He was reaching for the chrome handle when he heard a scream at his six o'clock. Carter stopped. He whipped round. Then he saw the gunman. The primitive threat detector in Carter's temporal lobes registered several things at once. The gunman was dressed like a biker. His neck gaiter had been pulled up over the lower half of his face, obscuring his features, like a cowboy sticking up a bank in the Wild West. The top half of his shaven head was stenciled with tattoos. He was half a dozen paces from Carter, roughly midway between the car park and the sprinter van, wielding a pump-action shotgun in a two-handed grip, a sawn-off model with a shortened, chokeless barrel to generate a wider dispersal of lead pellets. The shooter raised his boomstick, black mouth of the muzzle pointing directly at Carter's midsection.
The two women outside the pub had dashed their cancer sticks and taken cover in the porch, shrinking their profiles, as if trying to make themselves invisible. Fifteen metres away, the sprinter van engine snarled into life. Carter had less than a second to react. The decision-making part of his brain told him that there was no time to race for cover, no time to dive into the car. He considered it highly unlikely that the shooter would miss, not with a sawn off, not at such close range. Wishful thinking. Only one thing you can do. Get down. Carter threw himself to the ground. In the same breath, the shotgun boomed. The driver's side window exploded inches above Carter's head, showering him in tiny glass fragments, and he felt a searing pain in his arm. The car alarm wailed. The women kept screaming. From the same direction came the thud of footsteps pounding across the blacktop, interspersed with panicked voices. Carter looked up as the sprinter catapulted forward, it screeching to a halt in front of the pub. The tattoo-faced shooter about turned and leaped into the passenger seat. The side door slammed shut as the van raced away from the scene, hurtling past the garage and the takeaway and the red brick terraces. A few seconds later, it was out of sight. Carter scraped himself uneasily off the ground. The dog walker stood stock still, his golden retriever barking in alarm. Across the road, the jogger had dropped to a crouch beside a van parked at the side of the road, hoping to shield herself from the attack. Carter looked round as a throng of drinkers rushed outside. The old-timers hung back, rubbernecking the scene. Maitland, Greening and Sutton ran over, the six officer shouting for someone to call the police. "'Are you hurt?' she asked anxiously as she dropped down beside Carter. She caught sight of the blood on his jacket, the shallow cuts to his face and hands. "'Don't try to move. We'll get you an ambulance.' "'No,' Carter said between draws of breath. "'Um, okay.' There was a shrill ringing noise in his ears, and the pain on his left side throbbed dully. He glanced at his arm. A couple of lead pellets had peppered his upper arm, tearing through the fabric of his bell-staff jacket. His professional eye told him that the wound wasn't serious. He'd suffered more serious injuries in training over the years, but it still hurt like fuck. What happened? Sutton asked. Busted had a sawn off, Carter replied groggily. Took a pop at me, legged it in a van. Maitland glanced round, taking in the scene. The scattered glass shards, the blown-out car window, the terrified pedestrians, the panicked dog still barking wildly beside its owner. By now, several people had emerged from the nearest houses, alerted by the commotion outside. A question flashed in Maitland's eyes. But how did they know you'd be here? No one answered. Get him into my car, Greening said to the others, look of quiet fury in his eyes. Let's get you to the camp medical centre, have someone clean you up. Then we'll figure out what the hell just happened. Chapter 10 The medical centre at Hereford was situated in a blandly furnished building next to the sorely overworked physio department. Like a doctor's surgery, minus the glossy magazines and the thousand-year wait for an appointment. The duty medic, Katie, was a kind-faced woman with heart-shaped lips. She gave Carter a shot of lignocaine to numb the pain in his left arm, picked out a couple of lead pellets, cleaned, and dressed the wound, handed him a bottle of prescription painkillers and told him that the injury should heal in the next few days. He was lucky, Katie said. His leather jacket had absorbed most of the kinetic energy. The biggest casualty of the attack, from Carter's point of view, two thousand pounds of designer clothing down the pan, plus the damage to his Volvo. Could have been worse, he reminded himself. If I'd spotted the shooter a second later, I would have taken the full blast in the chest, and I wouldn't be sitting here complaining about a few holes in my jacket. Katie stepped outside the room and ushered in a couple of plain-clothed police officers. A short woman in her forties introduced herself as Detective Chief Inspector Zainab Rahman. Her partner, D.I. Bobby Galvin, was an out-of-shape guy with skin as pale as the Dover Cliffs, hair like a bed of straw and freckled cheeks. 
They took him into a separate room, and Rahman fired off a series of questions, while Galvin stayed mute and scribbled notes. Carter played dumb. Always the best option in his experience, safer than cooking up some elaborate story, less chance of getting tripped up on the details. Tell me about the shooter, Rahman said. What did he look like? He was medium height, I guess. Medium build. I didn't really get a good look at him. His face was covered up. Do you remember what he was wearing, at least? Any distinguishing marks? Anything will help us. He had dark clothes, I think. Carter shrugged an apology. Sorry, it all happened so fast, like. What about the driver? asked Galvin. No, too far away. Carter canted his head to one side. What about the van? Any sign of that? Rahman nodded. Officers located it half an hour ago, dumped in a lay-by half a mile from the scene. Forensics will take a look, but we think it's a dead end. Galvin said, They poured bleach over the interior. Crime scene contamination. Nothing else. We found a pair of ratchet straps in the back, front wheel chock fixed to the floor. We're working on the assumption that they had a motorcycle in the rear of the van and made their getaway on that. Carter thought, Motorbike, neck gaiter, leather jacket, tattoos all over the shooter's face. As you can see, Galvin went on, it looks like we're dealing with professionals here, serious players. Is there anyone who might have had a grudge against you? Rahman asked. Not as far as I know. That seems hard to believe, given what just happened. Believe what you want, I'm just telling you the truth. Perhaps there's a long-standing feud or a petty quarrel, someone in your family maybe. Most of my family's dead. There's my brother, but he's been out of the country for several months. What about your friends? I don't have many. Prefer my own company. I'm not really a big people person. Do you owe money to anyone? No. Carter fumed through his nostrils. Look, I told you already, it's a case of mistaken identity. Whoever did this had me mixed up with someone else. Have you seen anyone following you lately? Someone watching your house or acting suspiciously? Anything at all? Carter shook his head and sighed in frustration. All I know is that I had a chat with a couple of old colleagues at the pub. We said goodbye, I left, and the next thing I know some idiot is having a pop at me. That's it. Why were you at the pub? Social gathering? Shooting the shit with some workmates? What were you talking about? Out of interest? Carter threw up his hands. Reminiscing about past ops, joking about the latest cuts to the regiment. That good enough for you? You seem quite relaxed about the situation. I'm a soldier. People have been shooting at me one way or another for the past fifteen years. If you want the truth, I'm more pissed off with the damage to my car. The interview ended a short while later. Rahman gave Carter her card and told him he'd have to pop down to the station in Hereford to give an official statement. She promised to get in touch if she had any further developments and said they would check for CCTV footage and speak to witnesses, see if anyone could shed some light on the identity of the attackers. But she didn't sound overly optimistic. They had no motive, no suspects, no compelling evidence left at the crime scene. The odds of making an arrest were presumably low. The two detectives told Carter to wait in the treatment room. They left, and then Maitland, Sutton and Greening trooped inside. Sutton took the medic's chair. Greening parked himself on the edge of the examination couch. Maitland stood. She closed the door and subjected Carter to his second interview of the evening. Except this time, he didn't play dumb. He told them what he knew, the bullshit-free version of events. Did you get a good look at the shooter? Maitland asked after he'd finished. Carter nodded, said, He was a biker. How can you be sure? He had tattoos on his face, wore a neck gaiter, had the look, leather jacket, desert boots. He told them about the van and the ratchet straps and the bike they had escaped on. From the Blood Kings? Who else? And the guy in the van? Him I didn't see. Carter smiled weakly. I was kind of distracted at the time. Sutton said, We'll have to take some time to look into this thing, see if it's connected. 
Carter laughed bitterly. I'm nobody's fool, mate. Of course it's bloody connected. I'd bet my right bollock on it. Sutton held up his hands. Hey, let's not jump to any conclusions here. No, Greening cut in. Geordie's right. This has to be related. It's too much of a coincidence. Do the police know anything? asked Maitland. Carter shook his head and said, They asked the usual stuff, but I just fobbed them off. Good. The last thing we need is the cops all over this. That would be bad for all concerned. Greening said, The question is, what do we do now? We'll have to put the operation on hold, Sutton announced bluntly. At least until we've completed our preliminary investigation into the shooting, find out what's going on. I agree, Maitland said. It's too risky to continue, in light of what we know. Greening drew his eyebrows together. What do you mean? We're not dealing with an opportunistic hit. This was obviously planned in advance, which means someone has been leaking information to whoever was behind the attack. Maybe one of your new friends sussed out what was going on and decided to silence you, Sutton suggested. Greening choked in outrage. Ridiculous! I know those boys. They might have fallen in with the wrong crowd, but they wouldn't do that. Not to one of their own. They would, Carter said, if it meant saving their own asses. You really think your colleagues would try to kill you? asked Maitland. Maybe not directly. They'd want clean hands. If it was me, I would have farmed out the hit to a third party, put some distance between myself and the killing. The Blood Kings. Carter nodded again. That's my guess. But Duncan and his mates wouldn't have sanctioned it unless they were a hundred percent sure I was a plant. Someone must have given them the heads up. Maitland said, Whether that's the case or not, we'll have to suspend the operation for the time being. We'll be in touch through the usual channels once we know more. What am I supposed to do until then? Carter asked. Give your statement and lie low. If anyone asks, tell them what you told the cops. You were at the pub meeting friends. There was an attack in the car park. The cops think it's a clear case of mistaken identity. What about the police investigation? asked Greening. We'll take care of it, Sutton said. Make sure it goes nowhere. From what you've told us, it'll hit a brick wall anyway. We can be thankful for that, if nothing else. In the meantime, I suggest you go home, Greening said. Get some rest. Take a few days off. Carter stood up and reached for the door handle. One more thing, Maitland said. Yes? Carter looked back at her. Be careful. I mean it. You think they'll try again? Greening asked. Someone wants him dead, Maitland said. Bad enough to risk an attack in broad daylight. We have to assume they'll make a second attempt once they realize the first one has failed. She fixed her gaze on Carter. You're a marked man. Watch your back from now on. That won't be a problem, Carter thought as he breezed out of the room and headed for the exit. I've been doing that most of my fucking life. Chapter 11 Two days after the shooting, Carter found himself sitting in a windowless briefing room in the headquarters block at Credenhill. Two figures sat facing him on the other side of the conference table. Peter Hardcastle, the CO of 22SAS, was a stern-looking man in his late forties, though he looked about a decade older. His bushy eyebrows were perched above small, dark eyes set deep into their sockets. His nose looked like a crow's beak. His lips were so thin you could have sliced onions with them. Next to him was Christopher Smallwood, the ops officer, his slight paunch visible beneath his uniform. Geordie Carter sat opposite the two senior officers, waiting for them to administer the last rites to his career as a blade. He'd received the phone call at home earlier that morning, Smallwood's clipped voice travelling down the line, ordering him to report to the camp at eleven o'clock sharp for a meeting with the big boss man. Carter hadn't bothered to ask why he was being called in at such short notice. Didn't need to. He could think of only one good reason why the CO would want to speak with him. This is about the shooting. They were going to stick him back on gardening leave, no doubt about it. The logical option, in Carter's mind, 
Termination of his short-lived stint in G Squadron. No way he could continue serving in air troop, not after his near-death experience outside the King's arms. He was looking at another stint on the sidelines, winding down his time in the regiment with bullshit duties. He'd driven up to the camp gates with a leaden feeling in his chest, steeling himself for the bad news. How are you, Geordie? Smallwood asked, smiling and putting on the chummy act, as if he and Carter were besties. How's the arm, mate? Fine, Carter replied. Water, coffee? Thanks, but no. Smallwood reached for a jug of water and poured himself a glass, while Hardcastle coughed to clear his throat. Let's get straight to it, shall we? He began in his public schoolboy accent. No point beating about the bush. We've been fully briefed on the... Uh, incident the other day. I must say, this is a terrible disappointment. I expected better from you, Geordie. Carter didn't rise to the bait. He'd spent most of his career taking shit from guys like Hardcastle and knew how to handle them. The guy came from old money, like most of the COs who passed through Hereford. Private school, Oxbridge, Sandhurst. The opposite end of the social spectrum from his men. Hardcastle also had a reputation as a sneaky fucker. Slippery as an eel, they said. The kind of guy who never committed himself to anything. More interested in his career progression than the nuts and bolts of soldiering. A year from now, he'd finish his two-year post at Hereford and make director special forces, providing he didn't drop a bollock before then. From there, he'd have a clear path to general, then head of the British Army, perhaps Deputy Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. Later on, if he played his cards right, he'd have a lucrative post-army career. Knighthood, OBE, a position on the board of one of the big defence contractors. A life trajectory only available to those born into inherited wealth. His experience was so alien to Carter, he might as well have belonged to another species. The whole thing's a clusterfuck, Hardcastle ranted. He sounded like a British officer in a Second World War movie. Bloody nightmare. Local hacks are all over it, as you can imagine. Damn swarm, poking their noses where they're not wanted. Carter flinched. Do they know about my involvement? Thankfully, no. We're trying our best to keep it that way. All they know is that there was a shooting in Madley, Smallwood said. Victim was an unidentified male who suffered light injuries, potentially gang-related, but we could have done without the attention. I was just doing my job, Carter replied defensively. It's not my fault some greasy fucker took a crack at me. Hardcastle made a face as if he was chewing on a mouthful of lemons. If you were doing your job, Geordie, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. All you had to do was keep your head down, gather evidence, and then we could have dealt with the matter quietly, in-house. Instead, I've got DSF on the phone, demanding to know what's going on. We look like a bunch of amateurs, for God's sake. Carter tensed his muscles and resisted a compulsive urge to rearrange Hardcastle's mug. Do we have any idea who tipped off the Reapers about the investigation? That's not our main concern right now, Hardcastle replied. What's that supposed to mean? This business with the bikers, the Reapers, or whatever they call themselves. We're putting it on the back burner for the time being. I've instructed Six and the NCA to suspend the investigation indefinitely. DSF agrees. So does the Chief of Staff. Carter looked at him in dismay. You're killing the investigation. I didn't say that. We'll revisit the issue once things have calmed down somewhat. Someone fixed it to get me killed. Someone in this fucking camp. And you're just going to let it slide. You're not looking at the big picture, Geordie. Hardcastle's voice was dripping with condescension. This is a PR disaster for the regiment. We don't need any more bad headlines. Not after everything else that's happened. I don't need to remind you of the scandals regarding this unit recently. All before my time, of course. What about Duncan? The rest of the Reapers? They'll continue in their duties. Hardcastle raised a hand, cutting Carter short. I understand your displeasure, I really do, but the reality is that we're badly stretched. Oh, you know how it is, Geordie, never enough men. Not that our friends in Whitehall give a fig about such matters, sadly. He exhaled. 
The truth is, I simply can't afford to lose so many good soldiers. If it was only one or two chaps... He smiled apologetically. Rest assured, we will revisit this matter at a more... appropriate time, he went on. But for now, the reputation of the regiment must take precedence. You understand, Geordie, don't you? Good man such as yourself. Sure you do. He smiled again, but the look in his eyes was so cold, it could freeze an embryo. Yes, boss, he muttered. Carter knew how it would play out. The investigation would be shelved. Hardcastle wouldn't want anything to tarnish his record as CO. Later on, one or two of the guys in the Reapers might be quietly offered early retirement, maybe a promise of security contracts on the circuit to sweeten the deal. Everyone would come out of it smelling of roses. It's a cover-up. Of course, this does leave us with one loose end. Hardcastle locked eyes on Carter. Me. Carter squished his eyebrows together. Yes, Hardcastle said smoothly. You see, we're juggling rather a lot of balls at the moment, what with our efforts to keep the lid on the goings-on in Air Troop, not to mention the situation with DSF, crisis management. Your presence here could, um, complicate things. Carter said flatly. You want me out of Hereford? We're thinking of your safety, man. You were fortunate not to have been badly wounded, or worse, God forbid. Next time you might not be so lucky. One can easily imagine how that would go down. A serving SAS man shot dead in broad daylight. The media would have a bloody field day. I'm touched by your concerns for my welfare, boss. Really. Hardcastle pressed his lips together in a hard line. Smallwood spread his hands. Bottom line, Geordie, we need you out of the way. You're sucking me. No, nothing like that. We just think it's best if you avoid the camp until this situation has been dealt with. I'm with you on that, Carter said. But I can't just go home and lie low. No fucking way. The lads already know I'm the plant. They know where I live. I'll be badly exposed. We know, Smallwood said. That's why we're going to send you overseas, somewhere nobody from G Squadron can get to you. There's a job, Hardcastle explained. One that requires your particular talents. That caught Carter's interest. He sat up straight. Where? Ukraine. Christopher tells me you've been on operations there in the past, before my time, of course. Carter nodded stiffly. I did a rotation after the Russians rolled into the Donbass, two years training up the local SF. It wasn't public knowledge, but the SAS had been involved in operations in Ukraine since early 2014. The Crimea invasion. Back then, the Ukrainian SF teams had been poorly equipped, demotivated and lacking in specialist training. Carter had been part of the group running the initial courses, and he had been far from impressed. Poor quality. Couldn't organise a piss-up in a brewery, one of his fellow blades had complained at the time. But the regiment excelled at training foreign troops. They had deep experience, honed over decades of instruction in every corner of the world. They knew what they were doing. It had taken a lot of hard work, but over time, Carter and his colleagues had helped transform the Ukrainians into elite SF operators, skilled at sabotage, ambush, reconnaissance, building assaults, and counterinsurgency warfare. When the Russians had rolled across the border, the Ukrainians had been ready for them. Speak the local lingo, Hardcastle asked. Enough to get by. I picked up a little Russian too, boss. Russian? Hardcastle looked impressed. How did that happen? Most of the locals spoke it, or a mixture of the two, what they call surzik. I couldn't hold a conversation in Russian, but I could order a drink in Moscow if I had to. Well, I thought you northern types weren't any good at languages, but that may come in handy on this occasion. Carter was growing tired of the CO's bullshit. What's the mission? Christopher will brief you on the details. Carter tilted his head towards Smallwood, the ops officer, Hardcastle's yes-man, an ass-kisser-in-chief, who said, The operation concerns Viktor Koltrov. I've heard of him, one of their generals. Carter recalled the face he'd seen on TV back at Ramstein, 
the ramrod straight man with the leather eye patch, receiving the medal from the Ukrainian president. Koltrov is more than just a general. He's Ukraine's most famous soldier, highly decorated, which makes him a celebrity in his own right, second only to the president himself, in fact. Downing Street and Washington both consider him indispensable. Chap thinks he's a damn war hero, Hardcastle said, a scintilla of contempt in his voice. Reckless glory seeker, more like. His admirers call him the Lion of Ukraine. What's our involvement? As you are no doubt aware, Hardcastle said, the regiment has been providing support for Ukrainian officials for some time, training up and advising local bodyguard teams. A detachment from A Squadron has been in country for several months, Smallwood explained, providing close protection for the general, the usual drill, four-man team working on a two-year posting. Smallwood corrected himself. It was a four-man team. However, one of the lads was injured in a rocket attack in Kiev last week. Who? Johnny Longstaff. He was running the BG team, got caught up during a raid on the capital while he was off duty, visiting someone he shouldn't have. He looked at Carter for a long beat. The latter threw back his head and laughed. That sounds like Longstaff, all right, thinking with his small head instead of his big one. In any case, Longstaff is off the team, convalescing pending further inquiries into his conduct, which means the General's BG team is a man down. That's where you come in, Geordie. Hardcastle spread his thin lips into a wicked smile. You're going to take his place. Carter paused to digest this. You really think this Koltrov bloke is a target for assassination? Smallwood said. It's a reasonable assumption, given the state of play. Meaning? The Russians are getting desperate. They're racking up losses at a frightening rate, retreating from captured cities and towns, abandoning key strategic positions. Their soldiers are exhausted, and there's no one to train up the new recruits, since many of the most experienced officers are either dead or bogged down with their troops on the front line. In any normal country, the president would have fallen on his sword by now, except Russia isn't a normal country. That's one way of putting it. Quite. Smallwood took a swig of water. Moscow is having to resort to other means to stop the bleeding. Mass artillery bombardment, destruction of civilian infrastructure to starve or freeze the Ukrainians into submission. World War II tactics. Like those threats to bomb the plant at Holovika, you mean? Hardcastle cocked an eyebrow. I had no idea you kept abreast of current affairs, Geordie. Yeah, I'm full of surprises, boss. Carter replied sarkily. I can even write my own name these days, believe it or not. Hardcastle glowered at him. Smallwood said, As part of their counter-offensive, the Russians are ramping up efforts to assassinate key Ukrainian officials. We believe Koltrov is high on the list. Very high, Hardcastle added. Carter scrunched up his face. Why would they bother taking him out? This guy gets knocked on the head, it won't change a thing. We'd still flood the country with hardware, drones, training packages. The Russians would still be on a hiding to nothing. That's not how the Kremlin sees it. Koltrov is the second most popular man in Ukraine, Smallwood said. He might not be a big deal over here, but in their eyes he's Hannibal, Grant and Patton rolled into one. Whenever the president is unavailable for media interviews, they turn to Koltrov. If he's killed it will deal a serious blow to Ukrainian morale. Smallwood shifted uncomfortably and darted a knowing glance at the CO. There is, he went on awkwardly, another reason for the increased level of protection around Koltrov. What's that? asked Carter. The general has been personally assigned a highly sensitive mission. The president himself has entrusted Koltrov with it. Smallwood hesitated. What we're about to tell you is highly classified. That pricked Carter's interest. He waited for the ops officer to continue. President Voloshin has tasked Koltrov with hunting down and eliminating fifth columnists, Smallwood said. Traitors operating within the Ukrainian political and military establishment. Carter looked surprised. Are there any left? 
They can't have many friends in Kiev, not after what the Russians have done to the place. Smallwood grimaced. The situation is more complicated than that. In what way? Voloshin enjoys widespread support across Ukraine, but there are some who have split loyalties. People with family across the border, for example. Some are ideologically opposed to integration with the West. Others have been bribed or blackmailed by the Kremlin into doing their bidding. That's the assessment from our friends at Vauxhall, Hardcastle put in. Langley has reached broadly the same conclusions. They're both working closely with the Ukrainian security service. A few of the suspects were flushed out months ago, Smallwood said, mainly those whose allegiances were well known prior to the invasion, but the intelligence agencies believe several traitors remain in place within the Ukrainian regime, collating intelligence on suspects. Hardcastle shot him a warning look. For obvious reasons, Kiev wants to keep this operation secret. Outside of this room, only eight other people are aware of it. Do the Russians know? Smallwood said. That's up for debate. We have no conclusive evidence, but without going into specifics, we know that other key information has been leaked to the Russians. Realistically, we have to assume they've been alerted to Kolchov's investigation. Clearly that poses an additional level of risk, Hardcastle said. The Kremlin will be doubly keen to neutralize Kolchov if they think their assets are in danger of being exposed. Carter shook his head. I still don't get why you need me on the team. You've already got the guys from Air Squadron on the ground. Why not bring one of their lads in to replace Longstaff? We've suggested that, but General Kolchov wants you. In fact, he has personally requested your presence. But I've never met the bloke. Fuck me, I, I don't know him from Adam. Hardcastle stretched a smile across his face. It's all thanks to your brother, actually, he said. Very promising soldier, by the way. Good company, man, if you know what I mean. Doesn't have any interest in upsetting the apple cart. Luke! Carter's frown deepened. What has he got to do with any of this? He's part of the team overseeing President Voloshin's BG detail, Smallwood explained. That information isn't to leave this room, by the way. Strictly speaking, we shouldn't even be telling you this. Carter nodded absently. He'd heard that Luke and some of the other guys from the wing had been dispatched to Ukraine, had guessed that they would be working with the local forces in some capacity, but he knew nothing substantial. The activities of the men who served in the wing were highly secretive. Even the other lads at Credenhill were kept out of the loop. Smallwood continued. There was an assassination attempt on President Voloshin seven days ago. Carter felt his heart skip a beat. Luke, he began. Is he? Your brother is fine. Nicks and bruises, nothing that will keep him out of the game. What happened? We're still piecing the evidence together, but it seems that the Russians left a stay-behind team in one of the towns they'd recently abandoned. Chechens. Suicide bombers. They had constructed an underground shelter. They had cameras, a distraction team, said Hardcastle. Very professional. Lots of planning. Therefore, not an opportunistic hit. Shit. Your brother was the hero of the hour. Saved the president's life, by all accounts. If it wasn't for him, they'd still be bagging up body parts in the town square. But I didn't. There wasn't anything on the news. That's because the camera footage was seized by the Ukrainians immediately after the attack. Phones, laptops. Journalists were ordered not to report on the incident under threat of imprisonment. Total media blackout. Carter didn't need to ask why. He could guess at the answer. Even a failed attempt on the Ukrainian president would have been seized on by the Russians and presented as a propaganda victory. It would send a clear signal to the Ukrainians. No one is safe. Not even your great leader. The point is, said Hardcastle, Voloshin respects your brother, admires him greatly. One might say that Luke has made quite the impression on the president. Smallwood said. Somehow, we're not sure how, it came to his attention that Luke has a brother in the regiment. So? We think Voloshin must have mentioned this to General Koltrov, told him about Luke saving his life and your own involvement in the siege in Mali, 
Koltrov specifically requested you on the team. When was this? A couple of days ago, right about the time you were leaving the King's Arms. It seems you have impeccable timing, Geordie, Hardcastle remarked with a sneer. He snorted contemptuously. Either that, or you've got the luck of the Irish. An ugly laugh escaped Carter's throat. Strange idea of luck, that, sending me off to a foggin' war zone. The CO's face hardened like cement. We're doing you a favour, you bloody fool. Your brother's heroism has given you a way out of a very sticky situation. Just give me the crack, Carter replied irritably, his patience wearing thin. Smallwood resumed the briefing. You'll take Longstaff's place with immediate effect. As the ranking officer, you'll be in charge of the other guys. You'll also have responsibility for directing and coordinating the Ukrainian soldiers attached to the general's team.